Well, thank you, Borough President, for convening this panel tonight to discuss the Savo Neho neighborhood plan. I'll just wait for presentation to come up. Just one moment, Eric. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Louisa. As the borough president noted, um, I'm Eric Botsford, deputy director of the Manhattan office of the Department of City Planning. I'm very happy to be here tonight to briefly describe some of the details of the neighborhood plan for Soho and NoHo. Next slide, please. The plan for Soho and NoHo is detailed and nuanced uh, as befits two of our city's most unique neighborhoods. And I encourage anyone who would like to explore the plan in depth to visit the Department of City Planning website. Tonight, I'll present an overview of the plan, which began the public engagement process in early 2019 and entered the formal public review process on May 17th of this year. The Soho NoHo neighborhood plan is centered around five major objectives. Uh, first, allowing housing and requiring permanently affordable housing for the first time in Soho and NoHo. Uh, second, introducing also for the first time, mechanisms to directly support arts and cultural uses. Third, recognizing and reinforcing critical economic and job generating uses, including broadening of live work. Fourth, implementing also for the first time in Soho and NoHo building controls that will limit the size of new developments to match the neighborhood's historic character. And fifth, an ongoing effort by the city and local stakeholders to address quality of life and public realm concerns. Now, I'd like to note that city planning's efforts are supported by the work of our sister agencies, such as the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development, um, who are here tonight listening to testimony that will be provided. Next slide, please. Very briefly, because I know most of you watching tonight know SOHO and NOHO extremely well, um, but the study area for the neighborhood plan encompasses SOHO and NOHO within Manhattan Community District 2. The majority, around 80% of the study area, is contained within and protected by six city historic districts. The neighborhoods are centrally located with excellent transit collect connections, good jobs, and adjacent to dynamic and vibrant neighborhoods in their own right. But these positive and special qualities are hampered by 50-year-old zoning in the form of two manufacturing zoning districts that were established in 1971 and are only mapped in Soho and NoHo. Next slide. Our planning work is and really must be informed by the part Soho and NoHo play in our larger city. These neighborhoods, as you can see on this map that shows density of employment, are major job centers that rank only behind Midtown and Lower Manhattan with nearly 55,000 jobs in a variety of small and medium-sized firms, the vast majority of which are non-industrial despite the industrial zoning that's in place today. And these jobs are also largely centered on the creative sector. I'm sure it comes as no surprise to hear that Soho and NoHo are also important to the city's retail and tourism economies. Retail stores generate critically important tax revenues for our city and employ many thousands of New Yorkers across a range of skills and incomes. Next slide, please. Turning to housing, and again, looking at Soho and NoHo as part of our larger city. This map shows how different parts of the city have grown with new housing or have lost homes in the past decade. The darker the blue is, the more homes an area has gained between 2010 and 2020, and the darker the orange, the more housing an area has lost. You can clearly see a few areas in and outside Manhattan that have added housing in blue, but notably some of our city's centrally located and very high value neighborhoods have either added little housing or have even lost homes in the past 10 years. And this includes parts of the Upper West Side, the Upper East Side, Greenwich Village, and Soho and NoHo. Community District 2, outlined in red on the inset map, ranks close to the bottom of new housing created compared to other community districts in the city, despite its excellent transit access and wealth of jobs. And the same does hold true for Soho and NoHo. Many factors play a role in the creation of new homes, but restrictive zoning, such as the zoning in Soho and NoHo that explicitly prohibits housing plays a critically important role. Next slide, please. 
Now we'll focus in on SOHO and NOHO themselves going forward, starting with demographics and income. I want to note that when you're drawing conclusions about the racial, ethnic, or wealth characteristics of a specific neighborhood, it's critically important that your data actually comes from the geography of the neighborhood you're studying. It can be an easy mistake to include areas outside the one you're supposed to be looking at, which can lead to erroneous results and flawed conclusions. Looking specifically at the data for SOHO and NOHO shows two neighborhoods that tend to be significantly more white and higher income than both Manhattan and the city as a whole with a much larger percentage of owner-occupied housing geared toward the higher end of the market. Combined with the fact that there is currently no income-restricted affordable housing in Soho or NoHo, you have an existing condition of two neighborhoods that are less diverse and provide fewer opportunities for New Yorkers. Much more information on this, including the methodologies used in our data analysis, can be found in our info sheets on the city planning website. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, both SOHO and NOHO are hampered by their 50-year-old industrial zoning. And as I just mentioned, housing is not allowed by zoning in either neighborhood. And neither actually is most ground floor use that's not industrial in nature, ostensibly to prioritize and protect manufacturing uses that were once present, but are no longer found here. A unique type of manufacturing live workspace is permitted in SOHO and NOHO, Joint Living Work Quarters for Artists, or JLWQA that allows a limited subset of artists to practice their craft and live in Soho and NoHo. But additionally, existing zoning says that there shouldn't be schools, libraries, or community centers, and cultural uses such as museums, galleries, and theaters are also restricted. These outdated regulations not only do not reflect the Soho and NoHo we see today, but they severely restrict who is able to live here, as well as create a very real hardship for those that seek to open and operate businesses. Changing gears for a moment to talk about architecture and design. As I mentioned previously, and as you can see on this map, the vast majority of Soho and NoHo are within city historic districts. But the existing manufacturing zoning is wildly out of sync with the historic character. There are no height limits today anywhere in Soho or NoHo. So you see buildings that are towers or that don't match the character of their neighbors something that's critical to address in new zoning. Next slide, please. So we've covered what brings us to this point, and now I'll turn to what's being proposed to address the challenges and opportunities we've just discussed. The neighborhood plan is at its core, a proposal to update and improve the zoning for these two neighborhoods. And it includes a change to the zoning map to replace the existing industrial districts with a Soho NoHo mixed use district that allows for customized zoning tailored to these two unique communities. There's also a change to the zoning text that would establish rules for this special district and very importantly, require permanently affordable housing. Next slide. So I've just said that the proposed zoning will designate these as special mixed use districts. And so what does that mean actually? In short, it means that the zoning will finally reflect what's there today and what makes Soho and NoHo so special, that the neighborhoods are not uniformly industrial or uniformly commercial or residential, but are a mix of all of these from block to block, building to building, and in many cases from floor to floor within a building. So first, housing would be allowed for the first time in Soho and NoHo, and permanently affordable income-restricted housing would be mandated through mandatory inclusionary housing, or MIH, which is the nation's strongest requirement for affordable housing, requiring between 25% and 30% of new housing and conversions to be permanently affordable, and in Soho and NoHo, resulting in up to 900 permanently affordable income-restricted homes. Also, in addition to the existing live workspaces for artists that would remain, a wide range of live work arrangements would now be permitted for all types of artists, artisans, makers, and entrepreneurs. Light manufacturing use would continue to be permitted, including no change to provisions related to existing joint living work orders for artists. If you're a certified artist residing in JLWQA today, you'll be able to continue to live and practice your craft in Soho and NoHo, just as you always have. Commercial uses such as office and retail would be allowed and new models of hybrid light manufacturing and retail would now be permitted, allowing goods to be manufactured and sold from the same space. And finally, 
I'll note that while the identity of Soho and Noho are so intimately tied to the arts, zoning has historically done very little to allow arts uses or to provide support for the arts. The proposed zoning will, for the first time, recognize in a very real way the role of arts and culture in Soho and Noho by allowing museums, art galleries, and theaters, as well as by generating direct financial support by the creation of an arts fund. Next slide. But while we're on the subject of housing, I want to spend a minute describing substantial protections that are already in place today for people living in rent regulated housing. State law passed in 2019 greatly strengthened tenant protection, making protections permanent and eliminating provisions that used to take rent regulated housing out of the program. Anyone living in rent regulated loft law units in Soho or NoHo today have these strong protect protections today and would continue to do so under this proposal. In addition, the city provides, and will do so for Soho and NoHo, a wide variety of assistance and resources for tenants. Next slide. Now, I mentioned how the proposed zoning will support arts and culture in Soho and NoHo. Um, arts and the arts have been integral to the essence of these neighborhoods from the time when manufacturing uses departed in the middle of the 20th century up to the present day. And while zoning has allowed certain artists to practice their craft and live in Soho and NoHo, the, the existing zoning doesn't do much else to celebrate or support arts or artists. I mentioned how the proposal would allow for the first time a wide variety of arts uses like galleries and museums. The proposal would also contain no changes to existing joint living work quarters for artists. I wanna emphasize this point again, if you're a certified artist residing in Soho or NoHo pursuant to JLWQA, the proposed zoning would not affect your status as a certified artist or your ability to remain in your home or create your art, no change. And you can continue to sell or rent to other certified artists going forward, no change. The proposal would also now provide an option for those who wish to sell their JLWQA homes to non-artists or pass their homes on to spouses or children or otherwise transition to regular residential use. When a space is removed from arts production in JLWQA, it's fitting that it benefit ongoing arts and cultural endeavors. So a contribution to a Soho NoHo Arts Fund would be required. But again, this is entirely optional. This fund would provide real support for arts and cultural organizations, as well as artists engaged in this work in Soho, NoHo, and surrounding communities. Next slide, please. And finally, I'll discuss how Soho and NoHo would look in the future when the new zoning results in construction of new buildings. Here in the yellow outline, you see Soho closer to us and NoHo in the distance. Both neighborhoods are highly varied, but you can see pretty clearly the historic cores because they're relatively uniform in appearance. And you can also see Broadway running diagonally from left to right, which is within historic districts that has lots of taller and heftier buildings along its length. Uh, outside the historic districts, you can see uh, where the existing manufacturing zoning allows tall towers with no height limits today, something we propose to fix. And this is all to say that any new zoning should reflect these varied conditions, but should primarily ensure that new development looks like what we love about Soho and NoHo. Next slide, please. So it's important that the proposed zoning is no longer one size fits all, unlimited height when it comes to the way buildings should look. Different areas of Soho and NoHo have different scales and different feels, and the zoning should reinforce that. I know that there have been pictures circulated on email blasts and on Twitter and elsewhere that show super talls, mention billionaires row and the like. Those statements are false. Let me be clear. The zoning that exists in Soho and NoHo today and that has been there for 50 years has no height limits. It allows tall towers today. It does absolutely nothing to reflect the magnificent character of these two historic neighborhoods. The Soho NoHo, Soho NoHo neighborhood plan fixes this. It spells out height limits across the entirety of both neighborhoods that would mandate buildings that look like Soho buildings, that look like NoHo buildings. The proposal limits height and density within historic districts, the pink and blue areas on this map, to be similar to what's there today. Outside the historic districts, those areas in yellow, more density is permitted to get more housing and affordable homes, but still with strict height limits. No more towers anywhere in Soho or NoHo. Now the proposed heights aren't completely shrink wrapped to what's there today. 
And that's important when you consider that new buildings have to fit into sites with neighbors on either side or behind them. Flexibility is important to allow light and air for neighbors and also to allow the Landmarks Commission to make adjustments to match neighboring buildings. But even with this flexibility, the new height limits will ensure that building form is tightly controlled and predictable. Next slide, please. So I'll end with a few sketches that show what new buildings would look like from a human scale down on the sidewalk. This is the corner of Center and Grand in Soho. You can see some new buildings in the middle ground on the right and the left. These show the absolute biggest buildings that could be constructed anywhere in Soho or NoHo, in this case on the periphery of Soho. Next slide. And here is Broadway in Soho, with a few new buildings inserted into the rhythmic up and down of this wide street. Next slide. And finally, a human eye view of West Broadway looking south. There are six new buildings actually in this sketch on both sides of the street, and it can be difficult to tell which are new and which are historic. Next slide. So I'll end there. I um, want to thank the borough president and everyone watching at home and my fellow panelists for giving me the opportunity to summarize the details of the Soho, Na Soho Noho neighborhood plan. I look forward to listening to your testimony tonight. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Eric. And now Jessica Katz, Citizens Housing and Planning Council. It's all yours, and thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll just wait for my slides to come up. And in the meantime, thank you so much to Borough President Brewer and your amazing team for putting this together. Thank you for having me here today to talk about housing issues and the Soho NoHo rezoning. Um, when my slides come up, I'm just gonna start from here. Um, let's go to the beginning. So. I'll begin by saying that New York City faces a housing crisis. Um, we have some numbers here from the Citizens Budget Commission, go to the next slide please, that show the enormous job growth our city has enjoyed and how that's not been matched with nearly enough new housing supply. The result is a city that enjoyed significant economic growth, but without new housing supply, that growth can only be enjoyed by very wealthy New Yorkers, while the rest of the city experiences this as a housing crunch rather than an economic boom. So the top line here shows the growth of employment since the 1980s and since 2010, and then the housing stock and how those two numbers since 2010 have really started to separate from each other. Um, next slide. If we look at New York City in comparison to other cities across the country, an even more stark picture emerges. So while conventional wisdom sometimes suggests that we've been building a lot, in fact, we've built a lot less housing than other cities. If you look at the top, you see cities like Seattle, Austin, Denver, these are all cities that are known for their high quality of life and their reasonable cost of living. And they have kept up with that growth that's been from people from all over the place saying that they wanna live there by building a ton of new housing to accommodate that new excitement that people have about those cities. If you look at New York City, we're down at the bottom with cities like Chicago, Philadelphia, Indianapolis, um, not necessarily cities that we tend to compare ourselves to in terms of the economics, and even if you look at other high cost cities like San Francisco or Boston, those are higher up on the scale than we are in terms of how much housing we've been building. So we simply have not been building enough housing compared to our population, compared to other cities, and especially not in compared comparison to how much job growth we've seen. Um, recent census figures have only shown how much, how that continues to be an issue where we've made many, many more um, create, got many, many more new residents in New York City that even than we expected, we far exceeded anyone's expectations. Um, so the next slide shows the median household income. So the median household income in New York City, I've shared why the city as a whole desperately needs more housing and more affordable housing in particular. So now I wanna share a little bit of demographic data about why we think that Soho and NoHo in particular is a good place to start. So this is the median income for New York City, for Manhattan, and for Community Board 2. And as you'll see, the median income for Community Board 2 is about double the median income for New York City as a whole. Next slide. Community Board 2 and the rezoning area in particular is much less diverse than the borough of Manhattan overall. And it's more than twice as white as New York City as a whole, especially with regard to its Black and Hispanic populations, with the Asian population being roughly consistent across the areas we are comparing here. Um, the next slide, the poverty rate in New York City as in New York City as a whole is about double that of Manhattan Community Board 2 as well. It's almost 20% in New York City and just shy of 9% in 
in Manhattan Community Board 2. So Manhattan Community Board 2 is incredibly rich in access to jobs and transit and surprisingly even parks. These are some of the most vibrant, economically rich, transit accessible neighborhoods in all of New York City. Um, and all that access leads up to one key statistic. Next slide, please. Life expectancy. Your typical resident of Manhattan Community Board 2 is expected to live a full six years longer on average than the citywide average, six years. So what we hope is that we can take some of these amazing qualities of these vibrant neighborhoods and share them amongst more neighbors who would also benefit from this amazing neighborhood. Next slide. Because while Community Board 2 has many amazing qualities, racial and economic diversity are not among them. More than half of Community Board 2 residents will be classified as high income and extremely low income New Yorkers are less than half as likely to be represented in Community Board 2 even though they make up one in four New Yorkers citywide. This compares to Manhattan Community Board 2, the next slide, to the entire borough of Manhattan. And here we see similar trends. So we see the great need for low-income housing with many fewer options in Community Board 2 for lower income New Yorkers to live here. Next slide. In terms of housing production and preservation, Community Board 2 lags far behind the city, the borough, and other similar neighborhoods. The average community board, even one that is also relatively more white and more affluent on average as say the Upper West Side, the Upper West Side has created about 10 times as much affordable housing as community board two has um, under the Housing New York under this administration. So this slide includes housing units that were created or preserved. Um, and the next slide, you can see just new construction. So you see a similar trend when you look exclusively at new construction. If you take out any preservation units, um, but again, this is just affordable housing units. What about new construction of any housing units overall? So the next slide shows an increase in class A units since 2010. Um, it's about a 6.4% increase in New York City as a whole, just shy of that in Manhattan. Manhattan Community Board 2 has about 2.4% increase in that time and CB7 has 3.8%. So New York City has created about 3% as much new housing, both market rate and affordable as Manhattan Community Board 2, the zoning has simply been too constraining to allow any new housing to be built, much less any affordable housing. But New York City neighborhoods are interdependent. So when neighborhoods, when rents rise in Soho, people start looking for housing elsewhere and the pressure on the housing market travels with them from neighborhood to neighborhood. So people talk about gentrification like it's a pernicious plot, but more often it's just the sum of many individual decisions where people realize they can get a better deal or more space a few subway stops away. Next slide. This process begins with neighborhoods like Soho Noho, who must do their share in providing enough housing to keep our city affordable and equitable, not just for a wealthy few. That's why there's so many organizations who work citywide and in neighborhoods all over Manhattan and the city who are favorable of this proposal. So this brings us to the million dollar question. Affordable for who? It's a common question and a really important one. Next slide, please. So this is a typical family of three, a mother with two kids. Their household income is okay. It's 80% of area median income or about $85,000. So this is the typical MIH level income, though it's certainly possible to get lower income units as well. If that family went looking for an apartment in Soho today, as we did when we went on Street Easy this morning to create this slide, they'd find that the average rent for a two bedroom apartment is more than $10,000 a month. Compare that to the $1,900 a month she'd have to pay for an MIH unit. That's a huge improvement. And it would be even lower if on any given site, if the project elects to go with an MIH option with even deeper affordability. So I'll end here, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what the housing need was, compare Soho, NoHo, and Community Board 2 to the rest of the city and the rest of the borough and give you a sense. Um, so I'll end here, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for having me. Jessica Katz, thank you very much as always. Um, that was a wonderful presentation full of facts. Our next speaker is Gerard Lane, who is from Carthage Real Estate and also a professor at Pratt. And thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kendall. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you to the borough president. Uh, thank you to the city planning staff, um, as well as my panelists. So, you know, I'll give you guys a, a very short, you know, verbal thoughts, ideas um, as we go forth in this complex uh, issue of rezoning. 
Um, you know, this issue is not new. You know, for as long as planning has been a profession in the U.S., planning professions, planning professionals have had to toy with how do we improve our cities? You know, how do we make cities grow? How do we create great school zones? How do we create great business districts? How do we create housing situations for our residents to enjoy in our cities? So I'm glad to be here to talk to you guys about this. So, you know, first, you know, give a little context to me. So, you know, my, I'm a, my first career was an architect um, and my second career is a real estate developer. So give you a little context. I like to make stuff. <laughs> um, so a little bit of context about me. But, you know, I, I have jokingly say that, that I think buildings can help make communities better um, if you do it right. Um, and I think housing specifically is a catalyst for healthy communities, um, both home ownership, right, which creates wealth for families and can change a generation um, for a family, as well as affordable housing for those who need it um, and those who can use it. So I think in doing you know, this redevelopment, I think housing is a key component, um, as well as the preservation of housing that's in those existing communities. I know in this you know, particular community, it has a storied history of being a place where artists could come for cheap space. You know, so now, a few decades later, you know, one would ask the question, how do we create more of it? Um, shouldn't we create space for more artists, more creatives, the next generation of creatives to come to this community and create that next chapter in the story of Soho? Um, I think also, you know, economic development, you know, part of, you know, the government's job is how do we help our residents provide for their families? Um, Soho has a very interesting history that it has very, very expensive retail space. How do we create a diversity of retail space? So not only, you know, a Nike store, but also a small mom and pop store. Um, and I think part of the rezoning, you know, is trying to figure out how do we create a diversity of space um, as well as economic development. And then lastly, I'd like to say that, you know, the neighborhood needs a little bit more diversity, guys. Um, and it would be nice to reflect a little bit more of New York City. You know, there's, there's so many different people in New York City. That's part of the beauty of the experience. Um, is that you eat different foods, you meet different people, different cultures, different backgrounds. Um, this neighborhood isn't as much of a reflection of that diversity in New York City. And I think part of this rezoning can help to create more housing solutions, um, more business solutions um, that could probably make the community even better than it has been historically. So, you know, those are kind of some high points that I think um, and doing a rezoning in this particular neighborhood, I think things are special um, and I think things that can be achieved. Um, and, you know, in closing, I look forward to hearing from presentations from folks that follow me um, who will address some of these issues in a different ways. So thank you all once again. Thank you very much. And um, like I said, lucky students. All right, Thank so our so next speaker is uh, Mark Vigas, who's uh, director of the Soho Broadway Initiative. And what I really love about him, yes, he has been very helpful on this topic. But for those of you who remember, um, the initiative, Soho Broadway, did uh, employ artists at the height of the pandemic to pr produce art on the uh, plywood that the stores felt understandably that they had to cover their windows with. And then they ended up at the Museum of the City of New York where I went to see the exhibit. So Mark, the floor is yours, but I wanna thank you for that very special moment. Thank you, Gail. Um, excited to be on the panel this evening. Um, thank you to your staff and uh, my fellow panelists. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Soho Broadway Initiative. We're the not-for-profit that manages the neighborhood-focused business improvement district on Broadway from Houston to Canal. We are a unique business improvement, improvement, business improvement district in that we represent residential and commercial interests equally. Um, as part of this process, our board adopted uh, some planning goals uh, before, um, during the Envision Soho NoHo process, uh, where we want to see um, residential legalized so people can live in Soho that aren't artists. We want to allow retail, we want to see retail allowed as of right. Uh, we're very interested in preserving the historic look and feel. Um, and, you know, coming up with a comprehensive approach to improving the quality of life in this uh, vibrant mixed use neighborhood. 
I served on the Soho NoHo Advisory Group that was formed by yourself, Gail, as well as Council Member Margaret Chen and Department of City Planning to work on solutions uh, for the long-term success of Soho and NoHo. <laughs> as uh, Eric mentioned, the zoning was last changed in 1971. Uh, it was changed to allow artists to live in Soho and to encourage manufacturing. In the past 50 years, Soho has changed in ways that the zoning did not anticipate. Um, it's one of the top retail areas in the country. It's a desirable office district where many tech startups uh, call home. Um, and, and it's also home to one of the most desirable neighborhoods in Manhattan and the city at large. Most everyone agree that the zoning needs to be changed and modernized to reflect the modern reality of Soho and NoHo and allow it to adapt for future changes. Uh, someone recently told me that uh, they couldn't believe that retail on the ground floor wasn't legal. They were actually laughing. They're like, are you serious? And I said, yeah, it's not, that's, that, that is true. Um, and they couldn't, they just shook their head and couldn't believe it. Um, I wanna to turn to the proposal um, and uh, acknowledge that the initiative represents uh, both residential and commercial stakeholders. And you can hold this slide for just a moment. Um, that have very different perspectives. My commercial property owners and businesses <laughs> welcome and support the proposal's long overdue changes to legalize retail. Residential stakeholders that I speak to do not support the proposal as it currently stands for a number of reasons, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. Given these diverse perspectives, the initiative is focused on making changes to the proposal to better align it with our planning goals that both our commercial and residential stakeholders agree on. Those goals include legalizing residential and retail, preserving the historic look and feel, and coming up with a comprehensive approach to improving the quality of life. I want to turn to <laughs> preserving the historic look and feel um, and the impact uh, this proposal could have on the historic district uh, that, that um, is located, uh, that our district is in, in located in, located in where, where our district is entirely located within the cast iron historic district. We hired uh, an architecture firm, TKS Bay, uh, with extensive experience working in historic districts like Soho to evaluate the development opportunities identified by the city in our district and make height and bulk recommendations. TKS Bay looked at the height of all the buildings in our district along Broadway from Houston to Canal, did extensive research on the history of the buildings on the nine sites identified by the city as potential development sites and created massings to represent what potential development might look like. The proposal fundamentally creates development opportunities in the historic district that are not in line with the existing building stock along Broadway. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, what you're seeing tonight is a, is a handful of slides from a larger study that we will be submitting as part of our testimony uh, to the borough president. And we will also be releasing the study publicly following tonight's hearing. Um, on this slide, you'll see our district, Broadway, from House into Canal highlighted uh, in a red dotted uh, square. Go ahead and go to the next slide. These are the existing conditions in the, in the neighborhood. This is looking at the, the building massings of the buildings that are already in our district. Um, as you will see uh, at the Northern end of our district, uh, we have our taller buildings. Um, and, and what we'll see is buildings that you know generally vary in height um, we have some one story and two story buildings, typically five to six stories. Um, and then we also have buildings that are taller, uh, you know, go up to 170 feet. That 170 foot tall building is a 12 story building. Um, and these are generally loft uh, buildings. So the uh, floor to floor height is uh, taller than what you might see in other parts of the city. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Here you're looking at um, the elevation of both the east and west side of Broadway. And you can see um, uh, you know, the different uh, various uh, building heights here. Uh, what the city is proposing is um, a 205 foot uh, max building height, which is 35 feet taller than our tallest building. Um, what we asked PKSB to do is to kind of you know, look at our, our building heights um, and come up with an approach that we thought was uh, rational that would lead to uh, buildings that would be in context with the existing building stock. Um, and when you look at the building heights um, above the current 
85 foot street wall, uh, the average building height <laughs> within the district is around 125 feet. So go ahead and go to the next slide. And so here you can see what we're, we're recommending. Uh, we're recommending a max building height of 125 feet. Uh, we're a building wall, a street wall, excuse me, uh, from six of 60 feet uh, minimum up to a max of 105 feet. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. And, and here's, here's, the, um, here's our recommendations uh, with massings on each of the nine development sites within our district. I'd also like to add that we're, we're recommending that there be a 15 foot setback um, after, <laughs> after the um, street wall. And go ahead and go to our next slide. And then th th this is how the, the buildings, the uh, development sites, at least on the east side of Broadway, uh, might look like you know, using our, um, our recommended approach. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's the end of that part of our, that I no longer need the uh, screen share on my presentation. I um, wanna talk a little bit about um, garbage and delivery. Those are other quality of life issues that have come up uh, during this process. Um, city planning has had hosted a session, an info session with representatives from the Department of Transportation and DSNY uh, to look at different programs that the city is, is looking at to uh, transform how garbage is handled and picked up um, and how deliveries are being made. Um, and these are, these are important uh, innovations um, and we stand ready to work with the city uh, to, to um, reimagine how, how garbage and deliveries are made. Um, however, the city needs to make commitments uh, to work with organizations like, like, like ours and the community to refine these solutions and make investments to implement them. On garbage, we think the new zone collect commercial waste system our program will create new opportunities to innovate how commercial waste is collected. Um, the Clean Curbs program um, with uh, DSNY and DOT also creates some opportunities to innovate. Uh, the initiative stands ready to work with the city to bring these innovative solutions to SOHO. Deliveries are another area that we talked about. Overnight deliveries in a mixed-use neighborhood like SOHO are problematic and, inf and frequently interfere with a quiet night that residents require. However, there are other areas where delivery practices are, are changing and we stand ready to work with the city on those as well. I wanna talk quickly about <laughs> the changes to retail. Um, the retail vacancy rate within our bid is currently at just over 30%, which represents, a, which represents an increase in vacancy of about 18.5% from late 2008 when it was just under 15%. Um, so we've doubled our vacancy rate in the last couple of years, and that's, that's difficult. Our goal is to allow our neighborhood to recover from the pandemic and come back stronger than before. We seek a vibrant and mixed retail scene reflective of both the marketplace and community character. The existing special permit requirements add uncertainty and layers of cost to the already expensive cost of doing business in New York City. We believe this zoning requirements have, have effectively prevented many small and medium-sized businesses from operating here as only national chains have the resources and wherewithal to navigate the special permit process. We know that va retail vacancy rate is high throughout the city and that potential tenants will have many options when they choose to relocate or reopen. We cannot make it more difficult to open a retail establishment in Soho than in other parts of the city. Um, our suggested approach uh, is to allow retail uh, just for Broadway this will allow retail on the second floor uh, and below um, as of right. For retail above the second floor, approval such as a certification or authorization should be required to ensure the, that performance standards are met for retail above the second floor. Our suggested approach would allow for retail on Broadway on the second floor and below using existing building floor plates to determine the maximum size of retail, giving businesses much needed flexibility to fit retail into these buildings in ways that work for businesses and the community. Gail, thank you so much for um, hosting tonight's panel discussion. I think it's um, a great way for us to talk about the proposal and I look forward to uh, hearing from my other fellow panelists and from, from testimony from the public. Thank you very much, Mark Dikas. And now we'll hear from Steve Herrick, who's the director of Cooper Square Committee and who has been thinking about these issues for a long time. Steve, the floor is yours. And thank you for being here. 
Uh, thank you, Gail, uh, for inviting me to be a panelist. Um, first, I should point out that um, Cooper Square Committee uh, actually opposed the uh, rezoning plan at the community board to Wheeler Peering in June. Uh, and I know Jessica Katz, uh, one of her slides mentioned us as being in support because we had signed on to a letter in support of applying MIH to SOHO, but it was before we had actually seen the release of the plan. Um, so I want to present, you know, for the major criticisms we have of this plan. And uh, I actually do have slides, which um, I'd like for Connor to uh, present. Okay, you can skip the first one. All right. Um, yes, yeah, so that's just uh, info about Cooper Square. So yeah, our, our criticisms or concerns are the upzoning is too large and will result in out-of-scale development. Uh, development will result in demolition of soft sites. Displacement of rent-stabilized tenants will result in only a modest increase in affordable housing. The upzoning will result in inappropriate vertical enlargements of buildings in the historic districts. And the mechanisms for legalizing JLWQA buildings impose a hefty flip tax on individual owners and the regulatory burdens of obtaining a new residential CFO. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the first concern. Um, uh, so, you know, like I said, we support mandatory inclusionary zoning uh, housing um, to create affordable housing, but um, City planning's rezoning will allow residential use in Soho and NoHo with a residential FAR of 12.0 uh, with MIH in the um, um, in the housing opportunity zones, uh, a 9.7 FAR uh, in the areas north of Canal Street and the Broadway corridor in the heart of NoHo, and 6.0 FAR in Soho's residential core. Um, Cooper Square believes that. Uh, we need much smaller increases in density with more contextual height limits and, and contextual building massing. Uh, next slide. Um, so in the residential core, um, we actually support Village Preservation's recommendation of 5.0 FAR uh, because we believe the maximum uh, building height should be uh, no more than 105 uh, feet. Uh, next slide. Um, so here's an image of Green Street. Uh, as you can see, um, the Soho core has a very consistent scale among many of the buildings. Most are five uh, stories tall on this street. Uh, and throughout the Soho core, buildings typically range from four to six stories. Um, the built FAR in this area is 4.7. Uh, this is a solid street wall. The facades are not set back on upper floors. 70% of the buildings in Soho have 100% lot coverage. So there's no rear yards on many of these lots. Next slide. Now, some of the buildings are, are larger, about 25% exceed 5.0 FAR, uh, such as the buildings here on Spring Street and on Worcester Street. Um, but even these overbuilt buildings maintain the same massing characteristics as the smaller ones. Next slide. Uh, there are very few opportunities to build new affordable housing on vacant sites at the Soho core. Um, this lot um, at 144 Spring Street and Worcester is fairly typical. It's 25 feet wide and 100 feet deep. Um, so um, it would probably result in about 20 apartments above a commercial space under the rezoning plan. So you'd get maybe four or five low income units. Uh, to us, it's not worth upzoning more than 20 blocks in Soho's historic core to only achieve a few dozen low income housing units on a handful of sites. It's preferable to have the owners pay into an affordable housing fund to support low-income housing in other parts of Soho and NoHo, where upzoning can actually be applied to some major soft sites. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm actually going to skip the next few slides because they really touch on what what Mark had talked about in terms of the Broadway corridor, and we basically are in agreement um, that uh, 7.2 FAR is the most appropriate uh, density for that area, um, and. He's recommending 125 foot height limit. Uh, typically, um, our A day zones um, would involve 145 foot, 145 feet maximum. But you know, we're not, we're not in disagreement uh, with his analysis here. Um, go on to the next slide. Uh, so in NoHo, you see um, a couple of examples of buildings with different massing. Um, this is building on Bleecker Street. Uh, has a built FAR of 7.8, uh, eight, eight stories tall, 90% lot coverage. Uh, the other one uh, was built more recently and, um, you know, it's only one story lower, uh, but it has a significantly different 
built FAR of about 5.0. Um, and it's really because it covers uh, uh, less of the lot. So the, 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 the bulk of the building, or the massing is pushed up and it's set back. Uh, so we think that, you know, as part of the rezoning, an effort should be made to just maintain a solid street wall going up uh, with uh, uh, not using setbacks where, where possible. Next slide. Uh, so in the affordable housing zones um, in Southeast and Southwest Soho, um, there's, uh, we think that the uh, FAR should be reduced from R10 to R9A, which would give you an 8.5 FAR and a maximum height of 175 feet. Um, next slide. Um, here's an example, um, actually in, uh, on Canal Street, uh, this is one of the opportunity zones where you see, uh, I'm sorry, I, I thought I might have missed a slide in NoHo. Uh, okay, go back one slide. Uh, oh yeah, this is, okay. So this is the, the Edison parking lot. And uh, here you have a potential for about 150 mixed income housing units. Uh, the building next to it actually is built to 7.6 FAR on Great Jones Street. So you can see that building is not, not that large and it's because it, it uses most, most of the lot um, and it, it only rises to, I believe, uh, eight stories. So I think that new construction on this site could generate a lot of low income housing um, and the massing could be shifted over towards Lafayette Street, limiting it maybe to a 12 or 14 stories on Lafayette and setting it to a lower height uh, on Great Jones Street. If, if city planning is creative about how it, uh, how it contextualizes these buildings. Next slide. Okay, go further down, sorry. All right, so this is another example. This is in the uh, opportunity zone and you can see um, this is near Sixth Avenue on Canal Street. You have a couple of uh, commercial buildings, you have a couple of vacant lots and just to the right of them, you actually see there's a, a, a loft building and there's two others next to it. Um, that are built to less than 4.0 FAR. Uh, the real risk here uh, is under the current zoning is that you could see assembling of sites, demolition of, of loft buildings and displacement of uh, rent regulated tenants. Uh, next slide. Um, so, um, and this is an example of uh, a building, a site where development is actually going to happen. There's gonna be 20 stories uh, off this tower um, under the existing zoning, even though it's 5.0 FAR, the developer has acquired air rights from several adjacent properties. Um, so it's, it's wildly out of scale. Um, so even the existing zoning doesn't prevent uh, inappropriate development. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I uh, really wanna talk about the need for stronger tenant protections as part of this rezoning plan. Um, so first, the first of these is uh, anti-harassment uh, protections, and I'll get to the anti-demolition ones. Uh, we think city planning should include very strong tenant uh, protections against harassment to prevent displacement of rent stabilized, including IMD loft tenants from soft sites and allocate staffing resources to enforce them. Uh, they can do this by placing SOHO and NOHO in the Certificate of No Harassment Program. Under this program, when a property owner seeks to apply for a permit or to build a new building, HPD investigates whether there's been harassment over the past five years. Administrative hearings are held. If harassment is found to have taken place, the owner is denied uh, the permit for several years. Um, we think the city should uh, adopt this, but the city should also be funding outreach and education to rent stabilized and IMD loft tenants living in soft sites in the rezoned areas. Groups like CAV and AFI have the skills and cultural competency to outreach to particularly Asian residents in the housing opportunity zones uh, to ensure they know their rights if their landlord tries to buy them out or harass them out of their homes. Um, we think anti-demolition provisions are essential uh, um, for structurally sound uh, rent regulated buildings outside the historic districts. And there needs to be a requirement that any rent stabilized or law floor tenants of buildings that get demolished be rehoused in the new mixed income building at the current site. Several other rezonings have done some uh, similar anti-demolition provisions, such as Clinton, West Chelsea, and Williamsburg. Um, can you go down to the next slide? Okay. 
Um, so other ways we think this MIH program can be made more robust is to uh, try to increase the affordable housing goal on some of the larger sites from 25 or 30 percent up to 40 or 50 percent. And the property owners could be incentivized with some of the funding from the Housing Opportunity Fund to go above that percentage. Um, and if, if city planning is not you know, willing to go ahead and, and alter MIH citywide, um, we think that that's one way to go. Um, we also think there needs to be a significant differential between the residential and commercial FAR in order to incentivize uh, affordable housing uh, over office buildings or hotels. Um, otherwise, the city is not going to meet its affordable housing goals. Um, city planning must not change the zoning from M15 to M16 in the affordable housing zones, because this will undermine the entire purpose of this rezoning. This is where most of the affordable housing potential is. Uh, increasing commercial FAR to 10.0 will just uh, really undermine this. Next slide. Uh, a major issue here that people have raised is the, the risk of vertical enlargements because uh, MIH will allow property owners to add 12,500 square feet of space to their buildings without having to provide affordable housing on site. Um, so obviously this will damage the historic districts. Um, we have noted that 97% uh, of the buildings in Soho exceed 70% lot area coverage. 81% of the buildings in NoHo exceed 70% lot coverage. Um, so overall, um, you know, two thirds of Soho and NoHo is built to 100% lot coverage. Um, this is a complicated area of rezoning, but we think that the city should just not allow enlargements on buildings that exceed 70% lot coverage. Um, next slide. I'm sorry, go to the next one after this too. All right. Um, yeah, the final topic here is this legalization of JLWQA buildings. And um, we think city planning should provide an additional pathway to legalization uh, of these buildings. Um, architect Alex Nimrov proposes this idea, and it's supported by people like Zella Jones and Shelley Friedman. Um, so I, I really am not an expert in this particular area, but it, it would allow buildings to convert from JLWQA to JLWQ. Um, so these two use groups have the same building code requirements and wouldn't have to get a new CFO, uh, which is such a costly and time consuming process. And it would expand the pool of potential occupants of loft units in Soho and NoHo, including many professionals who work from home. Um, and they could reduce the fee so that there isn't this $100,000 or $100 per square foot fee uh, for selling, but reduce it to something more like 1% of the sales price for people who, uh, who convert um, from JLWQ to J JLWQA to JLWQ. Um, so those are really uh, my comments and I'll pass it on to the next person. Thank you very much, Steve. That was incredibly insightful as usual. Thank you. Um, Janine Kiley, who's chair of Community Board 2, and I want to thank her and her board because thousands of hours went into your presentation and recommendations. So thank you for joining us here tonight. Janine, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Janine, you're on mute. Sorry. If you could put up the first slide, please. Okay, great. Um, I, okay, I just, good evening. My name is Janine Kiley. Um, thank you, Borough President Brewer. Um, and thank you for letting us um, I present tonight. Um, I was preparing comments um, and I was invited to join the panel a little bit before one o'clock today. So, so please bear with me. I'm glad I got to go last. Um, and Gail, as you noted, CB2 has participated in this very long process. We participated in the Envision process. Uh, Carter Booth, our immediate past chair, was a member of the 18-member advisory group. He attended 40-plus meetings. There were six public meetings. There was 40-plus meetings, six public, 17 advisory group. I know Gail Brewer and her entire staff were at all of these meetings. Um, in 2020, CB2 participated in three city planning sessions. We hosted three public meetings on the draft scope of work in fall 2020. Um, the final scope of work came out in May 2021. It was virtually unchanged. We were a little disappointed in that, that our resolution 
really didn't have any impact. Um, and then we held eight meetings, three public hearings, four other meetings and our full board meeting. Um, and I wanna highlight tonight our um, resolution, um, the highlights of our resolution. So this resolution was passed on June 26th. Um, so I know there were some new ideas presented tonight. This, um, tonight I just wanna focus on CB2's resolution and I'm just putting in the chat a link to the resolution and the slides. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so CB2 rejected the mayor's plan to rezone Soho, NoHo, and Chinatown. The vote was um, 36 no, uh, I mean 36 against yes, 36 to one. So 36 um, in support of rejecting the plan. And we have four, six main reasons. The plan fails to achieve affordable housing objectives and increases displacement. It fails to maintain the mixed use neighborhood. It fails to secure a future future expand the jail QWA um, program. It fails to protect the six historic districts, fails to mitigate and listen to the community, and it completely failed outreach to Chinatown. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, today, city planning um, put together a nice marketing brochure, and I just wanna put these um, six comments next to what city planning presented. Um, so we know that the plan will expand luxury housing and it probably will found about what kind of affordable housing. We'll talk about that a little bit more. We know that it will strengthen the big box retail market. Um, it will strengthen, um, it will strengthen um, commercial staff, large restaurants potentially. Um, it will, we know the plan will tax artists through an ill-conceived fund to support the arts. We know it will be the first upzoning of six historic districts and we know that, and we've heard today, that it's gonna rely on voluntary unproven programs to mitigate the significant adverse impacts of the plan. I wanna point out that nothing in the city's plan has mentioned Chinatown or really the need to preserve affordable housing stock. I, although thank you to many people who mentioned that tonight. Next slide, please. Um, so number one, the mayor's plan fails to achieve affordable housing objectives. There was really no analysis of the huge incentives for commercial development, for office space and for dormitory use, not housing, um, non-dormitory housing. I wanna point out that, that I'm highlighting this picture. This is a city planning slide. These are the three opportunity areas that would rezone R10. 74% of the residential square footage would be in these three housing opportunity areas, 43% in Chinatown alone on this, what's called Southeast, Soho East, which is essentially Chinatown. The rezoning will drive displacement by incentivizing demolition as it's currently structured. There are 635 rent stabilized units in at least 185 buildings. And the plan fails to add any 100% affordable housing, which is the fastest and surest way to build affordable housing. There is no discussion of office or hotel conversions. I wanna specifically talk about two Howard Street. That's an under um, utilized federal parking garage. It's on a 12,791 square foot lot under executive order 13985 that Biden passed in, in January. I think there's a huge opportunity to advance racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. And this plan doesn't look at that at all. CB2's resolutions both specifically mention this site. Next slide, please. Um, Eugene Yu, who's a member of the CB2 team and the vice chair of our Soho NoHo working group will take you through these numbers in more detail, but I wanted to get them at, sort of out there in the slides. People can take a look at these, but there are a number of rent stabilized apartments in this community um, that will be impacted by the rezoning. Um, and, can, and there's, you can see that there have been a number of HPD violations, and this is just one indicator of ongoing displacement pr pressure on existing low-income households and families in our community. And I also want to talk about the continued displacement of Asians from Manhattan Chinatown, and these are not so as the census numbers are trickling out. Um, just want to point out that three neighborhoods with Asian populations and 5,000 plus experienced notable declines. Um, including 17% in the Soho, Little Italy, Hudson Square neighborhood. Um, and it's the only neighborhoods in the entire city with a substantial drop in Asian population because that has grown overall. Next slide, please. Um, the second um, criticism of the mayor's plan is it fails to maintain mixed use neighborhood. This neighborhood is currently 40% residential 
based on the square footage of existing um, um, development. It will grow to 43 plus percent if all of the projected housing is actually built. This is a unique mixed use neighborhood and quality life is critical now and it will be even more critical in the future. CP2 is not fighting ground floor retail. I uh, just wanna lay that out there. Nobody is saying we are opposed to as of right, ground floor retail, less than 10,000 square feet under use group six. The mayor's plan also eliminates the 10,000 square foot cap on retail. The city planning acknowledges that are very few floor plates over 10,000 square feet. And currently there are only 11 sites in excess of 10,000 square feet. And special permits for large retail, particularly use group 10, are very common in other districts. The plan also eliminates the 5,000 square foot cap on eating and drinking establishments, despite caps in nearby special districts. The special Hudson Square District and the special Tribeca Mixed Use District both have caps on eating and drinking establishments. They're based on occupancy, not on square footage, but they are caps. Um, this essentially provides a zoning led bailout for over leveraged retail owners. And really, with, again, we agree with um, the SOHO bid. We are concerned about small, medium sized businesses. And the way the plan is written, it really disincentivizes opportunities for these organizations. Um, and you know, if you make as of right retail um, available, then small businesses can compete. If you put this 10,000 square foot cap, you pull it out of there, there is not is going to be very difficult for small businesses to compete. Next page, please. Next, um, I want, so the plan fails to secure the future, or even consider the expansion of joint living working quarters for artists. The Soho Cast Iron Historic District really was one of the most successful affordable housing programs. The city put virtually no, basically the money that was put into it were uh, um, zoning changes that put in place in the 70s and the blood, sweat and tears of the people who essentially founded this neighborhood from Hell's 100 Acres. And instead the plan will impose a punitive fee of $100 per square foot. It's an ill-conceived art fund that fails to acknowledge the contribution of the artists to our community or the adaptive reuse that has been extremely successful in this copy worldwide. The plan didn't include any outreach with state elected officials or law law experts before making these proposed changes. And I will say that at uh, last week's borough board meeting, my only recommendation was to have a law law expert present tonight, not myself, um, but I hopefully there will be, there have been some discussions of that here and hopefully many other people will present. Um, the other thing that this the plan fails to consider is the significant cost for building code compliance and the displacement, all the rent protections that we talk about at the state level um, do not go, do not help tenants who are in joint living working quarters for artists. CB2 had a special meeting specifically on this. There are a number of concerns um, about getting rid of this class, particularly for tenants, um, because the landlord, while the punitive fee may seem high, if you are, as you know, lived in the neighborhood for a long time, if you want to get rid of that, you know, rent stabilized JLQWA tenant, the break even could be very short, depending on what that person is paying. Um, next slide, please. Um, Anita Brandt, who is the chair of our Soho NoHo Working Group, will go into more detail, but this plan essentially fails to protect the six historic districts. It's a massive upzoning, up to 140%. 80% of the area is landmark, and it creates a precedent for upzoning historic districts citywide. This is a rendering that Municipal Art Society did of Chinatown from Baxter and Canal Street. Next slide. Um, these are some renderings in NoHo. Um, sorry, next slide, please. Um, NoHo, Bowery and Great Jones, and Lafayette and Great Jones. And the next slide. Um, this is SoHo um, in uh, the corner of Prince and Crosby. I do want to mention earlier, Eric Botsford specifically mentioned 40 Mercer Street. Um, and 40 Mercer Street, based on a quick Google, is 173 feet tall and talked about how that is out of scale and without height caps, we are at risk. Guess what? The city's proposing 205 feet there. So they are saying, as of right, let's build a whole bunch of 40 Mercers and make them 35, um, um, 30 feet taller. Um, so I just wanna point that out. Next slide, please. Um, I, there was a significant failure to reach out to Chinatown. 43% of the rezoning is in Chinatown. There was one meeting in 2019 with one attendee. 
Um, this was a check the box meeting. Um, in fact, this plan in the housing opportunity area in the Southeast will benefit a handful of large property owners with large or contiguous sites. And CB2 member Anthony Wong, who lives in this neighborhood, will in this part of the rezoning area will give more detail. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, it's a failure to mitigate and listen to com the committee community. There's been there is absolutely no mitigation of significant adverse impacts that the EIS identifies: impacts on open space, historic and cultural resources, transportation, and noise. Um, I I just want to point out um, somebody had mentioned earlier that this neighborhood is well served by open space. I just want to correct the record that is in fact not true. Um, the NoHo neighborhood. Um, which um, the seek in seeker technical manual, is, which includes NoHo, SoHo, Chinatown, and parts of the Lower East Side, is the only downtown Manhattan neighborhood that is underserved by open space. You can click on the link that I put in the chat and see that map. I also want to talk apples to oranges, or as I like to say, you can't have your cake uh, and eat it too. Uh, I think city planning has been very on point, but other entities, including them and or the mayor in particular has liked to mix his apples and oranges. There are 26 projected sites um, in the EIS. There are also 58 potential sites. These 26 sites will produce 1,861 housing units, 20 to 30% are affordable. I do wanna point out zero are guaranteed. And the EIS evaluates the impact from these projected sites. That's what's projected to be built in years one through 10. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. You can't say you're gonna get 3,000 plus units of housing um, but have an EIS. So all of the potential sites are not part of the environmental analysis, are not part of what the city is opining on through this ULERT process. And I just wanna be clear on that. Um, and finally, the plan is virtually unchanged from the draft scope of work to the final scope of work. And um, despite repeated requests on a number of topics, there's been no financial analysis shared with CB2. There's been um, no outreach to the Landmarks Preservation Commission, um, no discussions with um, Department of Aging about the number of seniors aging in place in our community. Next slide, please. I wanna highlight, this is as of July, July 26, when CB2's full board met, there's broad opposition to the proposed plan. There's 30 organizations, um, the affordable housing and tenant groups, including um, Cooper Square Committee that presented tonight, New York City loft tenants, which hopefully we'll present later, historic and environmental pres preservation organizations, neighborhood organizations. I, we highlight it in green here, all the members of the Envision Soho NoHo advisory group, 50% of the Envision Soho NoHo advisory group um, were um, opposed to this plan. And I just wanna say, so who are the other 50%? There's two bids, that's 11%. There's Rebney um, and Chamber of Commerce um, also support it. Um, there's two, um, Council Member Rivera and City Planning Land Use, which obviously due to the Euler process have not opined yet. Um, there's two universities, NYU and Cooper Square, um, that presumably would benefit from um, the opportunity to build dormitory space and more university space and um, Lower Manhattan Community um, Council, um, which is an arts organization. And I think it's okay if they're silent on this. So every residential group or small business oriented group that has been part of this planning process that was deeply involved with it is opposed to the plan as the mayor presented it. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I just wanna reiterate, CB2 has rejected the mayor plans for six reasons. The failure to achieve affordable housing, our significant concerns about displacement, the huge number of affordable units, uh, the rent stabilized units that um, might go away, um, the failure to maintain the mixed use neighborhood, including the reliance on voluntary programs. As wonderful as these programs are, they're voluntary, they're unproven, um, and um, are not going to, people can't hang their hat on them. Um, the J JLQWA problems, the destruction of six historic districts, the failure to mitigate, and complete silence on Chinatown. Please read the CB2 resolution. It's at a bit.ly link, bit.ly forward slash CB2SN Chinatown, and it's uppercase, lowercase sensitive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janine, very much. I'm going to ask um, for that really comprehensive and shows how many hours of work, and I appreciate it very much. So one of the questions that I have, we're going to, and then you should feel free to ask each other, 
but um, Steve mentioned the notion of more affordable housing, forgetting even the size of the building and all the other um, important challenges. I get, and I want to hear from Jessica and from Eric and from Steve and anybody else who wants to chime in, how do we get to 50% or 75% affordable so that we really have something that is uh, going to make the community more affordable? Every time I bring this up, I'm told that if we do such, then we are perhaps jeopardizing MI8 citywide. So maybe others can chime in because it does seem that we get a lot of high income housing in this proposal, but not a lot of affordable. So I don't know if anybody wants to tackle that, but that's what I'm con one of the issues I'm concerned about. Well, sure, I'll start. Okay, just please go ahead, Jessica. Sure. Um, so, you know, there's a variety of different one, once the area is rezoned to allow residential at all, um, there's a couple of different MIH options, as you know, and I think it's a reason like reasonable people can disagree about whether you'd prefer a larger proportion of affordable units at higher income levels or fewer affordable units at deeper income levels, which is always the trade off in any building. Um, so the, the sample family that we presented was sort of the most modest approach, which is to keep things more like at the 80% of AMI, but MIH obviously has deeper options, but there's not even a discussion about which MIH option to take until residential is, is allowed in the, in the neighborhood at all. Um, but I also think Janine and a couple other people have brought up the Howard Street site. I would love for SoHo to get its hands on the Howard Street site for affordable housing, if that's kind of outside the scope of the rezoning conversation, unfortunately, but once there's residential allowable in Soho, I think it's absolutely all of us who've been fighting like cats and dogs about this should all get together and fight to try to get that Howard Street garage. Yeah, but what I'm saying is something different. I know about the deep and I understand uh, the different AMIs. I'm talking about more units per se. Right now, MIH is 25%. That doesn't help me. I want 50% or more of the entire building to be accessible for affordable housing. That, and Essex Street got it because it was on city-owned land. I got it. Um, Steve, I don't know if you have any ways that we can approach this, but that's what I need more of. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there really aren't any city-owned properties uh, in Soho and NoHo that are, you know, there is one I think that uh, DEP owns, but it's it's where the, uh, the water tunnel is, <laughs> so that right, can't be developed. Um, but uh, and there aren't really, you know, nonprofit owners. I mean, if a church or some other nonprofit owns a site, that potentially could be, you know. Um, redeveloped for you know 100 percent affordable housing um, but you're you know when you're asking private developers who have many options with their property who can develop office building or hotel um you know for market rate to to set aside 50 percent of their space for affordable housing um mih is only going to require up to 25 or 30 percent uh, unless they yeah. rewrite the zoning resolution um, and, uh, you know, I've thought about this as well and, and tried to push for higher percentage of low income in Soho and NoHo, but, you know, the only other way to do it is through additional subsidies and maybe some of the affordable housing fund money could be allocated towards that um, on sites where they're, where they're building less than 12,500 square feet, um, because that is supposed to be reallocated within Soho and NoHo over the first 10 years after the rezoning. Right. Um, I'm sorry that I don't have a better answer, but I, that's okay. really it. Eric, I know you know that I've been pushing this, so I just didn't know if there's Section 8 or some other way of bringing some of these units permanently affordable, more than the 25%. Well, the you know, I mean, the city is always looking at all the options that are on the table to maximize affordability. When we're talking about, and, and you know, to Howard Street, I think is a great example to bring up. It is a federally owned site. Um, you know, I think uh, it, it would be a fantastic Eric, site. We, to, don't, we don't have to, it yet. We don't have we, it yet. We don't, we don't have it yet. Have... It, I think we can all say it shouldn't be a parking facility in the future. But I think, you know, to, to say, though, you know, the point that I really want to make right now is really two points. You know, right now, we're starting from a base of 0% affordable housing in Soho no to us, you know, which is MIH at 25 mm -hmm. to uh, 30%. And um, you know, I, I think that is a, you know, a, a really critical thing to recognize is we're going from zero to, you know, up to 30. And that's a lot. You know, the other okay. thing to point out is that MIH 
was designed to work in neighborhoods like Soho and NoHo, high value neighborhoods where affordable housing can be produced by the private market with, without subsidy from the city. So the city can you know, take its dollars and spend it you know, elsewhere where subsidies are really important to be able Aaron, to- that doesn't to work get the for me going. in Manhattan. That doesn't work for me in Manhattan because that means the Bronx. I don't want to argue about it, but let's just leave it at that. I, that argument I can't deal with. I'm just telling you, it just it, it doesn't work for me. So for Mark, um, uh, one of the questions from a participant is: Will the big box stores and interactive retail entertainment venues drive out the small creative businesses? I know you've been thinking about that, so I appreciate your answer. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think what what people need to um, recognize is, you know, right now we have a situation where retail on the ground floor is not legal. And the way to legal, the way to get legal retail today is through either a special permit or to have your, um, have your space uh, grandfathered, which is, which is risky. So what you end up with are two types of retail. <laughs> you have, um, deep pocket retail, which can afford the special permit process or, um, get, you know, hire the right, att hire attorneys to um, you know, vet, vet the property and make sure that they're in there legally. Or you get what you, what you had in Soho in the 70s and 80s, which are, and even today, I mean, you still see some legacy um, retail that's like, you know, low investment, that's not, you know, that's not, um, that's willing to take the risk. Um, and so, you know, I think what we're looking what 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 would what you'd see with this proposal on retail and what we're what we're proposing with retail on the second floor and below is really making it a bit more available to small, medium, and and you know small medium medium sized businesses. Um, and I would just add that you know on Broadway the floor plates tend to be a little bit bigger, but but Soho generally is, has a wide variety of building shapes and sizes. Um, off Broadway it tends to have much smaller floor plates than on Broadway. On Broadway, our floor plates on, you know, on over 27% of our sites are more than 10,000 square feet. So just by natural, um, the natural shape and size of the, of the building stock within Soho and NoHo leads to, a, leads to um, retail sizes of small, medium, and, and, and even large uh, retail, uh, to, you know, sprinkled throughout the neighborhood. Okay, Gerard, you wanted to chime in, go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. I wanted to respond to the affordable housing topic we just had a moment ago, because um, I'm fearful we're going to like pass over that subject and say, kind of shrug our shoulders, like, oh, we can't do it. So next topic. Um, you know, generally speaking, affordable housing, you need either cheap or free land. You need subsidies or you need tax abatements um, yeah. and potentially air rights. And kind of sort of in New York City, you need all of them. So... I think what this rezoning is solving is one of them. You know, I'm sure our HPD colleagues are listening to this, scratching their heads, like, where are they going to get additional subsidies to create more affordable housing? Um, and I think we all have to work together to do that. I think it's a little bit of the air rights, but it's also a little bit of getting the subsidies. It's a little bit of the tax abatements. You know, the 421 and J51 are really hard to do right now. Um, some people say we shouldn't use it. Um, it's hard to do affordable housing without, you know, all those different tools working in tandem. So I just want to put that on record. Thank you. I think the other concern, and I don't know who can answer this, is the how do you make sure that we get residential and not commercial? And I know that in the East Midtown, and I think Eric knows this, we worked pretty hard to do commercial because that's what we wanted there and not residential. So is there some way, I guess, for Eric or others to help how can we get as much residential as possible? Because some, uh, many residents are concerned that much of this could end up being commercial. And I know the city wants to not lose the jobs, but I think our goal here is to get affordable housing. So I didn't know if there's some mechanism we could use as we did in East Midtown where we wanted commercial. How could we make sure that this is residential and not commercial? Thank you, Gail. Um, well, I'll say first that there are a number of large existing buildings in Soho and NoHo today that house a lot of commercial use, very significant for the amount of office use that's in those buildings. And the neighborhood plan uh, does 
require that that space be preserved for commercial use in the future, that it not be able to be converted to residential. I know that you're talking about new buildings and um, that, uh, you know, it, I think the balance of ensuring that you, you know, continue to have Soho Noho as mixed use neighborhoods is really critically important. The, the densities that are proposed in Soho Noho, they do put their thumb on the scale right now for residential, different amounts in different areas. Residential, you know, has historically, you know, significantly outcompeted commercial in many areas. And so we do think that the way that the densities are set up right now in the neighborhood plan um, continues that mixed use tradition for Soho Noho, that we will have residential development and a substantial amount of it, we believe, because, you know, the market has long been hot in Soho and Noho for residential. Um, and we'll still have a commercial character that exists there. Um, and, you know, we, again, we think that balance is, is very important in getting that balance right. I hope that's what will exist. Uh, another question was to convert from joint living to residential, will the building certificate of occupancy also have to be amended? I think people are concerned. Uh, current owners who are not certified artists yet reside in joint living lofts, will they be required to pay into the art fund now in order to be legalized? I think there's a lot of concern generally about uh, joint living. And I do like Steve's suggestion, which I know others have made, um, Alex in particular, about taking, as you say, take the A out is what you were suggesting, basically. Um, but I, I guess this is a back to you. Um, Eric, what others may join, you know, join in about the joint living, which is really an important part of Soho and Noho. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I think what I'll lead by saying is that no one will be required to do anything under the proposal. There are no artists that will be required to convert their units, to pay into any kind of a fund. If you're an artist and a certified artist and you want to remain in Soho and Noho, um, you can continue to do so. Uh, during the public engagement process, we did hear about from people who were, I think, rightly concerned about this, this gray area they find themselves in when it's time to sell their unit, pass on their unit, they want to retire, they, you know, have children they want to, you know, leave a unit to, and the zoning says you may only do that to other certified artists. No one else may live there other than a certified artist. And you know, obviously that creates a roadblock for people when it comes time to make these big life decisions. So this creates an optional mechanism that allows people to transition from a JLWQA to regular residential use. In those kinds of scenarios where you're doing that conversion from a manufacturing use, which is what Joint Living Workforce for Artists is, to a residential use, um, you know, there is the updating of a CFO that's involved with that. But again, this is optional. No one is forced to do anything at all. Um, I'll, moving on to what, what Steve was mentioning regarding the JLWQ, um, you know, leaving the artist, removing the artist piece from it. I, we think it's a, a really important idea here. The zoning that is proposed um, you know, really does do that. It broadens the definition of live work so that it's not just a small subset of artists that is able to qualify as a certified artist, which is the way it is today, but all kinds of artists, all kinds of makers and artisans would be able to live in and produce within their units. This kind of home occupation, live work um, broadening is, is a really critical piece of the rezoning proposal. And it's in there, it's in there today. Um, and, you know, we're happy to hear that, you know, it's something that others feel is, is a very important piece of this proposal. Okay. All right. Um, there was another question, I think, uh, about open space. There isn't much. And is there anything in this proposal that is open space or could be open space? I know there was some discussion about closing some streets and making them green. It would take um, a different approach, I think. But is there any discussion about more open space? Uh, and I'm not talking about street trees or just widening sidewalks. Um, I just didn't know if there's anything that is in the discussion. And we won't talk about schools. Janine and I share an interest in the schools. It's a different topic. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the open space, is there something that I'm missing in terms of that issue? Well, I think, you know, I mean, people 
rightfully point out that you know within Soho and Noho themselves, there's you know there's not a, a ton of open space, and the environmental impact study that's being conducted for this uh, this proposal takes a very very close and careful look at open space impacts that would potentially be generated by by the rezoning proposal um, mitigation related to those impacts that is like trying to address those issues um, is something that uh, you know that takes place you know from now going forward in this process so as we move further in this process um, we'll begin to hear about potential mitigation measures and so those are really actively being explored I think the idea of streets um, you know, serving as open spaces. I mean, you know, I think we all see open streets today and, you know, this time of COVID serving as really valuable uh, open space for all of us. And, uh, you know, I think it's a very interesting idea to explore here. Okay, Janine, did anything come up during the uh, discussion at the community board about some major open space ideas as opposed to um, other topics? Um, we had a bunch of ideas suggested and we'll probably have those discussed in, at our September meeting. Um, but if there are any outside ideas, we would encourage people to present those to community board too. Um, we have an executive meeting outside tomorrow. You can go to the CB2 website um, or you can just email um, CB2 and I'll put the email in the, in the chat. Um, but I would encourage people who have great ideas to actually share them with the public. Okay. All right. I'll, I'm going to go to the public testimony list. Um, anybody here has some ideas that you want to share back and forth. This is, a, as you can see, a tough topic. No matter what is suggested, it's hard to implement. I, I know because I've been trying. Okay. All right. We have some instructions. All right. So we're going to go now to the public. I'm going to start with uh, the wonderful assembly member, Deborah Glick. And after that will be Congressman Carolyn Maloney. And then we're going to go to the three members of community board number two. Deborah Glick. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present. Um, and I appreciate, uh, Gail, this uh, very detailed uh, presentation by various folks. So this was really terrific. Um, However, uh, I believe this is an ill-conceived plan by Department of City Planning. And uh, I have submitted an extensive detailed response in writing, uh, but would like to highlight a few of those things, uh, those key issues uh, that should lead to a rejection of this ULERP. If it would actually add to diversity in our community, I would support it, but I do not believe that that will be the end result. While there are many wealthy property owners in the downtown community, the majority of people who actually live here full time and are, are working and middle class people who struggle to afford the cost of living in an area that's been disrupted by rampant real estate speculation. This is especially true for artists. Uh, there is no guarantee that this rezoning will result in more affordable housing. Uh, by giving uh, another uh, giveaway to uh, luxury developers. In 2017, Samuel Stein in the Journal of Urban Affairs wrote that zoning changes with mandatory inclusionary housing and zoning for quality and affordability have only exacerbated affordable housing issues by causing real estate speculation when developers anticipate a zoning change and buy up properties, thus driving up prices higher dis despite the goal of providing more affordable housing. Uh, his research shows that the speculation of a zoning change displaces more residents during a ULERP than the, the dwelling units that MIH proposes to create. The JLWQA, uh, the Protected Artist Housing, I think it's very interesting that DCP has repeatedly said certified artist. The city hasn't maintained records of certified artists for years. Please show me that list. We have asked in the past and we have been told it doesn't exist. Uh, so I am very skeptical when DCP presents with and qualifies it with certified artists. Um, 
DCP has said that um, they have essentially eliminated in this zoning the JLWQA category without anything to really replace it. They have pointed to rent regulation as sufficient protection. We know that there are ways in which rent regulated housing has been eliminated in rezoned areas, so it's cold comfort. And in fact, the very materials, substances, and processes used by various artists are those not allowed in residential zones. So the protection for artists is thin. Um, the loft law, which I was proud to sponsor and see enacted, has been ignored by too many landlords uh, who have chosen not to uh, actually go through the process. And they've done so with the help of the city administration, which has not enforced any of those regulations. This further threatens artists in Soho and NoHo. Obviously, we do have galleries, museums, and retail, uh, but this actually reminds me of the rezoning that we all went through on the far side of uh, in Hudson Square. And what we were promised was mixed income housing, affordable housing, and what we have gotten is a major commercial development. I could see the same thing happening here under this plan. Um, the destruction uh, of historic districts seems to be something on the city's agenda. Uh, there have been many instances where uh, LPC, the uh, Landmarks Preservation Committee has, uh, Commission has in fact allowed ridiculously uh, out of context buildings to be built. Uh, we believe strongly in historic districts. Uh, the proposed arts fund is an empty box with no details on how that money would be spent or who might be eligible for it. Uh, and the um, entire plan ignores the historic districts uh, and their intrinsic value to the city. It undermines those residents who have affordable housing now and would encourage demolition of smaller buildings leading to more eviction threats. And finally, DCP did not do sufficient outreach to neighborhoods bordering the so-called opportunity zones, which will face more speculative interest and potential displacement of nearby residents. Please reject this deeply flawed scheme. Uh, I wanna commend in closing Mark and Steve for some of their uh, creative uh, recommendations. But in the end, this current scheme is inappropriate and the current administration uh, in its la last few months should not be in charge of dislocating uh, a community. Uh, there are better ways of um, providing and ensuring more diversity. Uh, and I believe that um, I will look forward to working closely with CB2 and other partners in uh, reaching out to our federal representatives to get the Howard Street site. That would provide a much more direct way to actually increase affordable housing in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assembly Member. Next, we're going to hear from Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. Okay, thank you. Am I in now? You thank are. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Well, thank you, uh, Gail, for allowing me to present testimony today as part of the Uniform Land Review Procedure on the proposed SOHO NOHO's rezoning application. I, I strongly believe that the rezoning plan fails uh, to address and meet its main objective of affordable housing. The current plan will displace, erode, and impact the lives of rent protected and lower income residents and Soho Noho and the neighboring communities, many of which are located in the 12th Congressional District that I am privileged to represent. I would like very much to be um, associated with the comments of my colleague and friend Deborah Glick. 
Uh, every elected official that I've talked to is opposed to this. And as you know, several community boards and community leaders have expressed their concerns regarding the uprooting and displacement of existing residents and have encouraged the principals behind the plan to conduct further studies. Where are the economic studies? Where are the displace displacement studies? Uh, it seems like they're rushing it through in the closing days of this administration. It is completely unfair. And if it was a serious uh, examination of the issues, they would not be holding this important uh, panelist discussion. And I compliment all the panelists and uh, your hearing uh, during the last week in August, which is historically the week that everybody's on vacation. It's almost like they don't want you to look at it. Because when you look at it, you see the gaping loopholes that really do not uh, address saving the character integrity of the, of the historic district or the affordable housing that doesn't address the displacement. Now, historic districts are created, they're very difficult processes. Uh, you know, Gail, that we've uh, backed and worked on historic districts. It takes uh, years in some cases, months uh, to create them, yet they're, they're destroying one. I haven't seen that happen the entire time I've been in public life. Why create a historic district? So a developer then can build a wall of high uh, in the sky, uh, uh, buildings that don't have any room for affordable housing. It is uh, disruptive, it is wrong. I am deeply opposed to it. I, I am very supportive of the greater need for affordable housing in Soho Noho, but I do not believe the city, city's plan addresses this concern of all the uh, residents and community leaders in the area. In fact, they have been, uh, uh, you know, ignored. I'd say because of the uh, loopholes, the plan fails to guarantee affordable housing. And they're, they're, how in the world is, and where is the goal and where is the rules or guidelines that create economic and racial diversity? I haven't been able to see any. They're not gonna be able to achieve it here. And with all of this new upzoning and housing, as you rightfully pointed out, uh, Madam Chair, Madam Borough President, where's the green space? Where are the schools? Where's the transportation? And they're lifting all of the restrictions on oversized re retail, on re oversized uh, retail stores. They're gonna push out all of our small businesses. And I am uh, particularly concerned uh, because the rezoning will be incredibly disruptive. And I, and I believe that the community must have a seat at the table and an active voice in the future development of their community. I have seen no guarantee of an increase in neighborhood public schools, seats, sanitation, public services, public and open recreational green space to accommodate, accommodate the incredible increase in density. What are they doing? Trying to destroy not only Soho Noho, but Manhattan, this is the third rezoning proposal that I know in the community that I represent that is being rushed through in the closing days of this administration. And I think it's uh, ill-conceived and just plain wrong. Uh, the rezoning plan will also be incredibly disruptive to the hundreds of small independent mom and pop stores in the neighborhoods by lifting the current restriction on the large retail stores. Uh, Gail, why did we work so hard to get the PPP loans out to the small stores to save them if now they're gonna be run out with all of the restrictions removed and you can just move in the great re larger retail stores and you know that's what's gonna happen. So I urge the city to continue working with all of the stakeholders to improve the proposed neighborhood city, Soho Noho neighborhood plan. And additionally, I would urge the New York City Department of City Planning to avoid scheduling any public hearings related to Soho Noho rezoning applications during the summer holidays, when most of our families, that's the one time that they have a vacation, the last week in August, and that's when they're pushing it through. So I just want to close by saying that since my days in New York City Council, I have worked uh, diligently to expand access to affordable housing and preserve the historic character of our neighborhoods. The Lower East Side is historic. It's a, it's a destination neighborhood. 
And uh, this plan will destroy that. Uh, with the voices of the community at the forefront, I, I, I also joined their voice in being opposed to this current res rezoning plan for Soho NoHo. And I, I just uh, uh, object also to the rushing of this uh, through at the last minute. And the Lower East Side has always been known for a haven for artists. There's no protection for them. The law laws are being ignored. And I, I uh, hope that uh, our borough president will uh, have a very sharp pencil when she analyzes this. And uh, all I can say, the entire community cannot be wrong. I don't even know anyone in the community who lives there who's for this plan. And I join their voice in urging a no vote and I yield back. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. One issue would be to work with your colleague, I believe it's in his district, to Howard Street. It is a city, uh, federally owned site and there's been a lot of support for turning it over to affordable housing, however that would be done. So maybe you could work with Congressman Nadler on that, because that is the one, I would say, government-owned site in the whole okay. district. So just the Howard know. Street, I will call Two them. Howard. Two, okay. Number two okay. Howard. Okay. Two Howard, um, yep, that's it. Okay. All right, thank so you. We thank have you. a way of respecting the jurisdiction of uh, other council members, but I'll be glad to reach out to him. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And next we're gonna hear from Anita Brandt, Eugene Yo, Anthony Wong, and then uh, Peg Breen. And just one second, we'll have um, Connor um, Allerton from our office just give some instructions on how we'll receive um, public testimony. Go ahead, Connor. Yes, so um, we will be hearing from four members from Community Board 2, and after that, if um, public members of the public would like to uh, raise their hand, we ask you do that in a moment. I'm going to lower everyone's hand starting now, so we have uh, so everyone can do it at the same time. Um, to testify, uh, you're going to use the raise hand function. Uh, we'll call on members of the public in the order that they raise their hands. Once called on, you'll be promoted to use your microphone and camera. Please limit your testimony to two minutes. After two minutes, we'll ask you to wrap up. Um, after which you'll be demoted back to an attendee. Um, please also give a moment to be uh, turned into a panelist. It takes just a second. So don't start until you are unmuted and ready to go. Um, yeah, and so with that, and if you, I think we have a few people dialing in. So if you're on the phone, you can dial star nine to uh, raise your hand. Um, right, thank you. Thank you very much. Anita Brandt, go right ahead. Anita, you should be promoted and able to unmute. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Are you? Are you Hi, everybody. It worked, great. Uh, my name is Anita Brandt. Many here know me as chair of the Soho NoHo Working Group. Today, I need to speak personally as a lifetime resident. I moved to Bleecker Street when I was four years old Exploring the surrounding streets ultimately influenced my choice of career. I'm a licensed architect specializing in renovation and restoration of historic structures. So permit me to speak from the heart about the destruction that is about to sweep over Soho, NoHo, and parts of Chinatown. We face a steamroller fueled by the promise of financial gain for a few and an army of PR professionals who have generated a fog of misinformation. While our community voices and constructive alternatives are ignored. Look at Paris, Copenhagen, Rome, Havana. People there are carefully, continuously preserving their beloved urban landscapes without upzoning. Why are future generations of New Yorkers to be denied the authentic experience of a historic city? Old is not currently in style, but trust me, it will come full circle. CB2 has studied this plan for two years. We are obviously not against careful change and we are totally committed to affordable housing in our neighborhood. However, this plan does not solve its stated goals 
and instead will unleash a real estate gold rush. It will sweep away what NoHo and SoHo uh, historically significant. It will threaten other historic districts and it will undermine the viability of landmark laws everywhere. After a lifetime of restoring historic buildings, I feel a deep sense of loss. Our legacy will be that this happened under our watch. You need, you need to wrap up. Pandemic, I'm to, done, yeah. Up. Please okay. do not allow this rezoning to go forward. This is our Pompeii and we can do much, much better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if anybody on the panel has any questions for these community board members, feel free. I would, you're welcome. Anybody have any questions? Yes, Jessica, go ahead. Um, I just want to weigh in on a lot of the comments that have been around displacement, which is always obviously a really critical issue, and we should try to do everything we can to mitigate any displacement impacts of any kind of land use actions that we take. Um, I do want to point out, though, that most of the conversation that has been heard here tonight is around the displacement impacts of doing the development, where in fact, both the research shows and what the laws of supply and demand would say is that it's not building the housing that creates this pressure on rents in an existing building. It's that scarcity of not having enough apartments creates this huge upward pressure on rents, which is what we see in Soho that creates displacement. So when folks are worried about displacement, I completely share that concern. I would just urge you to think about the impact of no doing nothing here on displacement, which has a huge impact on displacing tenants, not just the impact of building. Thank you. I just wish we could get more affordable out of it. Then I would feel better. But I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Our next is uh, Eugene, you a member of Board Two, and then Anthony Wong. Eugene, go ahead. Okay. Okay, Eugene, you should be promoted now. Uh, thank you, Madam Borough President, um, and thank you to your office for um, holding this uh, public hearing. Um, I wanted to speak about some of the analysis um, that we did on the community board in the final scope of work and the draft scope of work, um, in particularly uh, in the opportunity areas, uh, which is something that uh, jumped out at us. So particularly um, the Soho East zone, um, and that zone consists of just four full blocks and two half blocks, but this zone, uh, when we looked at it, contributed 43% of the entire zoned floor area that would be built under this proposal, um, and 46% of the proposed 1.5 million new residential zoned floor area would also be coming from this one area. Um, in terms of residential units, that translates to 808 residential units of which um, 161 to 242 would be MIH units. Um, that was all coming from, again, uh, Soho East, which is a, a bit of a misnomer. It's, it's what I traditionally think of as Chinatown. And I think what many of our neighbors also think of as Chinatown. And, and I do wanna echo home the point that uh, Chinatown has, has been conspicuously missing from the name of this rezoning when so much of the, uh, of the development would be coming from the Chinatown area. Um, we also looked at the existing stock of rent stabilized apartments um, and addressing you know, some of the issues of displacement. Um, and we cross-referenced the 847 lots that were in the mayor's rezoning plan against tax rolls and other records to find the number of rent stabilized buildings. We found that one in five of the residential buildings contained rent stabilized apartments. Um, these buildings contained at least 668 rent stabilized units, which represents 1,263 residents. Um, that's most likely a large undercount, as others know that this information is very difficult to come by. Um, so in the opportunity areas, 43% uh, of the apartments there are currently rent stabilized. And in Soho, 50% You can start to wrap up if you can. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I just want to close and say, in talking about affordable housing, I think it's a game of semantics to say that Income restricted housing um, is the only type of affordable housing, um, and that completely ignores uh, the reality of the rent stabilized housing um, and the families that are living there. Thank you. Thank you. I would agree with you that there's plenty of affordability in rent stabilized. So I agree with you on that 100%. Uh, Anthony Wong, go ahead. And after that, Peg Green. Uh, 
Uh, hello? Can you hear me? Then go ahead. Hi, uh, Madam Borough uh, President. Uh, so uh, since the age of five, I've lived on Center Street, which is uh, in the Opportunity Zone uh, for the past 36 years. Um, during the envisioning process, outreach was not done for the uh, Soho East uh, dubbed area uh, in 2019. The only way, uh, the only reason they did hold that one particular meeting was because I brought it up in the council member's office and DCP uh, did a uh, impromptu workshop the following weekend and checked off the box. Uh, the only person who attended was my mother because I encouraged her to go. Uh, it, it's uh, very disingenuous for city planning to uh, take a sliver of Chinatown and not even mutter the word Chinatown during the presentation to solve this affordable housing crisis you know, problem, uh, laying this solution on us in this neighborhood. And you should be very wary of this particular opportunity zone. Uh, there are two big entities that own a large lot, parking lot that is in properties and also a, another property owner. Uh, he owns five contiguous buildings together. They're currently commercial. So there is no guarantee that uh, these entities will make housing or affordable housing. And that is my time. Well, thank you very much, Anthony, for all your support on the community board also. Next is Peg Green. Ger Gerard, I think, would like to say something. Go ahead. Uh, Gerard, go ahead. Thank you. Green and green. Um, um, you know, I, you know, I, we can't hear you, Gerard. Can you hear me now? Me now. Better, yes. It's still, yes, better. Okay. okay. You know, I, you know, I, one thing one thing that was mentioned earlier is that, that you know, a lot of a lot of said they wanted to raise more affordable housing funds. Maybe they could come back to the with the proposal. Gerard, it's, still, it's a little hard to hear you. We're trying. Maybe if you talk up or something, I'm sorry. I'm trying. I don't know. How about now? Much better. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, a, a, a number of folks have said that they want affordable housing to happen in Soho Noho. You know, maybe they could come back to you, Gail, with a proposal on where within the district they would like to, you know, I don't think we should put it all in one block and all in one neighborhood and all in one street. I think it should be thoughtfully spread throughout the community so that people can have, you know, affordable housing near the train station, near where the jobs are. Um, but I think we, we can thoughtfully do it so it doesn't have to be compressed all into one area so that, you know, Chinatown doesn't necessarily have to carry a higher brunt of it. You know, part of the issue and one of the presenters mentioned it earlier is that other parts of New York City are creating a large portion of the affordable housing in New York City. And that part of this process is how can we thoughtfully do that within Soho as well as, you know, the other communities within New York City. Thank you. That's I appreciate it very much. There has been there have been other proposals. They they don't seem to be moving as quickly as one might like. But I agree with you. We've got to figure out something for more affordable. Absolutely agree. Um, the next is Peg Green. Thank you for jumping in. Peg, you, you should be promoted um, if you can hear us. Is Peg Green there? Yes, Peg, you're in. You're just muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. I'm Peg Green, president of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. I also served on the Soho NoHo Advisory Group. The Conservancy has always supported updating the area of zoning to reflect the current residential and commercial realities. We also support the goal of affordable housing but we cannot support this plan. This is just another invitation to developers wrapped in the aura of affordable housing. I also believe that the majority of the of advisory group members agreed it's vital to protect the area's historic character. It's pretty obvious this plan threatens this unique area without a scale development. It even acknowledges that most affordable units would likely be built outside the historic districts. You've heard thoughtful alternative zoning proposals from the Cooper Square Committee and Soho Broadway Initiative. 
They allow for new development without damaging this unrivaled collection of cast iron and post-Civil War commercial architecture that has boosted the city's economy, drawing visitors from around the world. We saw the Soho Broadway Initiative, and that report recognizes that even a few sites built to the proposed limits will erase the street's historic context and scale. And we appreciate the Cooper Square Committee, which supports and promotes affordable housing, points out the many loopholes that would allow developments with no affordable units. City planning has paid lip service to the historic character, but all those dozens of development sites have historic buildings on them. This plan would decimate this area and would set up the Landmarks Preservation Commission to face enormous development pressures. We urge you to say no to this proposal. Demand that the city study these reasonable alternatives and compromise. People stopped Robert Moses from destroying these neighborhoods years ago. We should not allow the de Blasio administration to destroy them now. Working together, we can find a better plan. Thank you. Michael Levine is next, and I believe there was somebody else, uh, Connor, but I lost the name. But Michael Levine, go ahead. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, uh, Madam Borough President, and thank you for all of your hard work with Manhattan Community Board 2. I'm a member of Manhattan Community Board 2, and I'm a member of the Soho Onoho Working Group, which has labored, as you know, very hard over the past two years to come to terms with this very complicated zoning proposal. I am going to address only one part of it because you've heard so much today about the issues involved in the proposed rezoning. I am speaking as the person who in 1971 was an employee of the Department of City Planning and wrote the M15A, M15B zoning districts had them mapped in Soho and later on in NoHo and wrote the uh, Youth Group 17D definition of joint living work quarters for artists. Our goal back in 1971 was very simple, and that was to allow a phenomenon that was occurring without government intervention, and that was the growth and development of an arts community downtown in what had been Hell's Hundred Acres. It was a simple process. We created a youth group that would allow joint living work orders for artists, and we let that community thrive and grow on its own for 50 years as a self-sufficient arts community. The heart of that arts community is now and has always been the artists who reside and work in Soho, NoHo. When we look at the proposed zoning change to increase the zoning density, to allow mixed use, we take a close look, and you've heard this from so many speakers, that it is a threat to the individual buildings that are currently occupied by the artists working and living in Soho. Yes, it is time to look at that zoning and figure out how to make it work better for the future as the demographic of the area changes. But to allow high, high density uh, rezoning that would bring in commercial uses as well as highly expensive uh, residential uses and perhaps other Dormitory uses that would not assist the artist okay. community is the Michael, wrong way to go. need to wrap go. up. Okay, so therefore I say that I have a problem with this. I urge that this uh, proposal be uh, denied because it in fact is a threat to the 50 year old artist community downtown that has worked so hard to perpetuate its own existence. Thank you, Michael, thank and you very much. Next is William Meehan. Hi, can you see and hear me? All set, go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, Borough President Brewer. Thank you for having me speak. Uh, my name is William Meehan, and I ask for you to support the Soho NoHo neighborhood plan. My office is in NoHo. I was one of those jobs added that was mentioned in the earlier city presentations. While I currently work from home, I wish that home could be in NoHo for me as well. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this is unattainable because the cheapest apartment on Street Easy in NoHo right now is listed for 6,000 a month. That means you need to make at least 240,000 a year in order to qualify for an apartment in NoHo. It is no coincidence that rents are so high in a neighborhood where new residential buildings are illegal. We are in a horrible housing crisis citywide. Hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers are either homeless, rent burdened, or living in overcrowded apartments. And we've seen that overcrowding can increase the spread of communicable disease. Opposing the neighborhood plan locks in this unjust status quo. We must make NoHo and SoHo with it 
welcoming to as many families, lower income and middle, middle income as possible. Therefore, it is important that this plan create the most possible number of affordable units. Due to a lack of public subsidy, we must be careful that the residential FAR is high enough and commercial FAR low enough that developers are incentivized to build as much housing as possible. I'm afraid that setting a 50% MIH requirement will only result in new commercial, which would be disastrous. I implore you to listen to DCP expertise on the matter. Beyond affordability, it is imperative for the climate crisis that we allow for more housing in Manhattan, where our residents have a fraction the carbon footprint of the suburbs or of Sunbelt cities. Thanks to a lack of parking mandates, new residents will not bring cars. And thanks to Soho's location between the two business districts, there's plenty of capacity to accommodate new residents on the subway. I also fully support the idea I proposed earlier of making Barcelona style super blocks in Soho for more pedestrian open space and reducing the impacts of traffic on the neighborhood. The consequences of doing nothing are dire, so please support the new plan. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, next is William Thomas and then Todd Fine. William Thomas, go ahead. William Thomas, you should be able to unmute. Hi there, can you hear me? I hear you, yes. Beautiful. Uh, hi, my name is Will Thomas. I'm the executive director of Open New York an independent grassroots pro-housing organization. Uh, we support the rezoning because allowing more homes here will help to alleviate New York's dire housing shortage. Uh, while we have concerns about the commercial densities allowed in the plan, as well as the community preference policy, I'm gonna allow my members to address those points. I just wanna take my time to address some arguments that have been made about rent-stabilized housing. Uh, beyond retirees whose real wealth is in property, not income, Rent-stabilized tenants are likely the only low-income people who live in Soho and NoHo. As such, I understand many may wish to adopt a first do-no-harm approach here, uh, especially the borough president, who I know de cares deeply about tenant protections. Uh, that said, it deserves to be underlined that the proposed rezoning in no way ought to threaten stabilized tenants. City analysis has shown that 96% of rent-stabilized buildings in the rezoning area would not be significantly underbuilt under the new zoning. Developers only generally consider a site to be developable if it's built to less than 50% of what zoning allows, as a slight increase in density is not worth the cost of demolition and reconstruction. But beyond that, tenants in all rent-stabilized buildings have rights, recently strengthened in 2019. Developers would not be able to demolish their buildings without a formal agreement with tenants. It is far likelier that owners of rent-stabilized buildings will decide to sell their air rights to neighboring development sites without residential tenants. Importantly, this isn't to say that a rent-stabilized building could never be demolished, but it's far less likely than any comparable low-rise site. Some have suggested that our new stronger rent laws make demolition more likely, as de redevelopment is supposedly now one of the few ways that building owners can remove buildings from rent regulation. But nothing in the 2019 rent laws remove the protections tenants already have or makes that process any easier. Uh, we would also support the addition of anti-harassment and anti-demolition provisions with regard to rent-stabilized housing. There's no reason that rent-stabilized tenants ought to fear mixed-income buildings replacing parking lots or single-story commercial buildings. And I would ask the borough president to disregard any arguments that suggest exactly that. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, have a great night. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Next is uh, Todd Fine. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Go ahead, Todd. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my name is Todd Fine. I'm the president of the Washington Street Advocacy Group, which does historic preservation work in the Little Syria neighborhood uh, south of the World Trade Center site. And at the start of this process, we were told that the Landmarks Preservation Commission would be a major participant in this process, that there would be guidance from them about potential impacts on historic, uh, uh, potential individual landmarks that weren't in the historic districts. Um, we were told that they would give guidance on the heights of the buildings and the street wall. And that we have never heard anything from the Landmarks Preservation Commission throughout the entire process. There was never a single session on historic preservation. Uh, we haven't we don't know what their office or their staff think about any of these details. And we're dealing here with, with the historic districts that are some of the most famous in the world that are considered some of the jewels of the world. And for the life of me, I can't understand how that, that 
fact can coexist with moving this process forward. And this is something that DCP keeps promising us over and over again, and they haven't met this obligation. So I just want to say on that basis alone, this process needs to be delayed. There needs to be serious historic preservation study and the, the environmental impact statement is not sufficient. Thank you. Thank you very much, Todd Pine. I'm just wanting from City Planning Commission, Eric, has LPC been involved in your discussions? Yes, we've had extensive discussions with the Landmarks Preservation Commission and you know, can, will continue to do so through this process. So, um, you know, it's, it's, they've been right there with us along the way as you know, we've discussed the, the details of this plan. Okay. All right. Thank you. I know that little Syria is also of concern to that community. So. Uh, Cordelia Pearson, and thank you, Cordelia, for many hours of your input also. Certainly, Gail. Can you hear me? Very well. Okay, good. Um, hello, I'm Cordelia Pearson. I'm the executive director of the NoHo Business Improvement District. Um, as a member of the Envision Advisory Group, I have been part of this process for, for the last almost three years, doesn't feel that rushed to me. Um, and I have attended most of the Zooms and all the meetings and listened to a lot of concerns about this plan. I have also heard some very good ideas for compromise to address some of those concerns. And I really, we really hope this zoning rezoning will go through. Everyone knows there are some serious problems with the current zoning that need to be addressed. We need zoning that actually matches current usage versus continuing the long, cumbersome, expensive variance process that's been going on now. From the beginning, the NoHo Business Improvement District's goals have been um, centered around retail use of our buildings. We are very happy to see that the plan um, makes retail as of right and ends the arbitrary 10,000 square foot limit to the size of retail that makes no sense to the size of our building floor plates. We have said since the beginning that retail is in a major flux and property owners and retail uses need the flexibility to use their spaces as the time and the trends lead them. COVID has only made this more true. The NOHO bid feels very strongly though that we want to preserve the historic character of our district and are concerned with the level of upzoning that's currently proposed. As you heard earlier, the Soho Broadway Initiative and Cooper Square Committee, and plus the NoHo Bowery stakeholders have come up with some really good alternative zoning scenarios. And we believe those will allow some more growth, but keep it in a less detrimental way to the district. And we hope city planning will look at those plans closely and alter their current proposal. And then I say, let's get this done and move forward. Thank you very much for everything, Cornelia. Next is Christi Christopher Sanders and then Victoria Hillstrom and then Anchor uh, Dalal. But go ahead, Christopher. All right, thank you everyone for hearing me out. Um, so today I would like to say that I want to speak in support of the Soho rezoning because I believe that the um, all of the arguments, the nitpicking around uh, the history, oh, you know, nitpicking this person and that person in the process is uh, not a way to go forward and provide affordable housing that people need right now. I see New York quickly becoming San Francisco, mm -hmm. lots of homeless people everywhere, um, living under the bridge, they serving you Starbucks coffee when they, and then they sleep out in their car. I don't want New York to be like that. I want it to be able to house everyone who wants to live here. Um, and, uh, and again, I support the Soho rezoning. Uh, so that way we can create more affordable housing for everyone in New York. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. I appreciate your time. And I know that we all want to make sure that people have housing. I totally agree. Um, Victoria Hillstrom and then Anchor uh, Dalal. Go ahead, Victoria. Hello. We can hear can you. We can hear can you, you hear me, Ms. Brewer? Yes, absolutely. Go Wonderful. Right ahead. Thank you so much for having me. Ms. Brewer, of course, you know, I think the world of you. And we 
uh, are looking to you for leadership to protect our community. The loft laws represent adaptive reuse and sustainability, where the artist repurposed old buildings to create a class of housing to live, work, and create. Ms. Brewer, many of these buildings in Tribeca, across the city, are not in IMD status. They are not in rent stabilization. And it is very dangerous uh, to the tenants that will be illegally removed, that it just is a very, very, very dangerous plan, demolition by construction. We su suffered it ourselves. We were nearly killed. And I would just say to you, Ms. Brewer, that in this moment that 831,000 people are facing eviction, that I would simply appeal to you that this is not the correct time for the city to be considering displacing its residents. And I sincerely hope that you will defer to CB2. They've done a brilliant job. And of course, uh, we adore you and have respected you for so many years. We would be so heartbroken to see Soho destroyed like this. It's a very dangerous plan to its residents. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Anchor uh, Dalal. Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you very much. You're very loud and clear. <laughs> Great, my name is Ankur Dawal. I'm a resident of Manhattan on the Upper West Side who'd like to offer testimony in favor of the pro proposed rezoning. I support this rezoning because it has the potential to create thousands of new homes, including hundreds of permanently affordable homes in a wealthy, a high opportunity set of neighborhoods. I think this rezoning represents an unparalleled opportunity to promote equity in our city. Other than Gowanus, Soho NoHo is the only rezoning the de Blasio administration has proposed for a wealthy white neighborhood. All of the de Blasio administration's past rezonings have focused on low-income neighborhoods of color, and it is unfair to ask these neighborhoods to take on the majority of the city's new construction. Places like Soho have to start doing their fair share, and to date, they haven't. I know the borough president expressed concern about the fact that only 25% of the new housing would be affordable, not 50% or more. But the status quo is 100% unaffordable for new residents. There are no income restricted affordable housing units in the Soho NoHo study area, none at all. And DCP found that only 3% of CB2's housing consists of government assisted affordable housing. And while I would welcome the city buying lots and building 100% affordable housing if budgets allow for it, saying no to this rezoning quite literally means telling 900 families to look for affordable housing elsewhere. This is personal to me. My family is an immigrant family, and we started our lives in America in New York City. When we first moved here, New York City had enough housing that even nearly penniless immigrants like my parents could find housing here. We have an obligation to build homes for the people who want to live here, particularly the people of my generation who are not fortunate enough to have the opportunity to buy a New York City home when they were available at middle class prices or do not have rent stabilized tenancies available at extremely low rates. As Democratic candidate for mayor Eric Adams recently wrote in response to the 2020 census, our city added 600,000 people in the last 10 years, but only 200,000 homes. All right, Anchor, thank you. Try to sum up, unless that was your sum up. That was my sum up. We need more housing. We're in a housing supply crisis. Okay. Please, I'm a huge friend, uh, Borough President Brewer. Please, please have more housing. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Christopher Good and then Flavin Judd. Christopher, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? We Very well, thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I heard from Carol Maloney and others saying that you know, nobody in the neighborhood supports this. Uh, I moved to Worcester Street in 1977. I bounced back and forth between the East Village because even then Soho wasn't affordable. Um, I now live on Grand Street by the Chinatown fraction of this project. Um, and I support this. I support this in a big way. Um, to quote Jared who spoke earlier, um, the neighborhood needs a little bit more diversity. Damn right it does. It's ridiculous how all we're doing is protecting the entrenched interests of landed gentry like me. People that have seen our property 
you know, values increase exponentially. This is not a dangerous thing, proposition. This is not a destructive one. This is not something that causes us at risk. This is very small. Nine sites on Broadway, 23 sites in the opportunity zones. This is minor. It's the least we can do. We should allow on those sites to build as much housing as possible. Yes, it'll, you know, stymie people's greed, but it'll make a better, more inclusive neighborhood, a neighborhood that I have lived in for 40 years. So I urge you to support this and to do more with it. And don't stop at like, maybe it's not 50% affordable, but it is a start. And it's a small start, but it's really meaningful. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up was, I disagree with Eric at one point, the relationship between commercial and residential is out of whack. The building on the corner of Bowery and 4th Street, 21 stories of commercial, they could stop right now, even post COVID and go residential. They're not. The money is in commercial. So we need to balance more towards residential. We need to do more to make the residential happen. Please support this. As a resident of Soho, I ask you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher Good. Um, Flavin Judd, and then Laura Sewell, and then Salvador Franchino. Flavin Judd, go ahead. Hi, the, uh, the plan put forward would turn Chinatown into Hudson Yards. And I don't think that that is um, uh, an indication of uh, an increase in, afford in affordable housing or an improvement in any way. Um, basically erasing a large chunk of Chinatown is a criminal act. Um, I mean, it would be good for fashion companies and developers and it's horrible for everybody else. Um, we need affordable, affordable housing and we need resident centric planning. And this is not that. People who live in New York, whether Soho, Noho or Chinatown need the respect that New York city planning currently reserves for multinational corporations and big box stores. Um, I grew up on the corner of Spring Street and Mercer in Soho. I can't afford to live there. Um, and if this plan passes, I still won't be able to afford to live there. Um, uh, our organization, the Judd Foundation, which was uh, uh, in the packet planning um, put together, does not support this proposal whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we do love your foundation, having been to the building itself. Thank you. Um, absolutely. Uh, Salvador Franchino. Next is. Um, it's Laurel. Okay, Laurel, Laura, Sewell. Sorry, go ahead. Hi, I'm Laura Sewell. I'm the director of the East Village Community Coalition. Uh, thank you for assembling the very informative panel. How the proposed plan would result in anything besides a wave of hyper gentrification defies logic. The plan at best mandates only 25% affordable housing and allows 75% luxury housing. The proposed plan has numerous loopholes with no public benefit of any kind required to develop commercial space or private institutional facilities. It would permit institutional expansion and crowd out local independent businesses by allowing more big box chain stores and eating and drinking establishments of unlimited size. We echo Cooper Square Committee's call for protections for tenants and against demolition. Show us where upzoning or the lack of landmark and other protections has created affordable housing. These policies result in demolitions and the loss of rent stabilized units, as we've seen again and again. These policies result in homogenization, the loss of retail diversity and independently owned small businesses, as we've seen again and again. Housing doesn't trickle down, it's bought and held as a commodity. Of course, some zoning changes may be needed, especially when it comes to commercial space and height restrictions on as of right development. Not only do the existing commercial spaces require a special permit, they are far too large to be within the reach of most independent small business owners. 
Allowing out of scale enlargements in and adjacent to these six historic districts sets a terrible precedent, not only for this neighborhood, but for historic districts citywide. Please reject this deeply flawed plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Next is uh, Salvador Franchino, and then we're going to ask Carter Booth. Sorry, um, R Rivero came before Salvatore. I promoted Rivero to panelists. Am I on? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm Juan Rivero speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. One of the many lies of this plan is that it will make these neighborhoods more diverse and affordable. It will actually make them wealthier and more expensive, and we've submitted solid documentation proving this. Even if one ignores the fact that the plan will result in the destruction of a considerable amount of affordable housing with lower income residents, and that it will actually create little of the promised affordable housing, New development under the plan that are 75 to 75% luxury and 25 to 30% affordable would still be populated by wealthier, by wealthier people than the current neighborhood and cost more to live in. First, as per the documentation we've provided, even the 25 to 30% in the affordable units will be wealthier and paying higher rents than the least wealthy 25 to 30% of current residents. The incomes required for those units are considerably higher than the average income of the 25 to 30% least well off current residents in the rezoning area. Second, New market rate construction in this neighborhood commands significantly higher prices than neighborhood housing overall. The 75 to 70 uh, percent of residents in market rate units in new developments can be expected to pay at least an average of 75, I'm oh, sorry, 17,000 a month per rent or 6.35 million per unit. This would make them considerably richer than the top 75 to 70 percent income earners currently in the neighborhood and be paying a far higher housing cost. A vote for this plan is a vote for a richer, more expensive, and less affordable neighborhood. We urge you to vote no. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, and we do love village preservation. We don't always agree, but I sure respect what you do. Uh, Salvador Franchino and then Carter Booth. Salvador, go ahead. Hi. So I went to NYU and unfortunately I couldn't stay there to live after graduation because the village and Soho is way too exp expensive of a neighborhood for uh, a new graduate to live. Um, so unfortunately, can't stay in Soho. I hope new residents can get to live there in the future uh, by the passing of this plan, which I support. And I did see that Village Preservation had released a document recently showing that 65% of residents in the rezoning neighborhood make over $97,000 per year. So this is a very wealthy neighborhood. And because it's so wealthy per Village Preservation's own data, I think it would be a great neighborhood to rezone since it'll bring hundreds of new homes and income-restricted apartments to the neighborhood and allow lower-income folks to live here too. And the higher FAR limits in this plan would allow more affordable units to be built regardless of the required MIH percentage, like I know Gail has a few concerns with, but some affordable units are better than zero, which is why I support this plan. And also keep in mind with the higher FAR limit, that the economies of scale would allow lower AMI bands if we have a taller building. So taller buildings mean more affordability and this rezoning can help us have some added density and some added affordability. So because of the dire need for housing, I do support this rezoning. And I know as Chris Good said, it is a little bit uh, too generous to commercial uses, <clears throat> pardon me. So I do hope that we can tweak this plan to make sure that it benefits residential construction as opposed to commercial office buildings because we are in a housing crisis and we absolutely need more housing, even if it means a few less office buildings. So let's pass this plan and get some housing built. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salvador. I don't think we need more commercial. We've got a lot of vacant space and that's absolutely true. Um, now we have um, uh, Carter Booth and then Joe Lo Lobenthal and then Lynn Ellsworth. Carter, go ahead. Madam President, as always, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm 
Carter Booth in the immediate past chair of Community Board 2 and was the only representative from CB2 on the Envision Soho NoHo Advisory Group, uh, which was convened by City Planning yourself and uh, Council Member Chen. I I'm going to start my testimony where I have during this entire uh, plan process, which is we're still in the middle of a pandemic. We're conducting this uh, meeting on Zoom again, a place where I, I think a lot of us didn't think we would be um, again. And uh, and we're hoping that New York, you know, people will come back to the city and re-engage with the city. Um, also, the mayor and DCP haven't listened to their own advisory group, local stakeholders, residents, or the community board in creating this plan. It's pretty clear. There have been no changes from the draft scope of work to the final scope of work. Uh, this was said before, but I'm re repeating it now. Um, it, it's it's hard to understand if if we're talking about a community participating. You know, everybody says, why can't we come together and find better ways of doing this? We've had the process, and nobody's done it. And you know, let's let's be real about that. Um, two areas that I want to hit on that people have talked on in a lot of areas. One, the arts fund, great novel concept, and it's. A, seems to be a pillar of DCP's plan, but it's just not realistic. And I'm not talking about the conversion fee, the conversion of manufacturing spaces to residential spaces while symbol to talk about, it's just simply not realistic for most buildings and units given the intense code compliance requirements. You know, where are the architects talking to this? You know, if you're gonna have a plan, it's gotta be real. The arts fund hasn't even been actually been studied. Um, and mind you, most buildings are rental units or co-ops, buildings where an individual owner couldn't even choose to make their own individual decision uh, based on the way co-ops are structured. Speaking as a resident of NoHo, I also want to say this plan is a travesty for the very limited true opportunities to meaningfully contribute to our housing crisis. You know, I'll say that again, is opportunity rich area. This, this plan has made it clear to so many that there is in fact a housing crisis, but we're not using our scarce resources in the best way possible. Passing this plan, it is going to result in in such a small area being actually being able to be meaningfully utilized for affordable housing and uh that's a travesty i know my time is running up usually in the past i've had more time so i'll leave it at, at that but we can do better and we can do it right and i think that we should all be taking steps to try and accomplish that goal thanks carter thank you very much do you have any suggestions for trying to remedy this plan in any way shape or form you know, I think the community board loaded question, but go ahead. Yeah, of course. I think the community board resolution, you know, we we've discussed this, you know, directly, Gail, and, and that's the issue. We're we have so few resources here to contribute as far as develop developable space that's real. You know, that doesn't include knocking down buildings. And this plan isn't doing enough with that scarce resource. And that's a huge issue to many people. I mean, the the brush that we've been painted with, nobody wants to have affordable housing here couldn't be further from the truth. Nobody wants more luxury housing. What we want is affordable housing. The percentages that are offered by MIH don't significantly contribute to that scarce resource that we have. And, um, and it's not just for Soho and Noho. This has to do with every other area of the city in the future going forward that you, know, you can define in any which way you want to, to do it better, so. I suggest coming back, reconvening, and, and having a real conversation about that. All right. I appreciate that. Joe Leventhal and then Lynn Ellsworth. Joe, go ahead. Joe, you're on. Yeah, there you go. OK. You're all set. Go ahead. Thanks. I have written remarks and the last thing I was going to say, I'm going to move up to the first thing I'm going to say, which is that I have lived in a rent stabilized apartment in the West Village almost my entire adult life. And I've seen the social, economic and cultural character of the West Village radically transformed and homogenized during these years. I shudder to now think of the way that the West Village will become the next target of upzoning since the Soho Noho Chinatown upzoning seems to give a template for um, it, radical incursions into landmark districts. Now, as a lifelong New York City resident, I have been disheartened and disgusted to see one neighborhood after another targeted by upzoning. The manifest result is overbuilt, financially inaccessible neighborhoods robbed of their unique character. That is the empirical reality. I have watched the Soho Noho Chinatown upzoning gambit play out for the last two and a half years. 
I've watched as residents are lied to, watch as the city attempts to impose a top-down agenda that benefits only developers and the international investment community or benefits them above all. Significantly, as you, of course we know, the local community board has resoundingly rejected the proposal. I am tired of false premises and empty promises. It is clear that upzoning for Soho no, Noho Chinatown is actually an end game. The Village Society for Historic Preservation's meticulous research has shown how the upzoning proposal will actually disincentivize affordable housing, which all of us want. Um, I also, the, uh, parenthetically, the entire metric of what the city calls affordable housing needs to be reconsidered. Rezoning and upzoning Soho Noho in Chinatown will seek totally inappropriate and oversized development and massive destruction of historic low rise 19th century buildings. My last point, it is clear that the new New York City normal is allowing rent regulated units to be demolished. This is a process okay. expedited and exacerbated by upzoning and the profit incentives. So you need to you need to wrap up. You need yeah. to wrap up. Thank you. I offered to developers. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank um, you very much, Lynn Ellsworth, and then our Zella Jones, and then Kathleen Wakeham. Lynn, you're muted. How's that now? Perfect, go ahead. Great, I'm Lynn Ellsworth, Chair of Human Scale NYC. Uh, the logic here is compelling. This rezoning will not deliver significant affordable housing. It'll exacerbate displacement effects, enrich the developers, and do irreparable harm to the historic districts. The alternative plan is infinitely better. Nobody I ask believes what the city is saying about this project. Many find the city's rhetoric offensive, even Orwellian, and plenty think MIH is a huge policy fail. There are different ways to figure out where to put new affordable housing. So it's a puzzle. Vicki Bean and Ed Glazer's published attempt to justify an attack on historic districts is some 10 years old now, and it's well known that it is theoretically and empirically wrong. So why does nobody in power care? Why are there so many stuck in the dying paradigm of trickle-down supply-side fundamentalism. From the outside, it looks vindictive, like someone is hell-bent on wrecking, wreaking some kind of revenge on historic district residents. So why would intelligent people act this way? I do not have the answer, but to me, it feels best explained by a hunting metaphor of hunting dogs who bay and run for their prey in obeyance to their master's bidding. The prey here is historic districts and the masters, well, I'm guessing that must be big real estate. Anthony Tong, a former LPC commissioner and author of Preserving the World's Great Cities, confessed in that book his growing realization that many of his decisions made in the name of compromise and expediency had done harm. He wrote, standing in the shadow of these compromised second-class buildings, I saw that I had been complicit in wounding the cityscape the echo of those words spoken in behalf of expediency had long ago faded. What remained was a permanently injured city. I can only hope that our leaders and technocrats learn from Mr. Tong's experience, grace, and honesty. Thank you. Jones. There she is. So you should be able to speak. You're muted though. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Very yes. well, thank you. Oh, perfect, thank you. I apologize, I'm in New Hampshire and we're still dealing with Henry and um, in and out internet. 
We're glad uh, that you got them and we did it. So <laughs> go right ahead. <laughs> Well, we're persevering, just like you, Gail. Um, yeah. uh, thank you so much for doing this. I, uh, it has been truly informative to hear all these voices, and, uh, and I respect everyone. Um, NoHo Bowery Stakeholders is um, a community benefit organization, and we, we have uh, uh, more than 350 members and we represent more than a million square feet of NoHo. So I please understand I'm speaking mostly for NoHo. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm not in conversation with SoHo and I am the president of the organization. Um, uh, we are... Uh, <sighs> We are concerned about three areas. One is that is the um, the area that deals with available sites, and for NoHo, um, the the NoHo East Opportunity Zone for affordable is is not even it's not realistic. It isn't going to produce any kind of affordable. Uh, we really need to look at no, mid NoHo along Lafayette Street, and the conditions there are are um, much different than what would happen at Cooper Square. Um, uh, and we we applaud the recommendations of <clears throat> the SoHo initiative in recognizing the, the restrictions that should possibly be applied for the Broadway corridor as regards uh, Lafayette Street north of Great Jones to Astor Place. Um, we are very concerned about the viability of, of, um, of affordable housing in, among uh, owners of properties that are leased and uh, we think that those are different criteria involved. <coughs> we would um, we would recommend that that um, that retail uh, have restrictions, and the, it's set into the um, the zoning uh, resolution uh, having to do with performance standards. And, um, and anybody who can't meet those performance standards should go into um, a, a, a special permit uh, situation. As regards so, the uh, trans- I'll give you a little bit extra time, but keep going. I'm giving you a little bit extra time, but go, go ahead. Thank you, Gail. As regards the transition from uh, JLWQA, um, uh, into something that is more legal, we highly recommend consideration of Alex Naratov's suggestion that everything be, um, that, that, that the initial effort be put into JLWQ. Uh, that means that, that those who want to transition are not, are not subject to C of O regulations. Uh, and and extra expense, we would recommend that the uh, that any kind of fee regarding transition be be um, lowered to possibly one percent, as as Steve Herrick at Cooper Square Committee has recommended. Um, we think that's much more equitable and much more fair to um, to either the the tenants who are not artists and the tenants who are artists, um, we are working really very diligently with the state to change the definition of what an artist might be. Um, we hope that can happen in the future. Um, I truly, I thank you for this whole forum. I thank you for the extra time. And um, well, I have luck. one question though, between you and Eric. In other words, Eric, Eric, you commented when I asked basically about the JW and the A earlier, that in a sense, what you're suggesting does the same thing. Um, Zella, do you think that, or can you go back and forth about that issue? Because I think it's different, but I may be wrong. Okay. And I do 
So you understand my question. I think you both Yes, did. I do. Yes, I do. Um, okay. uh, we, we have been very privileged to have a sincere conversations with DCP regarding these issues. And, and I'm, I'm not totally clear, um, but I think that essentially the, um, uh, the, the initial effort to, um, to provide a, an art fund for NoHo was in, was in good spirit. But I think that it needs to the the the, um, the compensation amount needs to be it needs really to be changed. I I wasn't clear with Eric's statement whether they DCP was particularly interested in changing that. I'm I'm really hopeful that it would. I'm a uh, hundred dollars per square foot is is a really it's a penalty on everybody whether they're an artist or they're a non-artist and. And I don't want penalties to to um, to stop this effort. Eric, do you want to respond? Is both to the obviously the funding issue, the at one percent versus the hundred dollars, I guess square foot, but also this issue of what exactly one is, you know, uh, transferring to without the A or your way in terms of the new resident of that unit. Go ahead, Eric. Sure, and hi Zella. Um, it, we have really appreciated, I think, the you know the constructive feedback and, and conversation we've had um, with you know with many people in this process, including including Zella. Um, the you know I, is the hundred percent set in stone? No, of course it's not. It's not set in stone. You know the number was informed by looking at um, the details of differences in, in sale prices, um, between JLWQA, um, and market rate luxury housing in Soho, NoHo. And that's what informed this price. And, you know, I think we've, we've heard, you know, from, from various people about whether that's the right price or not. And I think we're going to keep having that, that conversation as we move through this process. I do think it's important, you know, if we're talking about a per square foot or a percent sale costs that, you know, there is a scenario where people who want to continue to reside in their homes in Soho may want to legalize their own occupancy status in Soho NoHo without selling. And so in that case, a percent of a sale price may not be the right mechanism because a sale may not be necessary, uh, may, may not be necessarily what that person is looking for. So a per square foot kind of captures a sale of a property or somebody seeking to legalize their status. Um, just one more thing, if I may, uh, Gail, I, Zella, you know, did mention this concept of retail and um, quality of life issues and performance standards. And, you know, we really welcome that conversation. You know, I think we've said really from the beginning of public engagement back in, you know, 2019, and when we started, you know, speaking with you as well, Borough President, that addressing quality of life really has to go hand in hand with looking at the retail environment in Soho NoHo and particularly large retail, which is where the greater number of effects come from people who live nearby. Um, so, you know, we've been working together with Department of Transportation and Sanitation on strategies. Um, I think it's a very interesting idea, the notion of, um, you know, establishing, you know, some kinds of best practices that have to be incorporated. And, you know, so we really do look forward to continuing to discuss that. Thank you. Do you want to respond in any way or anybody else? Because we're, you know, if any suggestions are welcome. Janine, anybody at all? Um, I put in the chat what we include, CB2 included in our resolution. Um, we just highlighted in Hudson Square that was rezoned in 2013. Um, the city needed to mitigate the adverse impact on open space, and they created an active open space fund at $5 per square foot. Um, even in East Midtown, the rezoning um, estimates are that huge tax on the transfer of development rights is $61 per square foot. And again, these are um, mitigating adverse impacts. Um, as far as I can tell, this is not an adverse impact. And there also is not a fee on um, allowing commercial use as of right up zonings um, and so forth. So just please take a look at the CB2 resolutions for additional detail on our position. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, I Kathleen, am. Uh, Stella, uh, go uh, ahead. Yep. Yeah, uh, uh, this is a dialogue that is worth continuing. I appreciate Janine's thoughts on this. Um, um, 
I, I, I really continue to believe that the, that the opportunity for performance standards against retail use in this zoning resolution, in this special district mixed use zoning resolution should be considered. And I'm, and I'm open to all of the dialogue in that regard. Thank you very much, Ella. Kathleen Wakeham, go ahead. Thank you for waiting. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Kathleen Wakeham of the Knight Council on Housing. For 50 years, I have lived in the community as a rent stabilized tenant, and I'm very familiar with the needs of our community. Please vote no for the proposed upzoning of Soho NoHo. This upzoning is another giant giveaway to developers during de Blasio's lame duck here in office. Many of de Blasio donors lobbied relentlessly for this giveaway. Such development will cause demolition of more than 600 units of rent-regulated housing. These units are the homes of lower income and Asian American residents. Also, this rezoning will incentivize secondary displacement of thousands for tenants in the surrounding area who are Asian American and lower income residents. This plan includes office, hotel, and other commercial space, as well as luxury condo space and facility space for institutions like NYU, which are all exempt from affordable housing requirements. The pandemic has had a devastating impact on New Yorkers. Over a million New Yorkers have lost jobs and are facing eviction because of inability to pay rent. Over 70,000 New Yorkers are without stable homes. Our community does not need another upzoning for super luxury housing and commercial corridors. This proposed planning will provide will not provide or preserve needed true affordable housing. Rather, it will only increase the housing crisis of New York. The corporate chains in the commercial corridor would be the death knell of small businesses. During the pandemic, 50% of small businesses have closed. We yes, need to wrap up. You need to wrap up. We need rent, commercial rent control to save and revive small businesses. Please consider the proposals by Greenwich Village Historical Preservation and the Chinatown Working Group. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Trevor Stewart and then Ingrid Weingad and then Jesse uh, Kasowitz. Trevor, go ahead. Uh, my name is Trevor Stewart. I, I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. Um, in spite of the efforts by the mayor and other proponents of this upzoning plan to portray it as motivated by social justice and equity, let's be 100% clear about who the main beneficiaries would be. Big retail estate developers and big private institutions like NYU. So imagine you brought your own property in the rezoning area and suddenly you're able to build something two and a half times as large as the rules allowed when you bought it, and that you can suddenly include all sorts of highly profitable uses that were prohibited when you first bought your property, like luxury condos, giant big box international chain stores, and NYU dorms or classrooms. Well, if you're Edison Properties, which owns the two largest development sites in Soho and NoHo, and you've made multiple large donations to the mayor and his disgraced campaign for One New York, you don't have to imagine it. You're actually about to get it, and the multi-million dollar windfall that comes along with it if this plan is approved. Same if you're the Chu family, which owns some of the largest development sites in the rezoning area, and which has made campaign donations to key decision makers in this process, and is set to make a killing if this plan passes. This proposal isn't about benefiting New Yorkers or those in needs. It's about benefiting the wealthy and well-connected developers who've lobbied, donated, bought, and paid for it. Don't be part of it. Please vote no on this plan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for participating. Ingrid Weingen and then Jesse Kosowitz and then Dan Miller. Ingrid, go ahead. Yes. Um, hello, can you hear me? You're on, You're, we can hear you well. Okay, uh, can you see me? Uh, no, but we can hear you. Oh, damn. Um, John? We can hear you. Go ahead. We can hear you very well. Ingrid, can we hear you? Ingrid, you're muted. Oh, 
Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Ingrid. Go ahead. All right. Uh, I've been in Soho since 1969 and was instrumental in negotiating its existence as a young artist. This is for Gail Brewer. I understand that you cannot turn your back on a proposal for affordable housing even if it is confined to a few hundred affordable units in an inappropriate area where tall buildings will ravage an historic low-rise neighborhood. So I'm not even going to ask you to do that. But I will ask you to come down on the side of the ordinary people who live here and ask you to disapprove the proposed huge increase in the size of permitted retail. We are already one of the busiest and most famous shopping districts in the world. Our streets are already crowded with shoppers. We don't need larger stores to crowd them more. Nor do we need larger restaurants and nightclubs. Soho is already a, a restaurant destination for New York, New York, and has survived as such despite COVID. We don't need larger restaurants, but what we, we need even less are nightclubs that spill their customers out on the street in the small hours. However, we should permit stores to occupy first floors for retail as of right, but we need to do this without increasing the size of the retail spaces that developers can build and very large stores can occupy. So please, Gail Brewer, disavow this self-interested plan of the real estate industry to increase the permitted size of retail stores and restaurants in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And you're right on time, Ingrid. Thank you. Uh, Jesse uh, Kasowitz, and then Dan Miller, and then Marianne Arisman, and then Christopher Marte. Jesse, go ahead. Jesse, you have to unmute. Jesse, go ahead. I would suggest going to the next person. Because he can't, he's not unmuting. Okay. Uh, I would Dan do. Miller, go ahead. Dan Miller is next. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Uh, hi, hello. Dan Miller. Uh, Can you hi. hear me now? Hello? Jesse, go ahead. Okay, all right. So um, first, there's, there's no question that SOHO and NOHO could benefit from rezoning, but this is not the way to do it. Uh, there's a kind of arrogance on the part of the planners uh, that they listen to developers, they listen to Redney, and they have ignored the community. And when I say ignored the community, they, uh, they've ignored uh, Community Board 2, they've ignored Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, they've ignored the tenants organizations, tenants and neighbors, and they've ignored Chinatown. So there's a, a kind of a, uh, a skepticism uh, that we have about this plan. We are, we're skeptical about its diversity and we're, uh, we're skeptical that it will lead to affordable housing. So um, I'm part of the, uh, you know, uh, Washington Square Village Tenants Association. Everyone that I know in this community is really opposed to this plan. So we vote no. Thank you very much, Jesse. Next is Dan Miller, and then um, we'll go from there. I'm not sure who's Hi. Dan, go ahead. Hi, Dan, my name is Dan Miller. I am a market rate renter in New York City. Unfortunately, I can't afford to live in Soho uh, because 
as people have pointed out, the market rates there are incredibly high. And so I wanted to specifically ask you to approve the rezoning, not only because it would lead to more affordable housing, which is absolutely crucial and it's fantastic. I'm a huge supporter of subsidized affordable housing, but I also am a huge supporter of more market rate housing. The economic evidence on this is extremely clear and intuitive as well, that adding more market Dan, we just lost you. All right. I don't know what happened, but we maybe just go to the next person. Neighborhood is caused by a lack of supply in more expensive neighborhoods. The people who are gentrifying Crown Heights right now are people who would perhaps be willing to live in Park Slope or Prospect Heights instead. The people who are gentrifying uh, Harlem would probably like to live in Soho, but we can't because new apartments are banned there. They are straight up illegal. And that's just unacceptable. We can't, we can't run a city this way. With, m affordable housing is great. Affordable housing is fantastic. But we also need to increase the supply of market rate housing. And so I'd ask you to not just look at the no, that the percentage of affordable units, or even the number of affordable units, but all the overall number of homes that will be created under this rezoning, and to make sure that that number of overall homes is as high as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next is Marianne Reisman, and then Christopher Marte. Marianne? Yes. Go right ahead. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, um, I'm Marianne Arisman speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. One of the many lies upon which this rezoning plan is based is that it's either this or maintain the status quo, and opponents are unwilling to consider any changes. That is patently false. There is a community alternative plan endorsed by more than a dozen local groups that call for deeper and more broadly affordable housing. All have endorsed allowing residential development with real affordable housing requirements without the massive loopholes the city offers. All have endorsed allowing a wider range of retail uses without the giant big box chain stores and eating and drinking establishments of unlimited size that the city wants all have endorsed a path to legalization for non-artist residents without endangering the status and protection for artist residents the city plan contains. All are open to allowing more compatible uses as of right, like museums and nonprofit social services, but oppose allowances for NYU and private university expansion as the city proposes. And what we don't want, which the city is actually most interested in, is the massive proposed upzoning, which is what offers the incentives to displace long-term lower income tenants and demolish buildings with rent regulated affordable housing, as well as destroy historic buildings and create oversized new development. This is among the many reasons why we strongly urge you, Gail, to vote no and reject this dishonest and destructive plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne. Christopher Marte, and then Emily Hellstrom, and then Laura Tenenbaum, and David Herman. Christopher, go ahead. Thank you, Gail, for holding a hearing prior to issuing your recommendation regarding the proposed Soho No Ho Chinatown upzoning. My name is Christopher Marte, State Committee Member of the 65th Assembly District and Democratic nominee for the City Council in District 1, and I strongly urge you to reject this application. As Borough President, you will build a legacy based on preserving small businesses, voting against developer-driven land use proposals like the East Village, like the East Harlem rezoning plan, stopping super talls in Midtown, and standing up to the mayor. So why even consider a yes vote to this luxury developer-driven application when it's out of character and goes against your own track record. If you vote best, you'll be voting for high-rise office towers, big box mall stores, 
the first upzoning of a historic district since the Landmarks Preservation Committee was established in 1965, a first of its kind flip art tax to fund de Blasio's nonprofit donors, zoning loopholes that allow developers to avoid creating a single unit of affordable housing. Let me say that again, no affordable housing will be built under the current plan. In addition, what is shocking and disrespectful is the lack of outreach and representation of the Chinatown community. The Opportunity Zone is on the northern border of, China, of Canal Street, which by any map or historical context is considered Chinatown. This proposal will accelerate gentrification and displacement that ha has been happening for decades. This could be the death blow to this neighborhood after two tough years. First, when this office in the city approved the borough based jail, which is two blocks south of the zoning area, and more recently, the pandemic, which has closed small businesses and created massive food insecurity. Now the city wants to add additional pressure by allowing luxury commercial towers to this neighborhood. The Chinatown community needs a champion to stop or delay this rezoning. Please, borough president, would you be that champion that matches your track record, or would you continue to allow the mayor and city planning to destroy working class communities of color. A yes vote, would you do just that? Please vote and, and join former council members, Catherine Freed, Alan Gerson, every, ten every tenant right group and the community to say no to this proposal of displacement and destruction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. Uh, Emily Hellstrom and then Laura uh, Tenenbaum. Emily, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Borough President. My name is Emily Hellstrom and I have lived in Soho since 1996. I'm the co-op board president of the largest residential building on Broadway and I'm also the vice president of the Soho Broadway Initiative. Anyone who knows me realizes very quickly that I am not a cynical person, but I looked up cynical in the dictionary today just to make sure and it did give me pause. I participated in the admission process when we were told by you, Gail, yourself, that this was going to be a ground up rezoning. I joined the SBI planning committee and hammered out a carefully balanced agreement only to see it roundly ignored, sat through so many ULERP meetings and still the residents of Soho do not see our concerns addressed. Instead, we have a stark map that slices Soho in half. No, I no longer believe in the motivations behind this rezoning. How could I when the city is literally giving away FAR worth millions of dollars with loopholes for developers to exploit when two Howard that we've been screaming for for years was left out of the plan. Towers in Soho are a lie. As you well know, a 37 foot tower was approved by LPC in the historic district just a few blocks away. CB2 never gets housing. I remind you of St. John's Terminal, where just a few years ago, CB2 pushed hard for a deal that a third of which would be affordable, which then vanished, given to Google by elected officials who then turn around and call us racist and NIMBY. I sat at the Envision Soho meeting across from a representative from Vornado Realty Trust, and he said, why shouldn't building owners be allowed to build rooftop penthouses? One of the loopholes that residents have identified rooftop penthouses. Not one of my SBI commercial property owners is even a tiny bit upset about this rezoning. That should tell you something. The newly released census shows just how much displacement that Mayor de Blasio administration is responsible for. We have luxury development standing empty with rents going up. MIH is a failed experiment and communities all over the city are literally crying out against the developer elected official coziness. Please, Gail, I urge you to make a strong statement and say no to this rezoning. Say it no with conditions if you feel you must, but then let's go back to work on a rezoning that actually creates housing, actually helps small businesses, Emily, actually thank helps you. artists. Thank you. Do you, you. have some suggestions? Emily, I know to your credit, you've been in so many different meetings. Do you have any suggestions what could build housing in this neighborhood that is affordable? Because I know that you have put a lot of time into this. And I agree Absolutely. with you about two Howard Street. Absolutely. We've got two Howard. I think that, you know, we, during That's the one. pandemic, to Howard, certainly many people during the pandemic looked out and saw office buildings that were sitting vacant for literally I, I've looked I look out on an office, an entire floor on Broadway that has been sitting vacant for 10 years. 
the, there are ways to make housing within historic districts that do not need to go up, 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 up. Also, there was an opportunity to, for hotels that we could have had. There are many, many hotels in Soho. A hotel in the Tribeca that just went for sale. And yet, you know, we know that, that hedge funds come in and they swoop down and they buy these things up. The city should be proactive in other ways than just allowing um, market rate luxury housing to come in, but we just aren't taking the public um, dollars that we have and putting them. We are constantly relying on a public-private partnership and what loses the public. So I just urge us to think outside the box. We've got a, um, apartment, you know, hotels, we've got co um, commercial property, office space that could go, and we've got government owned land. So those are three suggestions, and there are more. Okay. But we, we have right, not I been listening. Thank you very much. Lana, Laura, I'm sorry, Laura Tenenbaum, and then David Herman. Hi, I'm, I'm here. Um, I speak on behalf of myself and our artist JLWQA Cooperative, which has authorized me to explain why we urge you to reject in its entirety the proposed rezoning of Soho, NoHo, and parts of Chinatown. We fully support the Community Board 2 resolution. It accurately and clearly analyzes in details the plan's fundamental and unfixable flaws. As an artist's co-op with a 50-year stake in this community, we urge that any rezoning's goal includes keeping Soho as a vibrant, popular, active, inhabited arts community, not a commercial center with big box stores, clubs, and the interactive retail entertainment venues city planning gleefully anticipates. It is painful and wrong for Soho and NoHo's older artist residents to be called legacies and none of us important enough for city planning to quantify. The picture DC paint paints of us is not the truth of our community. Our community's uniqueness is that it has an artistic core, that its historic cast iron buildings resonate with the past and have been repurposed for the future, that an easily accessible part of New York that looks like no place else in the world and is thus a draw for visitors from every part of the globe. Will people come here when it looks like Midtown South? To make the changes Soho needs takes creative planning for the future. Affordable housing can be part of our community without commercial towers. The severely flawed rezoning doesn't offer green open space, nor does it address global warming at all. It refuses to look at displacement, which studies show is a real threat in any upzoning. Hundreds of us had trust- Or you need to wrap up, you need to wrap up, go ahead. Okay, I'm just going to say, that this plan was an ugly surprise for us after the Envision hearings, a slap in the face. Even worse is the message about democratic process when it is being rammed through during a pandemic. Please don't discard us, do the right Thank thing you. and push for a do-over. Thank you. Thank you. David Herman and then Catherine Schoonover, Pete uh, Davies and then Marie Thomas. Go ahead, David. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm David Herman, speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. Uh, one of the many, many deeply dishonest elements of this plan is a last minute addition of an allowance for NYU or any private university to expand anywhere in the rezoning area, ending current restrictions. We all know NYU has been eyeing Soho and NoHo for years, but in 2012, when the city council approved the NYU expansion plan, we were assured that this meant no further expansion elsewhere by the university would be allowed. This plan eviscerates the problem, that promise. Any insult to injury, the rezoning would exempt NYU from the affordable housing requirements that are the supposed basis for this rezoning plan and add another allowable use that would, uh, that would compete and interfere with the potential production of affordable housing. From the early stages of, stages of this process, neighbors and this organization made clear that we opposed any change in regulations that NYU or other private universities expand here and we were told by sponsors of this process, this was not what they had in mind. Like so much about this process, that turned out to be a lie. There was absolutely no reason to change the zoning to grant one of the richest private universities in the world a free hand to expand here, especially when it directly undercuts what you claim is the main reason for this rezoning, the creation of affordable housing. 
Borough President Brewer, you, please, you must reject this plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, David Herman. Uh, Catherine Schoonover and then Pete Davies. Catherine, go ahead. Hi, I'm Catherine Schoonover, also speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. Another critical reason why this plan should be sent back to the drawing board is because almost everyone responsible for it will be out of office once it's implemented and therefore can't be held accountable for whether or not it actually fulfills its highly questionable promises about affordable housing. Let's be clear, with every rezoning the city has implemented, they have been wildly off whether uh, sorry, in their projections about what its effects would be, including regarding affordable housing, whether downtown Brooklyn or East Midtown, West Chelsea or East New York. The city has always failed to paint an even vaguely accurate picture of what their rezonings would do. And if critics are correct, and this plan will fail to produce promised affordable housing, and will instead displace low-income residents and destroy affordable housing, those responsible need to be held to account. More importantly, those making this decision need to know that they can and will be held to account and face the voters for what they have done to help make for a better outcome. They need to know that they can't just promise one thing with this plan and then be immune to accountability because they're immediately term limited out of office like the mayor. This should be left to the new city council member for the district and the new mayor to decide and to be around to be held accountable for their decision. For this and so many other reasons, we urge you to vote no. Thank you very much, Catherine. Pete Davies and then uh, Madam Thomas and say hello to your whole family for me. Pete Davis, Davies, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, let's be clear, DCP's proposed FAR increase within the Soho NoHo's rezoning area threatens rent-regulated residents all across the neighborhoods, including Chinatown, and therefore the city's rushed and reckless plan to upzone should not be allowed to stand. Any granting of FAR above the current five FAR incentivizes and encourages building owners to pursue new vertical enlargements and demolition throughout the neighborhoods. Thereby, this new DCP FAR allowance puts a target on renter-occupied buildings, including nearly 70 IMD buildings with over 370 IMD units now in the process of the loft board, all moving towards rent stabilization, located across Soho, Noho, and in Chinatown. The city's plan is not just. The plan presented is not acceptable or workable. As is known and has been stated by yourself, DCP and others, there are no laws protecting tenants against eviction by demolition or eviction by construction. This is highlighted in the tenants pack testimony that has been presented to you in the six points that they demand be included protections against demolition and protections for tenants. The current F5 FAR has been controlling for these buildings for nearly 50 years. It's the maximum bulk allowance the rent regulated tenants and in other units throughout the districts have been living with. The DCP proposal for changing the, F the FAR by upzoning brings with it the risk and the likelihood that construction and demolition will lead to the displacement of current regulated tenants we ask you to reject this plan, protect tenants. Thank you very much, Gail. Thank you very much, Pete. Uh, Enrique Thomas, Richard Corman, Catherine Freed, and Zachary Roberts. Go ahead, Madam Thomas. Hi, can you hear me? Very well. Perfect. How are um, the my kids? name's Enrique. <laughs> How are my the kids? Marika That's Thomas. what I want to know. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm Marika Thomas. I'm a Manhattan resident. Um, I'm also a teacher with the New York City DOE. I'll be starting my 10th year um, this September. Um, I'm speaking in support of the rezoning plan. Um, this year, especially teaching remotely, I've seen like a really good look into a lot of my students' homes directly. Um, and it's really clear to me 
how how badly the city has a crisis of housing. Um, you know, I've seen students who are living, you know, with two adults and three children living together in a one bedroom apartment. Um, and and just any plan that can help increase the amount of housing that's available, and especially the amount of affordable housing that's available, um, is something that I really strongly support. Um, and especially a plan that will build more housing in a really transit rich, job rich, and just really safe neighborhood um, is something that I, that I support as well. Um, I think you know folks have brought up that that um, it's uh, you know it would be wonderful to have um, 100 percent or even 50 percent affordable housing. I think even 25 percent affordable housing is better than than nothing. Um, I think any buildings that we can build that are going to add new housing and going to add some new affordable housing um, is something that I really strongly support. So, so I would um, uh, ask you to, to support the plan. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Richard Corman and then Catherine Freed. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam uh, Burr, President, for this. My name is Richard Corman, President of Downtown Independent Democrats. We strongly urge you to reject this plan. As you've heard from so many, this rezoning plan is deeply flawed. It fails to meet its essential objectives, most particularly its stated affordable housing goals. Yes, people want affordable housing, but this plan will not achieve it. And it will displace and impact the lives of existing rent protected low income residents in Soho, NoHo and neighboring communities, especially Chinatown. In December, we, Downtown Independent Democrats, issued a resolution calling for the city to pause and revise its plan for Soho NoHo. We stated that the, the proposed plan incentivizes office development and big box retail instead of adaptive reuse, new affordable housing, and the preservation of the significant stock of affordable housing already in place. We urge the city to develop a plan that, uh, that among other things, guarantees greater opportunities for affordable housing, addresses displacement, allows office to residential conversion and does not incentivize office and dormitory over residential use or big box retail over small business. We ask that the, that the, that, uh, this, the city defines clear mechanisms, non-punitive mechanisms to legalize existing residential occupancies and, and that a new plan could maintain the character and integrity of the impacted historic district and the creative foundation of the area, very important city drivers. The final scope of work remains virtually unchanged from the original scope of work. It ignored the, our comments and many others, including those from Community Board 2, so many housing and community activists, and even comments from your Vision Soho NoHo report. For these reasons, and the deep flaws in the plan and the likely damage it will inflict on current, particularly low-income and rent-protected residents, many of whom are seniors aging in place and for its likely failure to any, add any material amount of affordable housing, this plan must be rejected. We could not be more supportive of the great need for Richard, affordable you need housing. To, you need to wrap up. You need to I'm wrap just up. About, just about done. Uh, okay. we, we support affordable housing for sure. For example, we're working to ensure 100% affordable housing in the new Five World Trade Center site. And we would support a Soho NOAA rezoning plan that does achieve affordable housing, but without the irreversible damage that this flawed plan will inflict. Thank, right, thank you. you. Catherine Freed, Zachary Roberts, Thomasine Dolan, and Carl Dawson. Catherine, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Borough President, for having these hearings. Um, as you, a lot of people know, I've been involved. I moved into Soho in 1969. I think I've been involved in most of the fights involving Soho and protecting Soho. Soho is a totally unique community with the cast iron buildings. It's the uh, Soho cast iron district for a reason, and it's on the National Historic Registry. These buildings only exist a few in, in Chicago and some in Paris, but the rest of them, all the uh, cast iron buildings are in Soho. And it's not just about the buildings, it's about the community where artists moved into vacant buildings prior to this time that were unused. It's one of the, it's nationally and internationally recognized as one of the most successful repurposing or reimagining, if you will, of basically unused buildings when the technology shifted away from um, light manufacturing, these buildings sat vacant and it was individual artists, mostly artists who came into the area with their own funds who, who um, renovated these buildings and cr helped create an artist community. 
And I agree with what has been said about um, expanding what an artist is and making it easier to recognize some of the new tenants that moved in, but to preserve the basic um, art community that it was always supposed to be and that has been so immensely successful. Uh, this, this proposal, the up zones, uh, first, let me just say it is an absolute myth to say that that one, uh, you, excuse me, one unit of affordable housing is going to be created. Because if you look at the disincentives to create affordable housing and to do to create large big box retail, or as someone has said, um, NYU dormitories, things that will not create one unit of affordable housing. But in addition to that, it will also displace a lot of rent stabilized, low income, uh, tenants, also a lot of diversity that does exist in the area will be driven out of the area by this proposal. Catherine, you need to wrap up. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll try and, you know, I mean, look, take a look at what Community Board 2 has said or what Cooper Union has said. Give, there's no reason to rush this through. Okay. The people who are going to be living there are going to be there for a long time, hopefully. Right. And this has been rushed through. The fact that only one person from Chinatown got to testify tells you that they have not done an outreach. They haven't done an outreach to Soho Noho, and they certainly haven't done an outreach to Chinatown. Um, and just a last thing I would recommend again, whatever happens, keep the smaller, keep the 10,000 square foot on commercial use and the 5,000 square foot limitations on, uh, live, on uh, dining and bars. And right, thank you. I ask that you reject this. We can do it better. There should be more time. Thank you very much. Zachary Roberts, Thomasine Dolan, Carl Dawson. Zachary, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Manhattan and a resident of NoHo, and I'm also a recent homeowner in NoHo. So this is something that affects me personally. And if I were looking after my own interests, I would say we should oppose this plan because my interest would be to have no new housing come in the neighborhood to drive my asset price up. However, New York has a desperate shortage of housing. We saw the evidence in the DCP at the beginning that we've had a massive increase in jobs over the past 50 years without a commensurate increase in housing. It's simple supply and demand. I mean, when you look at neighborhoods that have gentrified in the past 15 years, which there are many of, Williamsburg, Gowanus is one, I mean, many neighborhoods in Brooklyn and downtown Manhattan, the people who move there aren't going to stop moving there if we don't build new housing. They're going to move there and they're going to bid up the existing housing. That is how it happened. We desperately need more units of all types. I wish there were more affordable in this plan. I think we all do, but we don't want to let the perfect become the enemy of the good. We need more housing, period. It's been 50 years since most of this neighborhood has been rezoned. I keep hearing the calls for a better plan and that will just take time and time and time, but the housing crisis in New York is not going away. So I, I urge you to support this plan and I hope it goes through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zachary. Thomasine Dolan, uh, Carl Dawson, and Kate McClintock. Hi, my name is Thomasine Dolan and I'm a Soho resident. I've lived here for uh, over 20 years. And I, I first, I just wanted to start by saying I echo uh, what CB2 CB22 President Janine Kiley, Deborah Glick, Caroline Maloney, and Emily Hellstrom all had to say, I, I definitely can't say any of it any better than them or more forcefully than them. And we're all in agreement that affordable housing is important. It's important throughout the city and it should be sprinkled throughout the city as I heard one of the other panelists say. Um, right now, Soho is, is like under siege with, uh, because it's been a destination neighborhood for a while now. The traffic is outrageous. The litter is outrageous. There's no sanitation pickup. Anyway, those are complaints. I didn't really call about that. I, I really wanted to call in to say that I do not support the plan, but I do support affordable housing. Uh, the, the things that have been added on to this really have nothing to do with affordable housing. It has everything to do with development and, uh, and retail. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Carl Dawson, Kate McClintock, and Joshua Davitt. I'll go ahead, Madam Dawson. Sorry, can you hear me? There we go. Yeah, so, now we can hear you. Great. I am speaking as a Soho resident of almost 20 years. Uh, I am Mexican-American. I was born in Mexico. I came here 
um, quite a bit before, uh, when I was you know, younger, but, uh, and I married a man who is an artist and we bought a commercial loft and we converted it through the actual city process to live work. Um, this entire process has been so disillusioning. I, I wanna start with sort of the five Ds that I think I give this overall zoning process. First, it doesn't acknowledge displacement and affordable housing um, appropriately. It does not accurately represent diversity or even define it uh, fairly. It is definitely discriminatory, specifically towards artists, which just boggles my mind. Uh, it's destroying a historic district, which just calls to mind all those that did not appreciate Penn Station until it was gone. And it's deeply flawed slash disingenuous, depending on how you pick it. Now, I'd start on the displacement part. The city has a history since this area was called Hell's Hundred Acres. It was called that because it was a fill-in for Collect Pond. It was very diverse. It actually was full of brothels and sort of a very broad mix of society. And then you had Robert Moses. And each step of the way that the city has gone through city planning to allegedly improve Soho, what it has done is not only gentrify and reduce the diversity, but it also has called all, caused all these schizophrenic areas of zoning. You know, we go back to uh, where do we even start to fix the zone? I don't think any think that we have, um, you know, that we don't need to address some of the zoning issues. But the reason the retail spots are empty is not because of zoning. Please call out who didn't get a special permit. It's because of what's going on with COVID. It's because of the uncertain, you know, issues around retail. For anyone to raise that it's actually zoning that's the issue about our retail spaces on the first floor is completely disingenuous or naive. I don't know. On the diversity side. Uh, my entire co-op is from all over the world, from every race, from every other economic background. I would expand that to the block, the community. It is just not accurate. Maybe the 2010 census, people didn't do a good job of turning it in. I don't know. But actually take the facts. What we share in common is that we have creative solutions. We're willing to work on ones and not just the community plan. Well, I'd you say need to wrap up. You need what to wrap bothers up. me the most is the areas like 21 Spring Street that is affordable housing. And the entire area from West Broadway to 6th Avenue, from Houston all the way to Canal, that's where the affordable housing is. It's always been there. It has a legacy of being the immigrant community areas from the Italians and the Portuguese. And it's not even in the area of study. So work with us to do, there are empty buildings and lots that have been okay. you know, basically abandoned for many years. It's just well, truly, to, you know, okay, my last thing. This overall is, you know, makes me think of Mayor Bloomberg. I'm a New Yorker and I know a con when I see one. This is totally a wrong plan to endorse. Thank you very much. Kate McClintock, Joshua Davids, and then Sam Moskowitz. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Kate McClintock speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. From the beginning, we were told that this process would look to ways to preserve and reinforce the artistic character of Soho and NoHo. In fact, this plan seems designed to do everything it can to destroy that character. The allowance for big box chain stores and eating and drinking establishments of unlimited size will make it incredibly difficult for any art gallery or arts or design related business to continue on in any ground floor space unless they're lucky enough to own it. The upzoning will create huge financial incentives for landlords to try to push out remaining artists living in rent regulated and loft law units so they can gut or demolish their buildings. The allowance for vastly larger office buildings and hotels will further dilute and diminish the artistic character of these neighborhoods. The new allowance for as of right luxury condos and rentals along with NYU dorms and other private university facilities will further supplant and dislodge any arts related uses in the neighborhood. And the new rules more or less amount to, for all intents and purposes, a phasing out of the artist and residence regulations, which helped make these neighborhoods such vital centers of artistic activity. This is one of many ways in which we were lied to by the sponsors of this process and that the plan itself is a lie. We therefore urge you to reject and repudiate this plan. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Joshua David, Davids, I'm sorry, Sam Moskowitz, Anita Isola, and Julie Finch. Joshua, go ahead. Joshua, go ahead. Okay, 
Joshua, you're muted. Should I go to the next one person? I'll, I'll go to Sam yes. Moskowitz, Moskowitz and come back to Joshua. Sam, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? I am here. All right, Joshua, go ahead. You've got to unmute yourself. Go ahead. No, this is Sam. Hello? Oh, it's Sam. Okay, Sam, go ahead. How are you? Right. So my name is Sam Moskowitz. I'm Village, uh, speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. And we mm -hmm. strongly urge you to reject the mayor's proposed SOHO NOHO rezoning plan. It's full of lies, distortions, and misrepresentations about the affected neighborhoods and what it would do. It's also full of blatant giveaways to the mayor's developer donor friends who've lobbied for it, masquerading as some sort of social justice and affordable housing plan. That's why housing and tenant groups like the Met Council on Housing and Tenants PAC strongly oppose it. That's why 10,000 New Yorkers through our website alone have written you, urging you to reject it. How exactly can one justify supporting a plan that would allow the construction of over 10 million square feet of space in the small area? but only accounts for about a third of it being built. How can you justify supporting a plan which gives big box chain retail stores of unlimited size, NYU dorms, huge office towers and hotels, and even 100% luxury condos and rentals, as long as they don't exceed 25,000 square feet per zoning lot? How can one justify supporting a plan which would likely create little or no affordable housing due to multiple loopholes, but would potentially displace hundreds of lower income tenants, disproportionately seniors, artists, and Asian Americans, and permanently destroy their rent regulated affordable housing? How can one justify supporting and allowing development up to two and a half times the size currently allowed here? For the sake of Soho, NoHo, Chinatown, and all of New York City, we urge you to reject this plan. Thank you and have a good night. Sam Moskowitz, thank you very much. Joshua, are you there? Okay, Anita, it's Ola, go ahead, Anita. Anita, are you there? Yes, yes I'm okay, here, go, can you hear me? Go right ahead, yeah, okay. we can, thank you very much. Uh, I'm also speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. Uh, one of the many unconscionable elements of this rezoning plan is the allowance for these big box change retails and eating and drinking establishments of unlimited size throughout the entire rezoning area. Who thinks Soho, Noho or Chinatown need any more of these? What social justice or housing equity agenda does this plan fulfill? What is the justification for allowing destination mega retail of unlimited size on narrow side streets like Green, Worcester, Bleecker, or Baxter Street. Such an allowance will only make it impossible for anything other than huge uh, chain stores and giant restaurants and bars to survive here. And it will harm smaller, locally focused independent businesses. Who does this help other than big developers and big landlords who've been lobbying for this plan? Large chains, take revenue out of our city and turn our neighborhoods into giant outdoor malls indistinguishable from anywhere else. Oversized chain stores, bars, and restaurants make life difficult for, resi for uh, residential neighbors as well. And they don't tend to support healthy, successful in retail environments. As we as we see higher retail vacancies in area, areas with larger numbers of chains than those with independent businesses. Residents agree that allowance for a greater range of uh, as of right retail uses makes sense, but with reasonable size limits like five to 10,000 square feet. This proposal is nothing more than an unmitigated giveaway to powerful corporate interest. Anita, thank you. You need to wrap up. Thank you very much. Uh, Julie Finch, 
Austin Sellison, Michael McKee, and Sonny Ng. Julie, go ahead. Hello. Um, I was the chair of Artists Against the Expressway in 1969 when we were living in Soho at the corner of Spring and Mercer. And I am really shocked by this. I've been to a couple of public hearings and the plan has never changed. Um, I think there should be no selling of air rights. The limit of zoning should be 125 feet. There should be no cap on 5,000 square feet for small restaurants and drinking establishments. And um, without subsidies, there will be hardly any affordable housing actually built. No tall buildings in the cast iron historic district. Margot Gale would be turning over in her grave. And arts, the arts fee is a penalty per square foot and that's vengeful. I'm shocked to see that. And I, I like SOHO, the CB2 alternative plan and village preservations plan. And I agree with Catherine of the Met, of the Met Council on housing. Rebney, New York, stay away from historic districts and Chinatown. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Austin Celestin, and then Michael McKee, and then Sunny Ng. Austin, go ahead. I will come back to, to Joshua Davis if you're still there, but Austin, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Okay. Um, good evening. My name is Austin Sullivan. I am a sophomore at NYU studying urban design, and I'm actually a resident of your future council district, CB6, CD6. I'm sure we all saw the census results from earlier this month, 629,000 new residents in the past 10 years, something certainly worth celebrating. But in that same time, we've only built less than 200,000 units of housing. If we were to match the new production of housing to the population growth of the past decade, we would have to go back more than 40 years to match it. Our housing production has been pathetic to say the least and our archaic and stifling zoning code, which a larger, with a larger emphasis on character rather than affordability is the biggest factor, both in Soho and across the city. We built more housing in the 1920s alone than in the past 50 years and housing production in, during the great depression exceeded that of each of the last five decades. This is a supply crisis through and through and the plan to add density is a much needed plan and something that is long overdue in this neighborhood. I think there are legitimate concerns to address. For one, I think everyone here, regardless of where they stand, can agree that, co that the commercial aspect is too large and too enticing and should be cut significantly, if not entirely eliminated. The concerns about affordability and displacement are also worth addressing. But those concerns only bolster the need for this plan or really even a larger increase in housing density. I'm surprised Ms. Katz didn't mention Jersey City in her demonstration because they demonstrate why large plans like this one are so crucial. Jersey City has approved massive projects that make this one look like child's play. And they've kept up with an increase of demand in housing all across the river and the rents are significantly lower than ours. Several cities in Texas also produce far more housing per capita than we do and do a much better job with similar results. Even here, we could point to how increased supply can take down rent. The city had a slight decrease in rents in 2018 thanks to a spike in new units. The correct response to a legitimate concern of affordability is to add more bulk to this plan, not less, say 4,000 total units with 12 or 1,400 affordable units. At some point, functionality has to supersede aesthetics, and this should be a model for Austin, future. Austin, you need to wrap up. You need to wrap yes, up. Last sentence. This should be the start of a path to rezone other affluent, transit-rich, walkable neighborhoods like your past and future district of the Upper West Side, which shares many characteristics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael McKee. Uh, Sunny Ng, and then Gene Standish. Michael, go ahead. Thank Good you for evening. waiting, sir. Thank you for yeah, waiting. Yeah, it's okay. Good evening, Gail, and uh, to the panelists. Uh, this has been very interesting and uh, also very long. I'm not going to read my written statement, which I sent in this afternoon. Obviously, I couldn't do that in two minutes, but I want to focus on the issue of demolition, uh, which is something I know uh, a bit about. Um, the emphasis by the City Planning Commission on tenant protections and the rent laws is misplaced because the one area, the one loophole that the legislature did not close in 2019, when they essentially closed all of the loopholes that we've suffered with for years and that has caused us to lose hundreds of thousands of units of affordable housing, 
uh, none of which was re-regulated, I should point out, by the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019. The one area that they left available to developers is demolition. Now, demolition is not an easy thing for a developer or a landlord to accomplish, and it is fairly rare. But if you create an incentive, uh, the, the kind of incentive that this plan would uh, place on these buildings, I think you're going to see a, a tremendous upsurge in attempts at demolition. Um, and that's something that I think really needs to be addressed, not just with rent controlled and rent stabilized housing, but with inter interim multiple dwelling units uh, under the loft law, as Peter Davis, Davis testified about. Um, I've made some specific proposals in my written testimony. Uh, I, I note that Steve Herrick uh, talked about anti-harassment uh, provisions that could be put into the plan. There would be nothing wrong with that, but I do wish I could say that I thought that would be adequate to protect tenants. I don't think it would. You're talking about one of the hottest real estate markets in the, in the world, where the incentive for getting rid of people and tearing these buildings down and building something higher uh, is going to be irresistible. Developers will be licking their lips. So I, I urge you to reject the plan. I certainly urge you that if the plan is going to go forward, that you pay attention to this issue and make sure that tenants in regulated housing and affordable housing um, are protected. Just finally, I want to say that I just don't think this it's worth this kind of disruption and destruction that this plan would visit on these two neighborhoods to create what the city says will be 900 affordable units, especially when, as we have seen, the affordable units are not really affordable. So I'm urging you to reject the plan, uh, and I'm urging that if the plan does go through, uh, that protections for uh, these buildings and for the tenants living in them by demapping them, not allowing any up zoning, no increase of FAR for those addresses. That should, and that would make for a complicated map, but that's the only way you would be able to protect these, these buildings and these tenants. Thank you very much. Michael, thank you. One question I have is even, I think what you're saying is even what I call the uh, Clinton uh, plan, which we know really well, where housing conservation coordinators and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, are, you're saying even that, which has, you know, the demolition provisions, can't do it, blah, blah, blah. Even that you're thinking wouldn't be sufficient. I think that's what Steve was talking about. I, I, I don't think it would be enough. Okay. Um, That's what you I know, mean. I have I have great respect for Steve Herrick, and I thought his testimony was was superb. But I really am very worried about uh, the loss of this housing and the threat to the people living in it. These are long. I know many of these people. Many of them are people I've known for thirty or forty years uh, yeah. and have worked with. And I, I think to allow long term residents to be displaced some of the housing that would be replacing it might be affordable. Even if it's rent stabilized, it's going to be much higher rents than the tenants are now paying under rent stabilization. We know that. It, it would just be unconscionable. Okay, that's helpful. Joshua I mean, Davis. You want to know what I think you should really do? Restrict the upzoning, increase the FAR for all the parking lots, uh, the commercial right. garages, and one and two family commercial buildings and don't upzone any other part of the neighborhood. And let's get our hands on uh, 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 the houses. building that everyone's talking about that is owned by the federal government. Right, two houses. All right, thank you. Thank Joshua you. Davis. Joshua, are you there? All right. Sonny, go ahead. Sorry to keep you waiting. We're no trying worries. to find this other. Um, hi, um, good evening, everyone. My name is Sonny. Um, I live in Brooklyn and have been working in Soho for the last five years. Uh, I support the Soho and NoHo rezoning plan. The city has a housing crisis, and if you rent, you know that. It's expensive and difficult to find a place to move. And if you're someone who rents in the city, this cycle happens to you about every couple of years. The Soho NoHo rezoning provides an opportunity to create more housing stock in a white, affluent neighborhood that has excellent connections for once. It can provide both affordable housing as well as market rate housing. And this will help relieve pressure for gentrifying poorer neighborhoods like Harlem, Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights, Sunset Park, and Chinatown. Speaking of Chinatown, it has been quite disgusting how opponents of this plan, including CB2, 
with their completely disingenuous resolution have constantly been using Asian Americans as pawns for cover. I ask you to stop. If you want to fight the upzoning because you want to enrich white homeowners like yourselves with higher property values, then at least have the decency to be honest about it. Don't drag us into it. Don't pretend you care about diversity. Don't act like you've ever crossed Broadway. Don't use misleading numbers like displacements of Asian Americans in the past with the status quo to argue against change. That doesn't even make any sense. You're no better than white conservatives that use Asian Americans to fight against affirmative action in court. If you really care about displacement and gentrification of Chinatown, then you should just build more housing in Soho and NoHo. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Sunny. Uh, Jean Standish, and then Jake Gold, Anna Markham, and Wendy Friedman. Jean, go ahead. I see her there. Jean Standish. Jessica, go ahead. You want to say something? I'm sorry. Um, sure. So I'm I'm trying to sit on my hands with the trolls here, but I just want to point out something that's been mentioned in the chat, which is go to East New York. There's nothing but empty land there. And I think that would come as a huge surprise to the many residents of East New York. It's the literal definition of NIMBY. It's racist. And I really don't envy you, Gail, for having to pick sides in this. I know you're under a lot of pressure, but that's just so much of the opposition has been characterized that way. And I'm just, I couldn't, I couldn't stay quiet anymore. Well, that's why I appreciate it. Okay. I, I never I'll leave Manhattan. Jump in and... <laughs> I never leave Manhattan, so I really don't know a thing about it. Janine, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. I, I would just encourage everyone to take the high road here. Um, if you have an opinion, it's your opinion, and it may differ from somebody else's opinion, but to call people relics, to say that they're disingenuously believing anything, being paid, not paid, um, I see it on all sides, and I hope that there's no view. I mean, I, I, I'm just looking at there's been some ageist comments. There's just some comments that some people are weaponizing one community over another community, talking about crossing Broadway. Oh, my goodness, I cross Broadway almost every day. Um, so let's, let's take the high road, everyone. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jean Sanders, are you there? Yes, yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. Okay, my name, um, as a board member, I represent the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative known as Lesby. Lesby strongly opposes the mayor's plan to upzone Manhattan, Soho and NoHo. If approved, this plan would allow buildings to be built to, to two, two and a half times larger than what is currently permitted. It would promote out of scale luxury condominiums, destroy the character of these neighborhoods and set a dangerous precedent threatening neighborhoods throughout the city. Included in Soho and NoHo are some of the city's most popular historic districts. The plan as it now exists would dramatically alter the scale within those districts. It would also allow the proliferation of large chain big box stores, making it more difficult for small independent and family owned businesses to survive. While this upzoning plan is presented as a means to promote affordable housing, the specifics of the plan belie the claim. There are no provisions for explicitly middle and low income residents and for retaining existing affordable housing. The plan would result in neighborhoods that are less affordable, less neighborly and less hospitable. Instead, Lesby supports the community rezoning plan for Soho NoHo, supported by many local community organizations. This plan would help create more affordable housing for the area and help retain existing affordable housing and mom and pop establishments. It would also help maintain the neighborhood character that so many residents, businesses, and visitors cherish. The charm and livability of New York City lie in its neighborhoods and their distinctive qualities. Those distinct charms are what draw prospective residents to New York and tourists to visit. Our historic districts and neighborhoods are not only characterized by beautiful, irreplaceable architecture, but, typ but typically by a low scale that allows for light and air, particularly important in times of pandemic. I respectfully urge your office to defend New York City neighborhoods and oppose the Soho NoHo neighborhood plan upzoning. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Oh, Jake Gold and then Anna Markham. Jake, go ahead. Uh, good evening, Madam Borough President. Can you hear me okay? Very well, thank you. Uh, thanks for hosting this forum. My name is Jake Gold. I'm a student at the NYU School of Law and I'm a renter in Lower Manhattan. Uh, in case you all didn't know, law students without family or outside support rely on a fixed allowance. 
uh, from their school to pay for housing and other needs. At NYU, it's about 2000 a month for rent, food, medical care, the like. So I care deeply and personally about preserving and building affordable housing in Lower Manhattan. I'm also 23 years old, and that means I care deeply and personally about fighting climate change, and that's what I want to talk about. Uh, the rest of my life depends on it, sort of the lives of many of the children and grandchildren of those who testified against the rezoning today. Uh, Soho and Noho are some of the most transit-rich parts of America. Uh, they're also some of the most exclusionary. We're close to jobs and amenities and a train ride away from basically anywhere in New York. And what that means in practice is that you don't need a car to live here. Uh, it's one of the cl most climate-friendly places in the country because you don't need a car to live here. Uh, opponents of this rezoning would rather keep this area restricted and consequently displace people into an outer borough, you know, the, the place where there's nothing out there in eastern New York, uh, or even to another city where a car is much more necessary to get to work. That's not a policy decision that takes climate change seriously. In fact, I'd say it's akin to climate denialism. If New York wants to take climate change seriously, we must see this plan through. We must help more people live in a place where they can walk to work, to the grocery store, to restaurants. It's a moral imperative. I do have minor reservations about the commercial and office densities and the, the anti-demolition harassment and displacement provisions suggested by Cooper Square and others seem smart too. I'll yield the balance of my time. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Jake. I appreciate it. And good luck with your studies. Thank uh, you. Anna Markham, and then we're gonna put in Thomas Devaney from MAS. Uh, Anna, go ahead. Thank you so much, Borough President Brewer. Um, my name is Anna Markham and I am speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. One of the many falsehoods that this plan is based on is that it will certainly result in a 25 to 30% of space in all new developments being affordable housing. This is just a complete lie. The plan doesn't require or guarantee a single unit of affordable housing being built and will likely result in little if any of it. On the Bowery where the city claims affordable housing will be built, a commercial tower is set to go up with zero units of affordable housing. That's because the plan exempts from its affordable housing requirements the following, all retail space, offices, hotels, community facilities, including NYU dorms and other private university facilities, and even luxury condos and rentals of 25,000 square feet per zoning lot or less. As per the detailed analysis that we have submitted, on every, single, on every single site in the rezoning area where the city predicts affordable housing will be built, the rezoning actually provides a stronger financial incentive for not including it by allowing developers more market rate, rate space if they exclude affordable housing than if they include it. It is magical thinking or simply a lie to say that profit-driven real estate developers will forgo these financial incentives and include affordable housing when the plan allows them such lucrative ways not to. Um, this rezoning is in fact designed not to produce affordable housing, but merely to use the false promise as a fig leaf for the obscene giveaway for this obscene giveaway to developers. Um, Borough President Brewer, uh, we urge you to not be an accomplishment, uh, an accomplice to this deception, and we hope that you will reject this plan. Thank you. Anna, thank you very much, Thomas Devaney, and then Wendy Friedman and Megan Williams. Thomas, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Borough President Brewer. It's uh, almost getting to my bedtime. Um, Thomas Devaney, Senior Director of Land Use at Municipal Arts Society. Historic preservation protections and affordable housing need not be oppositional pursuits. Historic wealthy neighbors such as Noho, Soho and Noho are places where affordable housing should not be out of reach for most New Yorkers. The provision of housing, however, affordable and market rate must be part of a comprehensive neighborhood planning approach that reflects demonstrable community input, preserves Soho Noho's invaluable historic character and ensures that the needs of people at all income levels are addressed. The Soho neighborhood plan as proposed is not poised to achieve these fundamental objectives. As the city seeks to expand Soho Noho to the equivalent potential residential, residential density of one world trade center, a unique planning approach must be applied. By attempting to infuse economic and racial diversity in Soho Noho and other high opportunity neighborhoods through MIH, the city must recognize that rezonings bring a massive expansion of high-end market rate residential development, the latter of which threatens the area's historic character and Steiny's efforts uh, for uh, uh, advancing fair housing practices and achieving equitable goals. This dilemma is borne out in that there will be over fourfold income disparity between new households and market rate units and households in the affordable rate units uh, under the proposal. We believe a successful affordable housing plan 
increases net affordability and housing choice, ensures the area is livable for people of all incomes with equitable asset access to stores, transit, and schools. MIH is not enough. Given that 80% of the rezoning areas within historic districts, we call for an expanded role uh, for LPC. We urge the city to work with LPC, SHPO, Community Board 2, and other stakeholders to identi identify the most appropriate sites for development and come up with design guidelines and other protections. Non-landmark uh, non uh, historic districts should also be protected. 73 historic architectural resources in the state and national register listed district will be demolished under the plan. Uh, with over 58 potential development sites, including over 1,700 new units, all within historic districts, the full impact of the proposal. You need to wrap up. You need, okay. you need to wrap up. Given the importance of the proposal and its potential to transform Soho and laying the groundwork for diversifying other historic districts, the fundamental must be for MAS. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Do you have any suggestions, Thomas, how to make the housing affordable? Has MAS come up with any ideas? Well, I, you know, it's interesting because the same, uh, somebody brought it up earlier that uh, they, they raised the issue of Gowanus as well. These are, these are, are, are sort of outlier neighborhoods for uh, neighborhood rezonings in that they are um, largely middle class. Um, so that the idea is to bring in afford, uh, to bring in lower income, uh, income residents. And the issue is, if you bring in lower income residents to a neighbor to a neighborhood where almost 50% of the current residents make over $200,000 a year, how then will they find places to eat or places to shop? So I think that it's more it's there's there's a MIH is is a blunt tool. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it comes down to the community. I think you know, that there needs to be true community input on on what that affordability okay. level will be. All right, thank you. Uh, Wendy, go ahead, Friedman. Okay, hi, my name is Wendy Friedman and I'm a lifelong artist and longtime resident of Soho. It took a lot of hard work and a lot of time to obtain my AIR certificate. Finally, I was allowed to move in here in the 1980s. I came to make art, live and work in a thriving artistic community and to raise a family. After uh, my marital st status changed, I successfully ran a business for over 25 years, uh, renting out my loft. Um, and I brought in a lot of uh, a business, a lot of work, uh, a lot of people staying in hotels. Um, uh, I, I'm trying to just talk fast, so I'm gonna skip some things. Um, my entire source of income ended when my company was permanently shut down in March uh, by the pandemic. And I just wanted to point out there are so very many longtime artists here who, like me, are now in, in even a much lower uh, uh, economic means than, than we were pre-COVID. And we won't be able to afford to stay if property, property taxes are raised or our flip taxes are mandated. And uh, for those lucky enough to own their property, its value will be reduced uh, with the proposed policy changes. We artists have worked hard together for years to build our community and continue to contribute immensely. We're still trying to get parks. When I first moved here, there was a lot of empty space. Now there's, uh, it's all been filled. And as far as AIR buildings, there, there are hardly any real true AIR buildings any, anymore. I love living and working here and my dream is, is and plan is to age in place. And there are a lot, a lot of others like me. Um, it's been difficult to make my way as a female artist in a male dominated art world, but I'm trying. Um, please do not pass the Soho NoHo neighborhood plan. And I just want to uh, also just add that I had to come into the, the uh, bathroom to speak here because across the street from me on Crosby is the back of 462 um, Broadway, which was the Culinary Institute. It's taking four months for them to dismantle it, breaking it apart. Wendy, oh, Wendy I, I got it. Okay. I got it. Are you already? Over okay, time, we've got many more people to go. Thank, thank, you, thank you very you much. Okay, Megan Williams, Darlene Lutz, and Susan Wittenberg. Megan, go ahead. Hello. We can hear you. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I live, uh, I've been living uh, for 26 years on, uh, at the bond, at 24 bond, 
with my husband, uh, Bruce's golden sculpture. To me, the worst of the offense that Mayer is proposing is luxury. Uh, it's uh, luxury condos with some, with this maybe some uh, possibilities of affordable units. If the city needs a residential apartment, why not all affordable units, including real low income to middle classes with a differential rent system according to their income, like the housing project of the past, updated and accommodating modern needs. Nowadays, the world is struggling with the systematic disparity. Why create more of this problem by building luxury condos in Manhattan as if there's not enough of them here already? Does the city want to invite more crooked politicians from the world to buy them? Or do they want to invite more super rich who don't pay taxes anywhere in the world and leave them mostly empty? Why? This upzoning is not about creating affordable housing, but blatant wrongdoings by the city against the current residents who built the neighborhood thanks to Michael Levin's foresight 50 years ago. Was the city bullied or bribed by the developers? Other residents, including myself, had to resort to this speculation after so many meetings held by the city, which looked like as if the city cared about us. Speculating the next election for the mayor, I wonder how much okay. Eric Adams- Megan, you, you need to wrap up, okay? Thank yeah. you. Though. So that's it. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much. Thank you for spending time. Darlene Lutz and then Susan Wittenberg. Darlene, go ahead. Hi, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm Darlene Lutz and I've lived in West Soho since 1978. I'm following up on a point made by Representative Deborah Glick. I champion every word of her testimony tonight. A mere 10 years ago, Hudson Square, which shares a border with Soho on 6th Avenue, was rezoned for residential development. The revolving doorman of city planning, Carl Wiesbrod, whined his client, Trinity Church Wall Street, commercial tenants were desperate and, I quote, hungry for housing for their employees. The words affordable housing never entered the discussion, nor did the noxious race baiting and ageist rhetoric by the city their lobbyists and fanboys in the Soho NoHo rezoning plan. The Hudson Square rezoning has resulted in multiple 30 story high rise luxury condos, but it's really commercial developments that have taken center stage. Disney's Avenue to Avenue, block to block, massive campus on land lease from Trinity is on the rise. Trinity's not developing housing for those budding musketeers. They reneged on their signature 50-story, 800-plus unit housing development and the 450-seat pre-K through fifth grade public school at the base at 6th Avenue and Canal Street. The start date for that development, which never materialized, was 2013. The 24,000 square foot vacant lot is currently a banging outdoor party bar with booze and burlesque. In 2019, that housing development was deep sixed and now a plan for the 490 square foot skyscraper office tower was published in a real estate raid and that hasn't materialized either. Why not shame a land owning church, which is richer than God to build 50 stories, 800 plus units of affordable housing and a school they promised to the community. Right. That Thank would you. solve a lot. Please vote Thank no, you. please encourage Margaret Chin to Thank vote you. no. Thank you. Thank you very much. Susan Wittenberg, and then Rainer Judd, and then Danny Salas, and then Adam Brodheim. Susan, go ahead. OK, uh, thank you, Gail. And thank you, everyone, tonight who's spoken so well. I know it's getting late, but I just would like to add a few comments. I am a New York City certified artist, a longtime SOHO resident, a CB2 board member for 10 years, and serve on the SOHO NoHo working group. I am also a relic, according to a senior city planner, along with hundreds of other local residents that attended Envision Soho NoHo community engagement meetings over a two-year period. Our voices were not heard. 
In his opening remarks at the Central Park concert on Saturday night, Senator Schumer spoke about how important the arts are to the vitality, economy, and soul of New York City. The mayor's ill-advised and factually inaccurate zoning plan drains the life out of our community and is a bellwether for the demise of historic districts and community-based planning all over the city. Most important, it guarantees absolutely nothing. We support what the Envision process set out to do, help small retail, artists or new maker businesses and cultural organizations by offering tax and other incentives, protect existing stabilized units instead of incentivizing landlords to tear down small residential buildings, displacing longtime renters, make sure artists can remain living in their lofts and continue to do the work as allowed under the current com commercial zoning. Soho NoHo is a global model and destination. Don't destroy it with more office towers, luxury high rises and big box stores. Don't eliminate the reasons tourists come here. Don't turn it into a shell of its former self and a generic skyline like we see across the Hudson from lower Manhattan. We are more than a great transportation hub. We are one of the greatest neighborhoods in the world, but bulldozers can wipe that out in a heartbeat. And all that will remain are the memories of a time when intrepid artists created something that in the end, the developers got to gobble up. Please do not support this plan. Let's give it further thought and come up with something that really works for the community and the city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Next is Rainer and then Danny Salas, Adam Brodheim, and then Sarah Eccles, Hugh Evans, Susan Stoltz, Shelley Friedman. Danny, go ahead. I'm sorry, Rainer, go ahead. I'm sorry, Rainer Judd, sorry. Great, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear Rainer, yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, um, Gail Brewer, for, for president, and thank you to CB2 for their leadership in rejecting the plan. I'm Rainer Judd, along with my brother Flavin, we lead Judd Foundation based at 101 Spring Street in Soho. Six months after our parents moved into Soho in the late 60s, the city decided to raise the neighborhood along with Little Italy and Chinatown to, lower, to clear the area for the Lower Manhattan Expressway. The city saw no value in the old buildings and the neighborhoods and didn't think twice about moving low-income residents, including my parents. Our parents co-founded Artists Against the Expressway um, Julie Finch, who spoke earlier, is my mom. They fought alongside strong immigrant communities and great activists such as Ernesto Martinez and Jane Jacobs. Together, they fought back and saved their neighborhoods, forcing the city to acknowledge its mistake and maybe see the value of the buildings. Clearly, the latter didn't happen. It still falls to the residents to stop the city and their badly thought out plans. We do not support displacement of longtime residents, whether they are immigrant communities, artists, or your dentist. No one should be displaced for luxury development. Community is an invaluable resource that cannot be bought or replaced with money. It is irreplaceable as it is built up over time with shared experiences, resources, and innovations. Historic buildings also once destroyed cannot be brought back. We thought that the city learned from Penn Station the value of historic buildings. It seems that the mayor has not learned. Our neighborhoods have many problems, of which other people have spoken to, but this plan does not solve them. In their responses to questions during meetings, it's clear that the planning department trusts in Reagan-esque laissez-faire development to solve the problems facing the city. But this attitude is precisely why the city doesn't serve its residents as well as it could. If the city is not addressing the root causes of problems, then they will, they will be made worse by these so-called solutions that only cater to out-of-town multinationals and developers. Rainer, you need to you need to wrap up. I'm sorry. Thank you. Can you wrap up? Uh, no problem. I I would just say that um, the city should become denser and have more affordable housing. But trusting in Gucci to make that happen is not prudent. And we really thank you for your leadership, as well as CB2. Thank you very much, Danny Salas, and then Adam Broadham. Danny, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you for your time, everybody. Um, my name is Denny Salas, and as a resident, I support the rezoning of No and Soho. Over the last decade, No and Soho have barely provided any new housing, while our city grew by nearly 630,000, according to the recent census. Moreover, a recent report by DCP looking at that census data displayed that minority New York City residents, Latinos and Asians, were pushed out of Lower Manhattan. Since 2010, 
the Asian population has decreased by 14% in Chinatown and Two Bridges, 6% in Lower East Side, and 17% in Little Italy and Soho. These neighborhoods were the only ones in New York City to experience a decrease in the Asian population over the last 10 years. Additionally, Latino side declined of between five to 10% in the Lower East Side, and all of this is primarily due to a lack of housing and rising rents. The opportunity to build affordable housing will allow working class families like mine, who grew up poor, a chance to access better schools, experience upward social mobility, and achieve their American dream. The current plan isn't perfect because the commercial density allowance is too high. So that must be modified and lowered to, to encourage more housing development. Also, kudos to Jessica Katz for her, her excellent and accurate presentation of what can be done by rezoning no and so. And thank you for your time, everybody. I know it's been a long evening. All right. Daniel, thank you very much for waiting. Adam, go ahead. Brodheim and then Sarah Echols, Hugh Evans, Susan Solis. Adam, go ahead. My name is Adam Brodheim, and I'm a historic preservationist studying at Columbia University. I love being a student in New York because I get to study the world's greatest city. And so is particularly dear to me because of the Little Singer Building located in the very heart of Soho. I wrote my thesis about its younger sibling, the Singer Tower, which was torn down in the 1960s. Tonight, several community members and elected officials have discussed how this rezoning would threaten the historic nature of Soho. I wanna discuss that with a little history. The Little Singer Building is a beautiful L-shaped building with an ornamental terracotta and lacy green steel facade. It is on a lot that is zoned M5, meaning that if the structure were built today, it could rise only five stories and be used exclusively for manufacturing purposes. Of course, the Little Singer Building is no longer a manufacturing building. It's residential and it rises 11 stories, not five. The four bedroom penthouse is currently listed for $11 million. I've not only read the entire DC plan, but I've walked through this neighborhood. I've read the four LPC reports that cover 85% of the land that this rezoning targets. This plan would not destroy Soho's historic districts. It would not damage the neighborhood. The plan would allow for new units of housing in the midst of a terrible housing crisis. It would bring existing structures like the Little Singer Building into alignment with our zoning code. This plan is not gonna turn Soho into Med Midtown. It will complete Soho. For nearly 100 years, the Little Singer Building had a one-story parking garage next to it. The beautiful street wall of impressive turn of the century buildings was interrupted by a lowly parking garage. Finally, in 2000, a new building was built that paid homage to Soho's historic distinctive architecture without being an artificial copycat. Another block of New York City's most famous street, Broadway, had been completed. I look forward to seeing how the rest of Soho gets filled in. We desperately need housing in New York and I'm excited that it can be in such a special part of the city. I'd like to thank DCP for putting together such a nuanced and balanced plan and I'd urge you to vote in favor of this necessary rezoning that will complete Soho. Thank you. Adam, thank you very much. Sarah Eccles and then Hugh Evans. Sarah, go ahead. Thank you for waiting. No problem, thank you. Um, I'm Sarah Eccles. I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. Um, among the many reasons to oppose this deeply troubling plan is the gargantuan scale of development it would allow and the consequences of doing so. From the current maximum allowable FAR of five, the plan would allow increases of a minimum of 30% in the allowable size of development, up to 94% and 140% increase. This would be an incredibly dramatic increase, not only compared to the already very generous size of new development currently allowed, but more importantly, compared to existing buildings in the rezoning area, which average less than five FAR. The maximum allowable FAR of 12 is therefore close to three times the size of the average building here and 20% larger than allowed for residential development on Billionaire's Row in Midtown. This will not only result in grossly out of scale development, but provides huge financial incentives for demolishing existing buildings smaller than what the new zoning allows. That includes buildings of historic significance, both landmarked and not as well as buildings with affordable, rent-regulated units in them, and often both. They only, the only slightly less awful possibility is we'll see huge, oversized penthouse additions to buildings throughout the rezoning area. The dramatic and unprecedented proposed upzoning is terribly and absolutely wrong, will devastate these neighborhoods, and is unnecessary, and is just one of the many reasons to unequivocally reject this plan. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, um, 
Sarah, Hugh Evans, and then Susan Solis. Hugh, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Hugh Evans. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. And I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation tonight. Projections about the affordable housing this plan will produce is based on the city's claim that there no developer will choose to pay just into a fund rather than include affordable housing as they're allowed to for developments with 25,000 square feet of residential space or less. The city's main argument is that no developer has chosen to do this so far, but as per documentation we've submitted, that's an outlandish basis for arguing it won't happen here. By far the majority of those other developments the city cites had additional public funding, making them 100% affordable. So paying into a fund to avoid including affordable housing wasn't an option. And all of those other developments were located in much weaker housing markets, where market rate units command fairly similar or even slightly lower rents than the affordable units, providing little incentive to pay into a fund to avoid providing for affordable units. But in Soho and NoHo, market rate units bring in astronomically higher rents or sales prices than affordable ones, giving developers huge financial incentives to limit their residential space to 25,000 square feet, pay into the fund, and avoid providing any affordable housing at all. If they have unused floor area, they'll just fill the rest of the building with lucrative retail, office, hotel, or community facility space, which also has no affordable housing requirement. This is just one more reason why we strongly urge you to vote no. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Hugh. Uh, Susan Solis and then uh, Kelly Freeman. Susan, you're muted. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I um, am. I, I'm a loft tenant and also I, and uh, an artist loft tenant. And also I've been really trying to, to, to speak for seniors that especially senior artists that have moved, they were part of the original group that started Soho. And I was part of the second group that moved in where, which could be part of the solution. We moved in to a loft space with four people because we couldn't afford anything and we split it. And then this became part of the uh, loft tenant situation. I feel one possibility is to make spaces that could have go under the loft law and loft tenants that should have groups of people living together. And I thought that that was extremely creative. And also it's a process that should work. Also as a senior people, we wanna stay in place and I think it needs recognized that there's a, you know, the communication, I always work with communities. I work with kids and hospitals and all diversity groups. And I feel in Soho, one way is to recognize this incredible talent and achievements of these artists that live here as they're aging could be incredibly useful to the community. The community could have um, there, there could be residents that are younger residents and we could interact and create. I think we want lower income diversity. We do not want luxury towers. And I also feel there's no reason for the community, for people, we want people to come in. I do not want people that I've worked with in communities to have Soho destroyed as this architectural brilliant place. Why do we not keep this instead of turn these areas into like the, the nothing looking with box housing and stuff like that? Why not keep this jewel of a place, which as an art teacher and an artist, I would love to show to people and meet with them. And one of the places we don't have any outdoor space, but we do have the stoops around these beautiful cast iron buildings. And I feel that we need to combine these communities to bring in- um, right. Susan, you need to wrap up. You need okay, to wrap I, up. I, I do feel that as a tenant, there's a lot of harassment that took place to seniors all the way through the process. It was okay. whispered to us as we, but I do feel this has got to be recognized because this harassment, when this program goes through, which I really reject, It'll be just Susan. devastating. It's already started. I, I do right. want to recommend the community board board two's okay. uh, proposal Thank that everybody should read. 
I thank think. you very much. Shelley Friedman and then Eddie Siegel. Shelley Friedman, and thank you, Shelley, for all of your suggestions over time. I think um, Andy Sosin was before Shelley. And it's, it's promoted. There you go. All right, Andy, go ahead. Unmute. Okay. I, I, do you hear me now? Thank you for. Hello? Yes. We, we, you, we can hear you. Go oh, ahead. Very good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, uh, I live in the uh, South Street Seaport uh, area, and uh, we are currently fighting over development and, and trying to preserve our historic district. Um, I am uh, on this call and at this hearing to speak in favor of preservation, not um, the uh, overdevelopment of an area that is unique to the city of New York and needs preservation. Um, I would hope that you would be listening to the voices of those who live in the district, uh, the community board too, and um, our uh, elected representatives, Deborah Glick and Carolyn Maloney, and um, try to uh, uh, bring the sense of a livable New York and what's needed for New York in the long term to your decision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Shelley Friedman. Thank you for waiting, Shelley. Not at all. We're all young, Madam Bill President. Uh, I, uh, I am a 25 year uh, commercial resident of, of Soho uh, and I've had my business down there since the, the, mid, the mid 90s. I'm a land use attorney, as some of you know, and I've been working with the, bro the Broadway um, with the Soho, um, I'm sorry, with the NoHo stakeholders. Um, I think that uh, lurking behind almost all of these profound questions and issues which have been discussed tonight, um, is an equally profound truth, that the existing zoning has derailed, that it has become less than dysfunctional, it has actually become harmful to resolving any of the policy questions which have been raised um, this evening by all of the speakers. Um, and if allowed to continue as such, we will simply continue in this, in this cycle. The only option cannot be to move backwards, to fall back and, and simply reject this Euler. There has to be a way forward. I believe, as Carter has said, that we can do better and we can try harder to resolve many of these issues, but we should try and do them within the realm of this particular Euler. It's the, the fact that a special district is on the table the, the, for Soho is a significant improvement and will serve as a, as a blueprint for, for creating a zoning resolution that will work for SOHO and NOHO and should not be so lightly rejected, especially when the stakes are so high with regard to affordable housing and the economic development and livelihood of SOHO, uh, SOHO and NOHO. Um, so my recommendation is keep at it, try and resolve what can be resolved within this, this particular Euler I'm struck by the observation that the year in which this original zoning was, uh, was adopted, um, Twyla Tharp and Lucinda Childs uh, and, and uh, David Bowie were in their young 30s uh, and David Byrne was in his, uh, was in his young 20s. Um, so it's been a long time, it's long in the tooth. The artists that created Soho, including the others, too numerous to mention, leaned forward to solve, um, to, to actually you know, create and change the culture of New York City and the world for that matter. And we should take them as our guidance and lean forward, try to resolve these differences and work toward a zoning change within this Euler that will work, that can work for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelley. I, I appreciate your very thoughtful word. Eddie Siegel and then uh, Leno Stevens. Go ahead, Eddie. I'm sorry, I think you were Thank earlier on the list. I apologize profusely. Go ahead. No, no worries at all. Uh, and, and thank you for uh, taking the time to hear from us, Borough President. 
Uh, my name is Eddie. I, I live two blocks away from the rezoning boundary. I'm in full support of it and excited to welcome new, new neighbors into our community. Uh, the only change I would suggest is what a lot of commenters have said is see a reduction in the commercial percentage that we're seeing here so we can enable more housing to be built. Uh, Soho and NoHo has built barely anything in decades, which has caused rising prices and displacement as more people move into New York into a wonderful neighborhood. Uh, but it should be no surprise that this has led to the neighborhood being one of the whitest and wealthiest areas in the city. This is what not building does. Continuing to not build anything will only make the problem worse. Uh, and from earlier in the week, you know, I think the hurricane that we had this weekend was a good reminder that climate change is here and it's gonna continue to get worse. Supporting dense multifamily housing near transit is perhaps the single best policy tool you have as a legislature to reduce carbon emissions. People that live in dense housing and people that take transit, which this opportunity allows us to, reduces carbon emissions and helps contribute to eliminating the problems of global warming. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion today of things that are out of scale. The main thing that I see is out of scale is the size and scariness of our affordability and climate crises. But you are in the capacity to help control this, so I please urge you to help support this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eddie. Adele Stevens, and then Eddie Panta, and then Michelle Varian. Go ahead, Ms. Stevens. Thank you so much. Good evening, Manhattan, uh, Madam Manhattan Borough President. I'm Linnell Stevens, and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. Of the many pernicious elements of this plan, it is, it is that it is strongly incentivizes demolition of rent-regulated affordable housing, permanently losing this precious resource and displacing residents who are overwhelmingly lower income and disproportionately artists, seniors, and Asian Americans. We've identified 650 units of such housing in 108 buildings in the rezoning area. The city, which has refused to release complete data, says there are 185 such buildings, meaning the number of units is probably nearly 1,000 or more. With a little over 4,000 housing units in the rezoning area, that's one in four units and residents that will have a target on their backs as a result of this rezoning. With a proposed increase of allowable density of 30 to 140 percent, virtually every rent regulated building will be underbuilt under the new zoning, creating strong incentives for landlords to do whatever they can to get tenants out, to demolish and build substantially larger. Landmarking won't prevent that, since the LPC routinely allows demolition of buildings behind their facades which is all that's needed to permanently eliminate rent regulated units. Anti-harassment regulations won't prevent it as has been proven time and time again. And the strength and rent laws of 2019 won't prevent it as they left the demolition allowance entirely intact. A vote for this plan is a vote for displacement of lower income tenants and destruction of affordable housing. We urge you to vote no. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Eddie Panther and then Michelle Varian. Eddie, go ahead. Thank you. Hello. We're here. Go ahead. Hi, can you see me now? I can hear you, so go ahead. Okay, great. Fantastic. I almost forgot what I was going to say. It's getting so late. But I just want to throw out, I, I'm going to keep it short then and quick. Uh, the division we see here tonight is a product of the envisioned Soho Noho process, which was a bait and switch, which was a total failure. And its purpose is now being seen as manufacturing dissent, as the participants, the community participants you invited, you didn't invite them as relics, you didn't invite them as outdated people, you didn't invite them there as saying the zoning was on onerous. There was a wide open middle road to update the zoning, but now they're the foil. Now they're the bad white people. And I wanna make clear that the outgoing borough president was a sponsor that funded that, that is now abandoning the neighborhood and going to be a district council person. And the word stakeholder, the political damage being wrought and the inability for DCP to come back to the community and say the word stakeholder, has, you, you don't have any more credibility to what you've done at all. What do you have to say about that? That should be in the recommendation. 
that should be addressed. You never said it was a rezone. You always said it was a study. And people participated out of fear of losing their housing. And now they're the bad people. That's on you. That's your legacy. Okay, you need to wrap up. Eddie. Uh, okay. That's right. You need to wrap the. You need to wrap this up and just say no. That's okay. it. Hard no. I appreciate it. Everybody testifying. Thank you, uh, Michelle Varian, and then Harrison Grinnan, and then Akila uh, Asney. So go ahead, uh, Michelle. Hi there. Um, thank you for hosting this, Gail, Madam Borough President. Thank you for waiting so long. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. So besides MIH, other methods of achieving affordable housing have not really been pursued by DCP. To Jared's point earlier, many different tools used together are necessary and available in order to achieve truly affordable housing. I believe that it is indicative of just how disingenuous DCP's supposed support of affordable housing is. There are many tools to finance affordable housing from the federal, state, and city levels. None of these have been pursued. After being told recently that HUD was unlikely to contribute financing to affordable housing in Soho NoHo because they are too wealthy, I decided to dig in to find possible alternative funding sources. It turns out that there are many many, many different types of funding are indeed available via HUD and other institutions. HUD is especially desirable because they reliably audit housing and make sure that that which they subsidize is properly developed, financed, and maintained. They do it annually, and many developers live in fear of being audited or receiving a negative audit by HUD because HUD actually takes the money back if the developers do not use it properly. That is why it is difficult to get developers to engage with HUD. In New York City, we constantly hear about developers and landowners who receive tax abatements that are not being properly used because they no longer are um, supporting affordable housing while still receiving the tax abatements. And one of the things that has not been proposed is that the tax abatements used by for funding can also be sold by the developers and purchased by banks um, as well as wealthy individuals. Those banks have to put it back into the community within a certain distance of where they are located. There is a huge opportunity for funding for truly affordable housing that has not been pursued here. Thank you, Michelle, very much. I appreciate it. Unfortunately, your time is up, but I, I know you spent a lot of time with us and I am deeply appreciative. Over There's a lot more to follow up Thank with. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Harrison uh, Grinnan and then uh, Akila Azkui and then Gilbert Salva. Harrison, go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, it's a bit past my bedtime as I'm sure some other people are also in the same boat. We're still here. Well, I'll try to keep this short. Um, I'm speaking in support of the zoning, and I think I'd like to focus on some, some things, some areas of agreement, though. I think no one that's spoken tonight is in support of building a bunch of offices in Soho. I think it's safe to strike that from the plan. Um, the office tenancies don't include any provision for affordable housing, as have been brought up by the opponents many times. I think we can get rid of that. There's no, like, we don't need a bunch of office tenancies post-COVID. I think we, it'll be okay to not build that. I think we should really focus on maximizing affordable housing, but that doesn't mean rejecting the plan. That means taking the criticisms and figuring out a way to make sure that we can close these loopholes in the current ULER process so that this can actually happen. Because um, as we know, this process has been happening for years. We've been doing so many meetings on this. And I think it's really like, you know, we can kick it all back to step one and, and try again, but it won't happen and things will just get worse. The city will continue to get more expensive. The city will continue to lose uh, people of color. And it's really time for the city to take this seriously. And that means upzoning uh, wealthy white neighborhoods like Soho, which is 78% white, unlike the city, which is 32% white. You can even see in Long Island City, which you know gets called out as such a paragon of like excess and, and you know neoliberalism and blah blah blah. Uh, Long Island City is 45% white. It's all new construction. Um, new construction, even if it's uh, not affordable, tends to bring a more immigrant. Uh, base to it. And I think that that's something that would really enliven the area a lot. 
and it really relieved the pressure that Chinatown's been under after the East Village rezoning in the early 2000s. Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd like to support with reservations and I think that we can really make this happen. I think there's a lot of things that we agree on, especially in regards to the office densities and commercial densities. I don't think anyone who's logged into this wants more trucks going through Soho. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Harrison. So Akila Azkui and then Gilbert Saba. Akila, go ahead. Thank you, Gail. Um, and thank you, um, Janine Kylie for representing CB2 so, so amazingly well. Um, thank you, Gail, for having this opportunity to speak on this issue. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Soho and a CB2 board member, and I've seen decade after decade usher in new phases for the neighborhood in which I was born and raised and lived my whole life. Um, in the 90s, my family and I um, had many artists and musician friends who lived in Soho who were displaced. Many of the musicians that uh, are close friends of my family's were African American. Um, and they were really displaced by predatory landlords. Uh, they were harassed, landlords refused to fix and replace um, broken things in their apartments. Um, and they really used the legal system to displace those who were unable to pay for lawyers to represent them. Um, these artists were not protected by the city. And the city allowed artists of color and many others to be pushed out of their homes for four decades before they passed any laws protecting tenants um, in 2019 really only um, people with intergenerational wealth or the financial ability were able to hold on to their live work homes. Um, no one addresses the issues protecting our existing rent regulated uh, residents and neighbors in Soho and NoHo. Uh, we don't protect, um, this plan does not protect them. In fact, we really threaten the security of their housing with this new upzoning plan, there will be a new incentive for predatory behavior once again in landlords um, to force out our most vulnerable tenants. Um, landlords, landlords will be incentivized to demolish buildings, leaving just the facade and thereby displacing rent stabilized tenants once again I'm encouraging the very behavior that the laws were passed and meant to stop and discourage. The uniqueness of SOHO really demands better solutions than what the city is proposing. Considering the wealth income and, cult and the wealth of culture and income in SOHO and NOHO, um, the city is really obligated to really create here true affordable housing. SOHO needs 100% affordable housing units. Um, as much as I love, do you need to wrap up. Well, thank you, I, for, and thank just, you for your service on the community thank board. You. I appreciate it very much. Douglas, uh, I'm sorry, Gilbert Saba, followed by Douglas Hanu, Ali, and Chris Ryan, and Casey Berkowitz. Gilbert, go ahead. I don't see Gilbert anymore. Um, oh, so all right. Douglas Hanu, is he Douglas here? Yes, Douglas, go ahead. Douglas, you're muted. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. So my name is Douglas Hanau. I'm a lifelong New Yorker, raising my kids in Brooklyn in a historic district. Um, I live in a historic home that was built in the 1870s, and I've lived here for 25 years. There's a lot of talk about historic preservation. What historic preservation has done for me is made me uh, have incredible amount of money I never thought I'd have. I didn't do anything to earn this money. I happen to live in a home in a neighborhood that the supply of housing is kept at zero new homes. And I benefit tremendously from that. The value of my house has doubled in the last 20 years. I'm able to refinance and pay for my kids' college. I have all these advantages, but I didn't do anything to deserve them. Just in the same way, wealthy people in Soho who happened to buy houses a bunch of years ago 
hit the jackpot, hit the lottery. So let's give new people a chance to come to New York and live that dream and have the same advantage. A, a first generation American whose dad was a school teacher and mom was the secretary, I lucked out. And we have to have this rezoning happening because people in New York don't have the kind of opportunities like that, like you on this panel who live in Soho and bought a home 20, 30, 40 years ago and lucked out and are now living off that benefit that you happen to get from living in that neighborhood. People coming to New York do not have a chance. There's not enough places for them to live at all, especially affordable. So let's get this rezoning done, create opportunity for immigrants and new people so, who are coming to you. New you York need to, to make you need to, their life. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Ali and Chris Ryan and then Casey Berkowitz. Ali and Chris Ryan, are they here, uh, Connor? Yes, they should be able to unmute. Hello. Hi, we're here. Go ahead. We can hear yeah. you. Okay. Do you want to talk to? Okay. Um, hello. Um, we are long-term residents of District 2, where NoHo section of this plan proposes a stunning 140% increase in density. We here in District 2 do not need more density of luxury housing, aka studios and one-bedroom apartments, as well as rental space. We already have an excess of empty storefronts and warehouse departments keeping rents appearing artificially high. We here in District 2 need real affordable housing, such as rich rent stabilization, Mitchell Lama, and JLWQA, but also something no one is talking about, lower middle class home ownership opportunities. Just as the historic repurposing of Soho lofts changed the lives of the artists forever, we now have a fresh opportunity to do this again, to convert unused space, most notably empty office space, repurposing these now vacant spaces into real affordable housing opportunities for a new crop of artists, creatives, and families in need. Let's be honest, the city is in a state of change socially, economically, with the pandemic rapidly accelerating the pace of change, rendering this plan useless. As an alternative, we like to suggest that the few empty lots in this be turned into green spaces as opposed to buildings, because we need more public space spaces for our health. Let's take a page from Soho's Genesis and use it to lead our District 1 and District 2 neighborhoods towards a new future. I propose the city take measures to incentivize landlords to convert existing structures, amazing architecture containing unused office space to create homes that Ali, will you need to alleviate, wrap up. Okay, you need to wrap up. will alleviate poverty and create equity as well as life-changing wealth and stability. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Casey Berkowitz, go ahead. And then uh, Sarah Barry Schinkel, and then Valerie De La Rosa, and then Zeke Luger. Go ahead, Casey. Hi there, thanks very much. I'm a constituent of yours in Manhattan. Thanks for your patience this evening and the opportunity to Thank testify. <laughs> I'd like to take waiting. this opportunity to urge you to support the rezoning for all of the reasons that our excellent panel many hours ago laid out. New York City needs new housing, especially affordable housing in areas like Soho and NoHo with excellent, excellent access to jobs, transit, and schools. In particular, I wanna emphasize the excellent transit. Uh, we're in a climate emergency. We had the most rain in a single hour in New York City's history uh, and allowing people to live in more places where they can take the train or the bus or walk or bike and they don't have to drive. It's really, really critical. Uh, but what I do wanna emphasize is that these benefits will only be achieved if housing is actually built in neighborhoods like Soho and NoHo. In particular, you have a unique opportunity as given your role in the ULERP process to support housing equity while offering that the plan can be improved in certain ways. You don't have just that up or down input. 
So I hope that you'll recommend that the, the city and DCP change the commercial and residential FARs in the plan. Given the disparity in land value between commercial and residential uses, even a, a small difference in residential and commercial uses means that people who own the land are more likely to opt for commercial development unless there is a gap, a pretty sizable gap actually, between residential and commercial FARs. Uh, if you've heard one consistent thread tonight from all of the people speaking, it's that increasing commercial FAR does not have a popular constituency. The city fortunately can remedy this problem either by lowering the commercial FAR that they propose in the neighborhood plan or by raising the residential FAR outside of the opportunity areas where it's already at the state imposed cap. I hope you'll urge the city to make these changes regardless of whether you ultimately decide to support or oppose the rezoning. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Eric, is there some way to uh, get rid of the commercial aspect of a plan? Well, I think, as I said earlier, this is something that we're listening very closely to what people are saying and, uh, and we're continuing to discuss it again. We think that, that residential is already inherently favored as the most desirable and highest value uh, option here. And the plan does allow for more residential than commercial in all of the zoning, dis I mean, in all the zoning districts that are proposed. And, um, you know, again, we think the balance between the two is really important to maintain. So this, these remain mixed use neighborhoods. All right. So, but that's not a complete answer because there's no way of actually just getting rid of it as we did in East Midtown. So on the other side of the coin, so far is what you're saying. Uh, Sarah Barry uh, Shingle, and then Valerie De La Rosa, and then Zeke Luger. Sarah, go ahead. Sarah, are you there? Sarah Barry? Sarah, you should be able to unmute. Uh, Sarah Bear, are you able to unmute? Oh. Should we go to the next one? Yeah, we next can go one. to Valerie. Yeah. Valerie De La Rosa, go ahead. Thank you so much. Good evening, Madam President. My name is Valerie De La Rosa, and I'm a Mexican American millennial renter in Community District 2, and also one of your constituents. Um, I've lived in the district, in Community District 2, for six years. Today, I'm speaking to you as a graduate student in economics at CUNY's John Jay College. The mayor's plan will fail to maintain a mixed use neighborhood. In your deliberation about the mayor's plan, please take into consideration the following data points from the second quarter of 2021. Soho recorded the highest retail leasing velocity in Q2 2021 across Manhattan. The transaction was the largest transaction was by Vashi, which is a luxury jewelry brand based out of the UK, which had over 11,000 square feet um, at 110 Green Street. Other new leases in the second quarter of 2021 for Soho include a French apparel company and a Canadian coat company. All three of these global brands are opening up their first Manhattan locations in Soho. Second, Prince Street in Soho is one of the only corridors in Manhattan to record an increase in average asking rent this quarter, rising 13.3% quarter over quarter and 7.4% year over year to $469 per square foot. The uptick was caused mostly by the addition of the above average price space formerly occupied by UNO at uh, 123 Prince Street. Quarter over quarter, three streets in Manhattan, in Soho, um, have the highest quarter over quarter increase in retail leasing activity that, and they are within the um, proposed area of this neighbor of the uh, mayor's plan. That includes Broadway from Houston to Broom Street at 9.9% increase in leasing quarter over quarter, Prince Street from Broadway to West Broadway at 13.3%, and Spring Street from Broadway to West Broadway at 1.7% increase quarter over quarter from. Q1 2021 to Q2 2021. Eliminating the 10,000 square foot cap on retail incentivizes more large retail development and does not support small businesses nor insurance. Well, well, you need to wrap up. You need to wrap uh, up. Right. Healthy, vital tenant mix. More importantly, the cap ensures that the community 
has input on potential quality of life issues and supports small businesses. I leave you with one of the guiding principles from the Envision Soho NoHo plan, which is that economic vitality should encourage vibrant, diverse ground floor landscape that enhances the quality of life for residents, as well as zoning that supports small businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Zeke Luger, go ahead, and then Peter Lieberman. Um, and then Sarah Berry will come back to you if you can unmute. Zeke, go ahead. Uh, Hi, uh, sorry. Hi there. Um, my name is Zeke Luger. Uh, thank you for welcoming me here uh, for President Brewer. Um, so DCP has had one main community partner for the Soho rezoning here, and that's Open New York. Uh, the majority of the public testimonies in favor of the rezoning are from members of Open New York. Uh, so I want to talk about Open New York for a minute. Uh, I got introduced to Open New York last December. I ended up getting enlisted by people in Flushing Queens to help fight back against rezoning there, but not far from Queens College where I go to school. Flushing is a really lively and unique Asian American working class neighborhood, but like many other New York neighborhoods, uh, recently much of Flushing downtown has been demolished through a series of rezonings uh, that allowed the construction of enormous glass towers and pushed out thousands of local residents living in rent stabilized housing. The rezoning we fail to prevent will bring in 1700 more million dollar condos and 900 new hotel units to Flushing. I ended up writing an opinion piece for the Flushing re opposing the Flushing rezoning. Uh, within a couple hours, I was terrified to find out more than 60 comments on my opinion piece, almost all of them calling me stupid, a liar, I didn't know what I was talking about, that I was promoting homelessness, or that I was a NIMBY. Um, when I talked about this to Soho residents, people seem to have had similar experiences, which is why I'm speaking today. Open New York is a pro-developer astroturf organization founded by a quantitative real estate investor who makes money betting on these rezonings he's attempting to influence. They operate by pretending to ally themselves with young people on Twitter interested in transit and urbanism and terrified of climate change. Their paid leaders bombard them with hyper-aggressive messaging saying that if you don't support these upzonings and building new luxury housing, you're a climate arsonist. And eventually these young people start imitating them and bullying local housing activists. I've seen zero evidence that they do any kind of on the ground outreach to local residents, the neighborhoods they advocate in. Open New York loves to claim that their organization only advocates in high opportunity neighborhoods. That's just not true. Uh, one of their leaders who works for the founders wants to have a real estate company, spent a day in June trying to convince everyone that a friend of mine, uh, quote, has taken money from the North Korean government, uh, which is both super racist and really dumb. Uh, during the rezoning campaign, Open New York's members would not let flushing activists post anything on Twitter without butting into the feed. So you've got to wrap up. They need to wrap okay. up. I'm sorry. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so to sum up, uh, yeah, I just, I don't think Open New York is a great community partner. Um, thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Sarah Barry, are you there? Yes, there I'm here. Question? Yes, Go I'm ahead. here. I'm, sorry. I'm, unfortunately, my wife went to bed already. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, I've been a sure. resident of Soho since 1970, and okay. uh, everyone has uh, debunked uh, the fact that Soho is so rich. Well, Soho was not rich at that time, and I must say that you know we as artists, uh, myself included, uh, Chuck Close, who pa who passed uh, last Thursday, okay. were some of the first residents of Soho. Okay. So now what happens is that we uh, who live, still live in Soho, Ch Chuck Close no longer, uh, since he's died, uh, now have to pay uh, $100 per square foot uh, if we wanna sell our place. I, I think that the city owes us money because we were the urban renewals of, of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the whole area and uh, uh, and I think that the city owes us money. Now, the other issue that I uh, want to talk about is that there are no schools planned in this plan. There are no open spaces planned in this plan. There are no traffic uh, patterns uh, in this plan. Uh, so, so it is a very poor plan. Third, uh, if, if you go to uh, the Holland Tunnel area these days, you know that uh, it is extremely congested. It has the poorest air quality of all of New York City, and we still, artists still live there. So I think that th this plan should fail and, uh, uh, and the real new thinking should occur, including new politicians and new, and, and hopefully the new mayor will have open, uh, an open mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that to keep you so long. 
uh, Peter okay. Lieberman, and then Anita Jorgensen, David Lawrence, David Mulkins, and Alexis Fowler. Go ahead, Peter. Good evening. Um, I am a lifelong resident of this community, um, and I raised my kids in this neighborhood. But if I were a parent today looking for a place to raise a family, I would never select Soho or NoHo as a desirable place to live. Uh, there's really no parks. The stores are expensive and sell mostly luxury items. There aren't really schools walking distance from here. There are very few houses of worship nearby. There are a few supermarkets, but less and less every day. Um, we don't really have a community center. We have no swimming pools, no basketball courts. Uh, there are a couple of playgrounds that NYU are, has been sort of removing one at a time. And the streets are overcrowded with tourists toting shopping bags. And, and there's really no open space whatsoever. There's not even a corporate fountain plaza for kids to play on. So I wonder who we are serving when we shoehorn housing into such an already unlivable and congested neighborhood. Most of the current affluent residents of Soho and NoHo actually have second homes that they escape to during hot summer days or on snowy weekends in January. Um, and I, I guess I sort of feel like don't the residents of all this proposed affordable housing uh, deserve something better than living in the equivalent of what will be Midtown? Is the plan really the best we can come up with for the people whose lives we are trying to improve? Um, I, I urge the Manhattan Borough President to reject the proposed upzoning plan as it's currently written and to think about how we can build more affordable housing in places that are more livable and have green spaces and parks and not try and turn Midtown, uh, try to turn Soho and NoHo into a Midtown residential neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anita Jorgensen and then David Lawrence. Unmute. Hi, this is Anita Jorgensen. Can you hear go me? Go ahead, Anita. We can we can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for holding this forum. I think it's very informative. I'm really learning a lot from hearing everybody um, speak about this issue. And I don't really have much to say besides that, th that this is plain and simple, um, very clearly a developer giveaway. Um, as a previous speaker mentioned, the residents put in our sweat equity into this neighborhood, not private equity. These were illegal places to live. We took risk to make it into what it is today. And to give this away to developers to swoop in and reap the profits, which this clearly is, is quite frankly criminal. Thank you very much to everyone who has done so much tremendous research. I think it's amazing. And this is really a misguided upzoning effort. Please, Gail, vote no. This is not good for New York. It's not good for the world. It's not good for our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. David Lawrence, uh, David Mulkins, and Alexis Fowler. David Lawrence, go ahead. Hi, thank you, uh, uh, Gail Brewer, for having me and uh, for doing this process. Uh, I'm an artist and I live in Soho. I've been here since 1982. Um, I'm outraged by the assault on artists, as of which I'm one, which this plan represents, uh, especially the unfair arts fund that they are promoting. I'm also a little peeved by these open New York people and DCP that keeps referring to Soho as transit rich. We are one of the most polluted areas of the city because of our proximity to the Holland Tunnel the Manhattan Bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, and the Brooklyn Bridge. And 
this is ridiculous. There's so, if you want to think about what is transit rich, it's the World Trade Center. You asked about opportunities for affordable housing. Can you hear me? I hear you, absolutely, David, I'm listening, yeah. Okay, uh, if you wanna think about opportunities for affordable housing, I believe it's Five World Trade Center. They're talking about building an entire building that would be 100% affordable housing. That should be considered. Two Howard Street has already been discussed. Trinity Church's space at 6th Avenue and Canal Street. These are all areas that would hold thousands of people under affordable housing. Also empty <laughs> hotels and offices. Um, but the bigger picture here is not the destruction of Soho, which this plan envisions. It's the destruction of historic districts across the entire city. This is setting a precedent which will destroy all historic districts. It's not just Soho. This is just the first step. And you, you as a representative, up. I ask you to please reject this plan, not only for Soho, but for the rest of the city. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, David Mulkins and then Alexis Fowler. David Mulkins. Thank ahead. you, Gail. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, yes. Oh, great. Uh, David Malkins, Bowery Alliance of Neighbors. Soho and NoHo are iconic, economically thriving, historic districts, famous for cast iron architecture and as an incubator for modern art. By adding height and bulk, big box superstores, luxury housing, and NYU dorms, the mayor's plan would destroy the area's unique creative character, displace longtime residents and businesses, and set a terrible precedent for the destruction of historic districts all over this city. When these hearings started, the mayor's forces said that they would work with and listen to the community. They insisted, we're not talking about an upzoning. They used the public hearings as a cover, ignored our voices, and produced a predetermined upzoning plan that brings on tall towers, NYU dorms, big box stores, and hastens the displacement of residents, small businesses, and the unique historic character of the neighborhood. The city ignored the community alternative plan for Soho and NoHo, which seeks more affordable housing, but without luxury upzoning, big box stores, NYU dorms, and mass displacement. This vision seeks a more equitable neighborhood than the mayor's rapacious plan, which throws us to the wolves of overdevelopment and gentrification. The mayor's call for affordable housing is fraudulent, mandating only 25% affordable units, but allowing 75% luxury units, mandatory inclusionary housing, is clearly promoting hyper gentrification David, and should David, be you called need to wrap out. Up. Thank you. And Thank should you. be called out for the deceitful sham that it is. While Thank that term may have fooled some in the past, it does not fool this community. Gail, David, please you. vote against the plan. All right. Th Thank you very much, David. Alexis Fowler and Benjamin about, and I think that's it. So go ahead, Alexis. Hi, uh, my name is Alexis and I'm gonna be speaking on behalf of Village Preservation. One can examine the impacts of the proposed rezoning without looking at the disproportionate impact upon Chinatown and Asian Americans. And one can't look at the process by which this rezoning proposal was created or considered without noting the complete failure to reach out to and include the Chinatown community or to even acknowledge its impacts upon them. Even calling it the Soho NoHo rezoning when several blocks of Chinatown are included is emblematic of this failure. The Chinatown section of the rezoning is in fact targeted for the largest upzoning, which is the largest incentive for demolition and displacement, oversized development and new wealthier residents. In addition to Asian American residents, this area of Chinatown has a disproportionately high concentration of lower income residents and rent regulated housing. 
As per documentation we have submitted, blocks with higher concentrations of Asian Americans throughout the rezoning track consistently with areas where the city has targeted the highest of zonings, creating the greatest pressure for displacement, oversized development, and new wealthier residents. This is one of many ways in which this plan isn't about social justice, equity, or diversity, but about displacing and replacing the least well-off and least well-connected in these neighborhoods, all for the benefit of developers and real estate interests. We therefore strongly urge you, Borough President Bureau, to vote no. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, Benjamin, about thought. Benjamin, go ahead. Hi, my name is Benjamin Vaught. Um, I'm a resident of Community Board 7 in Manhattan. Um, live on 105th Street. Um, I'm speaking in support of the rezoning. I think it is imperative that richer neighborhoods in Manhattan build more housing for a number of reasons. Um, primarily, building it's an observable truth that building more housing in desirable neighborhoods like Soho, transit-rich neighborhoods like Soho, will decrease displacement in neighborhoods that are further out, like Manhattan Valley, where I live, or in Brooklyn. And it's also imperative for to combat climate change to build housing in neighborhoods like Soho. Honestly, I think the proposed rezoning is the bare minimum of what Soho should do. Um, and every New York resident has a climate, has a carbon footprint that's about 30% of the national average. So adding more New Yorkers will be a net reduction of carbon emissions for the country. So it's imperative that we add housing in neighborhoods like Soho. Um, thank you for holding this hearing. And I would encourage you to, as one of your constituents, I would encourage you to support the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin. So I believe that concludes um, the amazing presenters and those who are bit on the panel. I want to thank you because you have hung in the entire time, and it is much appreciated. Jessica, Erica, Janine, Gerard, and I don't know if um, anybody else from the panel is still on, but I don't know if Mark is still on or Steve, but I cannot thank you enough. I really want to thank everybody who presented. This is a challenging issue, but I also want to thank the folks from our office who put this together. Uh, that has stood with me so far the whole time as director of the Land Use Division, Connor Allerton from Land Use, Luisa Lopez has been behind the scenes keeping the technology together, and Andrew Chang, who is the outreach from Community Affairs, um, and I know there are many others. This, uh, you know that we're going to make a, some kind of recommendation in the near future, um, and I have to say that the uh, context tonight and the suggestions that were made were incredibly helpful. I hope you found it. Goodness knows, uh, certainly Community Board 2 members have been listening for a very long time, but I think every bit helps in terms of getting uh, to a place that either does or doesn't make sense. I don't know, but I do know that um, the testimony tonight was incredibly helpful. People put together, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the kinds of uh, facts and statistics that I think have not come forward before. So I'm really appreciative. I hope everybody can go to sleep. Understand we're still in the office. So just so you know, if you're home, enjoy it. Um, but we will get home soon. I, and thank you so much to everybody who made this possible. Again, thank you to the panel in particular. Anything else you want to add? No, except Jessica seems to also be in the office. So <laughs> <laughs> Jessica Katz is in the office also. Thank you very much, everybody. I really appreciate it. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.